I said, for other people who maybe might not be able to join normally to be part of, um, of, of this event. Yeah, we're so also we're quite, everybody. <laughs> we're quite excited <laughs> about that as well. Yeah, yeah. great. Ah, Florence Meyer, good morning. Hello, good morning. So you have been on the call last night, right? Or uh, uh, yesterday? Uh, you're muted. Oh, you hear me now? Yeah. Yes, excellent. So, yeah, you, yes, fi was, so yeah. you fixed your yes. webcam, that's good. I actually just changed laptop. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. So you're joining us from Bern, you said? Yes, I am. Welcome. So that's your first clam hack, right? No, it's my second. It's your second? Ah, OK. Where, where, where were you uh, attending? Sion. Sion. Sion, OK. Ah, oh, the, uh, the mix and hack. Mm -hmm. So welcome back. And we have uh, Birk Weiberg. He's, uh, a long, a long time attendant of the Swiss Hackathon. Good morning, Birk. He's not hearing us, he's muted. Okay. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Can you show? Yes. Welcome. It's a great pleasure to see so many of you today. We are now live from the Fachhochschule Chur, the University of Applied Science in Graubünden. And um, I am very happy to inaugurate our sixth edition of the Swiss Cultural Open, Open Cultural Data Hackathon. And as an introduction, I will pass the word to Mr. Bruno Studer. He is the chairman of the Department of Applied Future Technologies at the University of Applied Science in Cour. So Bruno, um, you can now share your screen. And then we will unmute Mute you so that we can hear you. So do you see my slides? Yes, we do. You see the slides? OK. Then uh, good morning, everybody. Um, dear participants and uh, colleagues, welcome. And Allegra, as we say here in, uh, in Grisons to the sixth uh, Swiss Open Cultural Data Hackathon. My name is Bruno Studer and uh, I'm the chairman of the Department Applied Future Technologies and a member of the executive board at the University of Applied Sciences of Horizons, uh, or in Retoromanic Scuola Alta Specializzata dal Grigium. In uh, normal circumstances, we would have the pleasure to welcome you at our university in Tour. But due to the coronavirus, all universities in Switzerland are closed until uh, the 8th of June. Therefore, I show you a picture at uh, the top right of the nice city of Tour with its uh, cable car. It was planned that the event takes place in one of our nine buildings uh, bottom right, our Institute of Multimedia Production is located in the ground floor of the Somedia building with its education zone. On the left side, you see uh, impressions of this education zone 
which was opened from the Federal Council at Doris Leutart in 2015. Since 1st January uh, 2020, the University of Applied Sciences of Grisons is the Jure the eighth public university of applied sciences in Switzerland. Previously, we have been a member of the University of Applied Sciences Eastern Switzerland. The University of Applied Sciences of Grisons consists of uh, three faculties. The Faculty Living Environment in German Lebensraum with the disciplines uh, Architecture, Civil Engineering, Tourism and Service Design. The Faculty Entrepreneurial Management with the disciplines Business Administration and uh, Sport Management. Then the Faculty Applied Future Technologies with the disciplines ICT, Photonics, Mobile Robotics multimedia production, information and data sciences, and uh, digital business management. Of course, in all three departments, we offer bachelor and master programs. We do applied research and development and offer further education programs. This hackathon is organized, organized from two institutes um, of the Faculty Applied Future Technologies, uh, the Swiss Institute of Information Science and the in Institute for Multimedia Production. The conceptual framework of the Faculty of Applied Future Technologies is data, the new oil of the 21st century. For instance, the photonics discipline is focusing uh, on data acquisition with uh, sensors, and uh, by the way, my colleague Udo Biok from the Photonics Institute is giving a talk this evening about uh, face recognition. Then the discipline ICT is focusing on the trans transmission of data. And the information and data sciences are focusing on data analytics and data management. And the discipline multimedia production is visualizing data. For the University of Applied Sciences of Grisons, the practical education is very, very important. You see on these slides some pictures of the World Forum uh, 2019 in January in Zurich Erlikon with 700 par participants. Our students have operated uh, TV cameras, a newsroom with social media distribution and interviewed uh, VIPs, uh, for example, here on the picture, the Federal Council, Ueli Mauro. Everything live in a real event. Another aspect of our practical education are the labs. Here you see a few examples of our labs. Uh, top left, there is a CNC Datron 4-axis milling machine. Top right, there is a laser marking machine. Bottom left, an optical table in the laser safety chamber. Uh, bottom middle, experimental setup for the underwater TOF. TOF means a time of light camera and is a 3D a camera. And the bottom right, there is a hyperspectral camera for the characterization of uh, different materials. We attach great importance to cooperate with companies and public organizations. For example, you see here the logos of our photonics industrial partners. They support us with marketing, excursions, bachelor and master thesis, lab equipment and teaching experts. Uh, so I gave you uh, some impressions of our university in uh, Kuo, but now we will open the sixth Swiss Open Cultural Data Hackathon. Uh, online edition uh, 2020 with the subject uh, crowdsourcing, machine learning, linked open data, or human computer interaction. To organize such an event means a lot of work. I would like to thank the organization committee with opendata.ch, uh, our two institutes, the Central Bibliothek, uh, then Basel University Library. Info Clio, and then I would like to thank the program committee, all the sponsors, of course, you as a participants for your interest and your contributions. I wish you a creative hackathon with exceptional ideas. Uh, thank you. Grazie Fitch, and I give back to Valerie Obea.
Thank you. Beat Esterman is the initiator of the Open Glam Working Group. And now, Beat, you can share your slides again. <laughs> Or not. Yes, I can see your slides. Okay, perfect. So we go ahead like this. Yeah, I think now we're set. So welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Bia Detzerman. I'm a member of the OpenData.ch board responsible for the activities in the area of cultural and heritage data. I have the pleasure as well to welcome you on behalf of our association and the organizing team. Uh, the Open Data.ch Association has been initiated about 10 years ago to promote the cause of open data in Switzerland. The association's GLAM working group has been created in 2013 and since 2015 we have been organizing an annual hackathon. The hackathon is usually an itinerant event that is hosted in a different city every year. Its goal is to encourage heritage institutions to publish their data as open data and to gather people from various backgrounds around this data to experiment what can be done with the data. For the participants, the hackathon is not only uh, a place where we kind of develop prototypes, but also an excellent means to get in touch with like-minded people, uh, to be creative together, to exchange know-how and to forge new ties uh, in an informal atmosphere. So after last year's hackathon, which focused on the co-creation of museum artifacts, we decided to dedicate this year's event to four trendy topics related to heritage data that are crowdsourcing, machine learning, linked open data, and human-computer interaction. We have already seen several presentations and workshops around these topics over the past few days, and we're also very excited to see all your uh, proposals and challenges that have been submitted uh, and we can all not wait to see them taking shape over the coming days. So a few months ago, as, as was mentioned before uh, by Bruno, uh, we were all set to hold the hackathon in our traditional format, this year hosted by the University of Applied Sciences of the Canton of Graubünden. Uh, we were planning to gather in the small alpine town of Chur, which which by the way is one of Switzerland's oldest towns. Um, but then this guy came around and obliged us to take our event online, which has had the positive side effect of making it easier for people around the globe to join us. And we're very exciting, excited to see so many of you joining from other countries. Our hackathon has traditionally been held in English and we, have, we always love to welcome people from other countries. But I think this year we're all beat we're, we're beating all records in this regard. So I hope we're all enjoying uh, this uh, new level of exchange uh, at international uh, level. Before I give back the word to our event coordinators, I would like to thank our partners and sponsors without which this event would not uh, be possible. First of all, at the University of Applied Sciences of the Canton of Graubünden, then Wikimedia CH, then the Swiss National Museum, the ETH Library in Zurich, InfoClio, the Bern University of Applied Sciences, the Swiss Social Archives, the Central Library in Zurich, the Swiss National Library, Asler Stiftung, the City of Chur, Graubündner, the, Cantonal, the Cantonal Bank of Graubünden, then Supsi, our friends from the other side of the Alps, uh, from Ticino, with their Interreg project, Jogonda, uh, for, from also people from the Lombardy region, and our communication partner, uh, uh, SwissDevJobs.ch, uh, which helped us this year to spread the word uh, about this hackathon. So I wish you all an exciting and inspiring event. I'm really looking forward uh, to having a great time uh, 
the next two days. And I'm giving the word back to Valerie and uh, Andrea. Thank you, Bert, for this introduction. Um, and now I would like to introduce our team here in Cours. My name is Valerie Hashimoto, and I have been the main coordinator of this event. And in Cours, I am here with Andrea Alleman, Lothar Schmidt, and Michel Pfeiffer. And I think Ivo. Maciek was here also, and I would kindly ask my collaborators to shortly introduce themselves. Hello, everyone. I'm Andrea. I'm co-organizing this event with Valerie, and I will be taking over the lead organization of the hackathon from starting next year. I'm really excited that you're all here and that you're sharing this experience. Yeah, hello, my name is Lothar Schmidt. Um, normally I work at the Central Library in Zurich, but today I'm here in Chur and uh, I'm trying to help organizing this event. I will be in the background, but i try to help you all. Ivo? Yes. Thanks, Lothar. Hello, everybody. My name is Ivo Mozek. I'm the project coordinator of uh, the University of Applied Sciences here in Kur, and I'm very pleased to welcome you here in Kur on stage. And uh, I wish you two pleasant uh, days here in Kur. Uh, I mean, online. <laughs> and uh, the next one is Michel Pfeiffer. Hi, everybody. I'm Michel. Together with Ivo uh, and the students, we managed the technical part for you for the next two days. I hope you have a lot of fun and I wish you good inspirations. Thank you. So uh, here in Core, we also have two students from the multimedia productions, uh, Hannah and Noah. Uh, I think they don't want to come, but maybe we will or Michel will show you what it looks like here in Kour. Hannah and Noah. Okay, so now Andrea will share her screen so I can give you just a little bit of practical information. So um, maybe I'll start by mentioning that we are enforcing the hack code of conduct uh, to ensure that everybody feels in a safe environment and we won't tolerate any discrimination. If you encounter any problematic situation, you can write to the organizing committee via the general channel. Um, we, will, we are <laughs> recording already uh, all the plenary sessions. Um, they will be streamed on the YouTube channel of the University of Applied Science, Graubünden. Um, and we will also try to make some screenshots every now and then to document our event. And I'm really happy to see that um, the majority of you have their cameras on because uh, it is always nicer to interact with faces instead of just gray uh, squares. So now Andrea will share her screen so I can just um, go through today's program. So, um, after this info session, we will have a little collective warm-up and icebreakers because, um, yes, the hackathon, uh, a lot of people enjoy it because we all come together, you meet old friends, you meet new, inspiring people. Uh, so, we wanted to try and translate this to the online event with our icebreaking session. After that, we'll come to the pitching and group formation. I will provide further information about that when we begin. And our goal today is that by 2.30, uh, all the participants have found 
a team and have formulated a challenge uh, for the hackathon. This afternoon, uh, we will have some help centers. Maybe Andrea can switch to Slack now. So yeah, you have now understood we will communicate through Slack mainly. You will find all the important information on the general channel. We will be posting links to documents and web meetings. In the afternoon from 3 to 3.45, we will have some help centers moderated by uh, experts. Um, we will have one by Adrian Schwend from Satsuko about linked open data. Oleg Lavrovsky will be uh, doing a help center about machine learning. Dominique Sievi will help you out with Open Refine, and Topias Hodel will be here to help you with Transcribus. And we have set a specific this time frame uh, from 3 to 3.45 so that these people can log in then. But if anybody has interesting links or ideas or maybe questions already, you can post at any time. Please just um, be aware that our mentors would only log in at 3 o'clock. And then we go back to the Slack. I would just like, like to show you the um, channel browser. So Andrea will show you the channel browser. We have already created some, uh, this is the place where you can find all the channels. We have automatically added you to the general challenge, the help centers, the recreation channel where you can propose fun activities. Uh, and then we have already prepared some templates for projects. Some of you have also posted already their project channels. And these are not available for everybody because we, won't, we don't want you to get messages from the other groups that, which will disturb you. But here in the channel browser, you can look for the project which you want to join or maybe just follow um, and add yourself so you get the information. And yes, in the Slack channel, under the participants, the contacts, you can also write direct messages to Andrea, Lothar, and myself. Or maybe if you have any technical issues, you could try and ask Oleg. Um, or Beat can also maybe help you. You can just contact us via Slack. We are here for you. So now uh, we will um, start our ice-breaking session. So we will stop the screen sharing and I invite you to choose the mosaic mode of, um, in the Webex so that you see um, the faces of, of everybody. Yes, now I can also see the mosaic mode. Um, I have wrote you should prepare a green and a red object. Um, can everybody show me the red object? Looking good. If you don't, yes, looking very good. And now, could everybody show me their, oh, and I'll show you mine also, sorry. Uh, this is my red object. <laughs> And now, uh, could you show me your green object? Very nice, a lot of books. <laughs> so we will be using this um, color code for you to answer questions. So Andre and I will be asking questions and if it applies to you, you can answer by using either the red or the green object. So Andrea will ask you the first question. So who of you has already participated in a hackathon before? And now, <laughs> I like the glass bottle. <laughs> um, who of you has participated in a glam hack, a Swiss open cultural hackathon before? And you guys can 
browse also to see what the others respond. And who of you has already participated in a glam, no, in multiple glam hacks? And who of you has already participated in all six Swiss glam hacks? So we have Beat. Well done. And Enrico as well. Enrico and Oleg, <laughs> I think. Okay, um, can you still hear me? Could you show me your yeah. hand if you can still hear me? Okay, so now, um, even though we are 66, I would like to, I will call your name and unmute you. And I would like you to just tell me the city or town each way with, uh, where you are sitting right now. So I will start with Ali Haider Bangash. If you are here, I have unmuted you, Ali. Uh, yeah, apologies. Apologies that. Ali, didn't are you here? Me. Can Can you hear Ali? Yep. Uh, apologies, I didn't bring any red or okay. green object. Apologies. So now, Amerikos uh, Nerd. Anne Boshe. Yes, hello everybody. I'm sitting in Zurich. Next to the train station. Hello? Sorry, I have just, because I can't hear you and that's disturbing, so I will just try something. Just one second. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, can, you, can you hear me now? Yeah. Uh, Ali talking. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's me. Been hearing, we have been hearing you, but I think it's uh, the problem that Valerie can't hear us. Yes, so I and now I, would... I can hear you. Is it okay for you? Or should yeah, I now I can you? hear you. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Thank you. So Ali, you're joining us from which city? So I'm joining from Islamabad, Pakistan. Oh, that's really cool. Yes. Welcome. Ah, sure. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. And maybe for myself, Anne Boshe, could you repeat where you're sitting right now? Yes, I'm sitting still in Zurich next to the train station. <laughs> Very nice. Thank you. The next person is anne Katrin Seifer. I'm sitting in Zurich as well. Very nice. Thank you. Barbara Cocchini. Are you here, Barbara? Maybe. Allora, I... Ah, sì, si, yes, now we can see you. Perché mi stanno chiamando? Vabbè. Allora, 105 è il suo importo, 1200. Okay, I think Barbara Cocchini is on the phone. Uh, mm. Heike Bazak. I have unmuted you. Hello, I'm here in Bern. From Bern, thank you. Beat? I'm in Bern as well, in the nice Marzili. Straight from Marzili. Birk? Weiberg? Uh, hi, I'm in Zurich. Another one from Zurich. Then we have Caitlin. Truton. I'm sorry, maybe you can tell me how to pronounce your name. Hi, it's Caitlin Troughton, and I'm in Montreal in my my office. Oh, so it's very early. Yeah, it's still night, still dark out. <laughs> but it's night that you could join from Montreal. And the next person is Chi Hao. Uh, yeah, I'm from Kuala Lumpur. Kuala Lumpur. Uh, so what time is it, it there? Uh, it's almost four. <laughs> almost four in the afternoon. Yeah, yeah. 
Okay, nice to have you, Chihau. Thank you. The next person is Christian. Uh, hi, I'm in Basel. From Basel. Hi, Christian. Daniel Burkhardt. Uh, yes, hello, everybody. Um, joining in from Bern, well, a little bit outside of Bern, a little place called Jegenstorf. Jegenstorf. Exactly. Thank you. The next person is Danilo. Hi, everybody. I'm joining the meeting today from Hur. Ah, a local. <laughs> Welcome, Danilo. Deborah Lopomo. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm joining from Zurich. Another one from Zurich. Hi, Deborah. Damian Specha is the next one. Oh, wait, Damian, now you are muted. So I've unmuted. Damian, are you here? Are you here? Oh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Hello, everybody. We are joining from Cool 2. You are. From Core, you're a student. You will be presenting your special movie project soon. Exactly. Diana Tenconi. Yes, hello, everybody. I'm from Ticino. I'm here in Giornico, a village of the Leventina Valley. Very nice. Thank you, Diana. Dina is the next person. Moscow, very nice, thank, thank you. Dominic Sievi. Hello, I'm from Bern. Sitting in Bern. Emily Lomax. Oh, did, did you unmute me? Yes. Oh, hello, I'm, uh, I'm coming here from a, a tiny town in Scotland. Very nice, Hi. welcome, Emily. Enrico Natale. Hi everyone, I'm um, sitting in Bern. Another one from Bern. Welcome, Enrico. Florence Meyer. Yeah, good morning. I'm also in Bern. You're in Bern. Hi, Florence. Gerusha Lau. Hello. Um, I'm also from Kur downtown. I'm a local and Good, thank you, Gerusha. Giovanni. Wait, wait. Hi, hi everyone from uh, the sunny Lugano. Hi. From Lugano. Welcome, Giovanni. Another one from the Ticino, Yolanda Penza. Hi, everyone. Everyone, I'm uh, in Milano. Milano. And Irene Vanini. Oh, sorry, someone. Is, I have to spot the person who is. Globali. And hopefully she will be more attentive after. Ishan Mishra. So have we lost uh, Valerie? Valerie, we can't hear you anymore. And now? Yeah, yes, now it's Now better. you can hear me. I'm sorry. So Ishan Mishra said she, he was from... Can someone tell me? Because oh, I hear him here. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. I, I'm from a town called Malacca in Malaysia. Malaysia. Hello, Ishan. Nice that you're here with us. 
And now Jan Baumann, back to Switzerland. Jan, maybe he's not behind his computer. So Johannes Nussbaum. Hello. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. I am in Arau. Arau, Switzerland. Welcome, Johannes. Julia Beck. Yeah, hi, everyone. I'm sitting in Frankfurt, Main. Frankfurt am Main. Welcome, Julia. Kenny Floria. Hi, I'm Johnny from Zurich. Hello, Kenny from Zurich. Christine Kosberg. Hello, I'm joining from Oslo. From Oslo. Hello, Christine. Kvoit. That's me. Um, I'm Katja and I'm sitting in Intertour. Ah, Kvoit for Katja Voitas. Welcome, Katja. Lothar. Lothar. Yeah, as as you all know, I'm in I'm forced to be in cool. <laughs> <laughs> then we have Luca Tanay. Hello everybody. I am currently in Zurich. Welcome, Luca. The next person is Laurel. Oh hi everybody. I'm in Brice sur Marne, just outside of Paris. Ah welcome Laurel. Thank you. Marta. Uh, what? Hello? I'm a, hi. hi, I'm a, I'm in Italy. I'm a near Milan, just next to Mapinta Airport. So, but uh, oh. well, I'm part of the South team. Welcome, Martin Vollenweider. Joining from Zurich. Welcome, Martin. This one, I'm not sure. M A S I S. Is this someone? It's a master in information science, I guess. Probably. Well, maybe it's just a computer. Let's switch to Matthias Nepfer. Hello, I'm sitting in Bern. Hello, Matthias. We'll skip Michel. Because he's not behind his own computer, Miriam Rode Hacke. Good morning, everyone. I'm Johnny from Basel. Hello, Miriam. Welcome. Nicole Klett, uh, Nicole Nett. Hi, together. I'm Johnny, also from the nice Canton Graubünden. Ah, oh, very nice to have you, Nicole. <laughs> Then Nina me, I think that's Nina Maria. Right. Hi, that, yeah, that's right. I wasn't able to change my name on the computer. <laughs> but um, uh, I'm joining you from Oslo. Hello, welcome from Oslo. Thank the you. next person is Nobutake Kamiya. Oh, good morning. Um, I'm in Zurich also. Welcome, Nobusan. The next person is Paul Brunner. Hello, everybody. I'm in Zurich as well. Another person from Zurich. Philipp Nett. Um, good morning, everybody. I'm in Allersheim. That's a small town close to Basel. Welcome. Ryan. Um, hello. I'm in Winterthur, Switzerland. Oh, welcome. And then we have our computers, which are not human. Sarah. Uh, can you speak a bit louder, Sarah? I'm joining from Bern. From Bern. Hello, Sarah. Simeon Reiser. Yeah, hello. I'm in Thun, near Bern. Thun, Switzerland. Yes, exactly. Welcome. Simone Sonja Bürzle. Um, hello, everybody. I'm from Balzus, Liechtenstein. From Liechtenstein. Welcome. Then someone 
is SO. Do you know who that is? Hi, Sergio. Hi, it's Sergio Bolonski. I'm from the train between Paris and Lyon. And I can change my name, sorry. I'm on the mobile phone. Okay, Serge. Good to have you. Sylvia? Hi, yes, I'm Sylvia. I'm sitting right now in Steinerweg. It's a small village next to Krems in Lower Austria. Oh, yes, it's you, Sylvia, from Glamhack Austria. It's Open Glam Austria. Nice to have you. Tammy Lee. Hello, I'm sitting in Montreal, Canada. Another one from Montreal. Very nice yeah. to have you, Tammy. Someone named their account Team Coffee Break. Hello. Can you hear us? Yes. Yeah, perfect. We're four of us, uh, students of the Fachhochschule, and we're sitting in on the Asch, in somewhere in the nowhere in the kind of region. Okay, welcome, guys. <laughs> Thea? Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, well, I'm sitting in Zagreb, Croatia. Wow, Zagreb. Yeah, and I'm probably doing something else, so that's why I don't have a video right now. <laughs> okay, no because worries. Because it's worse time. <laughs> Thomas Weibel, where are you sitting? I'm sitting right here in Fribourg, Switzerland, one of the most beautiful cities in the world. <laughs> Thank you, Thomas. Tobias Wodel? Uh, hi from Aarau. Hello from Aarau. Well, I'm the next one, you know, I'm in Kur. Vanessa? Oh, yes, hi everyone. I'm um, in um, Capriasca Mountain, close to Lugano. Hello, Vanessa, welcome. Victoria. Good morning, everyone. I'm joining from Basel. From Basel. So we have a majority of people from Switzerland, but not only. Thank you for playing the game. I think it was precious to see who we're going to be working with. So now we'll switch again. Hi. Uh, for the pitching session. So I'll stand in front of the camera so you can see, see me. Okay, so, um, wait, okay, so um, during the pitching session, uh, we will give you the opportunity to present your ideas, challenges, or data sets. As we are a lot of people and our time is limited, we will be quite strict with the, with the two minutes that we give you for the pitching session. Um, we have, some of you have already created a, a Slack channel, which is great. So maybe if you have a Slack channel, you can mention that uh, at the start of your speech, a uh, pitch. And um, if you don't have a Slack channel, we will, we have already prepared some models and we will create a Slack channel for you. And we will be keeping track of all the pitches and assign rooms for the pitchers so then after the pitching session, uh, you can then join uh, the people who inspired you the most. So Andrea will share her screen, so you could just have a look at the document which we will publish after the pitching session. Probably we will need a little five minutes break after the pitching session so we can prepare the document um, with the overview. So here is the document uh, which we will publish, which you'll have, we'll um, overwrite the title of the project. Maybe you already have a precise title and if not, then we'll write something so people recognize the project which we are talking about. And then you'll have the link to the room where you can meet up with the people um, 
of the project. We will also write down the Slack channel, channel so you know which Slack channel you have to join so that you can exchange ideas and links with your teams. And then we also have a project description template, which is here um, to help you. Um, it's here to guide you during the group formation uh, so that you can kind of structure your ideas. So the goal um, of the group formation <laughs> is then to have a short description uh, of your idea or your vision. Um, then you can write down um, ideas of how you want to proceed. Um, we will ask you to formulate uh, precise goals which you want to achieve during the hackathon. And then you can think of needed skills or type of data. Uh, so then maybe we can help you if we see you are missing uh, a crucial um, skill uh, or anything else, we can try and help you to fill the, your needs. Uh, if you want, you can also try to formulate a long-term vision of your project after the hackathon. And uh, finally, we will ask you to write the names of all the team members and once again repeat the, the name of the Slack channel. And of course, you can use the document also to brainstorm. So um, yes, that's it. Um, yes, and maybe during the pitching session, we'll see that someone maybe might present something and another person has something which is complementary. Then we'll ask you if it's OK, if we should put you in the same room. OK. So now I will uh, give the word to Damian and his friends who have a special project um, for this hackathon, a movie project. So Damian, maybe you can try, um, I don't, know if, I don't you, know if you can unmute yourself or I don't know if you want to share something. Yes, hello everybody. Um, as we already mentioned, we are three students from Cool. We are doing an after movie about the glam hack, and we are very happy if you, if everybody could do a, move, a short movie from herself with the mobile phone in, in landscape format. And we created a Slack channel called After Movie, and you can uh, upload it there. That would be very nice. And also, if you could short write. Uh, if you tell from where you are and your name. Yeah, exactly. So just like um, a short video of yourself, like, uh, hi, I'm Till and I'm working from Ford, and then uh, upload it on the After Movie Slack channel. And um, we've already written down uh, the places where you guys are at. And um, we'll probably contact some of you guys uh, who are working near the area of Ford. Um, and if it's possible, we will try to visit some of you guys. Um, but yeah, that's all you have to know for, uh, right now. The rest, we will see how it works out. Thank you. And if you have questions, you can uh, write us on the Slack channel. Then, um, I'm going to give you an outline of how we will proceed with our pitches. First, we will have the data providers pitching their data, first the ones that have not entered a challenge yet. Then we'll have the data providers that are pitching, uh, that already posted a challenge on DripDat. Then we'll have the other challenges that have been posted on DripDat. And then it's free for people who want to spontaneously add a challenge, even if they haven't added it to our DripDat. It is very important that you only have two minutes. And Valerie will start by pitching uh, the data from the Fondation Capaliano. So Valerie. Can you hear me? OK, so I'll just share my screen. And Andrea is keeping a trial. So I was kindly asked to present um, 
the data from the Fundation Kapaliana. It's a foundation in um, Graubünden and a big image archive with um, over 25,000 images of, uh, well, it's all two dimension objects in various media related to the Canton Graubünden. And this foundation was founded in 1986. And as you can see on my screen, uh, they have prepared a really nice data set uh, with images of mountains. Um, so you can see there are paintings, there are old posters and postcards, uh, photographs, and also graphic prints. So um, this data set um, contains 178 image files in JPEG format. Uh, with the corresponding metadata. Um, there are paintings, photographs, and postcards I have, I have mentioned uh, around the theme of mountains, alpinism, adventure. The time frame of the images is about 1800 to the years 2000. The metadata contains the name of the artist, the title of the work, the datation, sometimes very precise with a year, sometimes only a century, um, the technique and dimension of the work. Um, as some of these works are very new, um, these data are not published under an open license, but they have been um, put to our disposal for the hackathon. Um, the Fondation has mentioned some ideas, I have selected a bunch, what we could do with this data. One idea is to group images um, to create atmospheres, maybe images with uh, colors that are similar or with similar themes. Um, another idea would to create bridges between the images and to visualize these bridges either with sound text or graphics. Um, they have said maybe we could create a digital art space to create uh, digital exhibitions or uh, to use these images for storytelling. So um, if you go on the website of the Fondation Capagliano, you'll see they have a lot of images which you can browse online, but they are not open, unfortunately, but some of them could because they are old. So I hope that some people will be motivated to be creative with their data, to show them how open data can transform their collections so they can adopt a more open uh, approach. Thank you. Thank you, Valerie. We're now switching to Davide Nerini from the Swiss Institute for Art Research, who will be presenting his data set. Oh, yes. we are early on schedule. <laughs> I was <laughs> afraid that we, we, did, we didn't have so much time um, with, the, with the pitching session. So Davide will join probably at 10.30. So maybe we can now. Oh, just... Davide Nerini. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Paul. Um, so I'll just wait to see if Davide is ready. Um, Hello, yes, I'm Davide. here. Davide, <laughs> yeah, we were a bit early on schedule today. Okay, I see that. So yeah. we have just, I have just pitched the first data set. Um, and we thought we could give you the word because um, we are presenting first the data sets which have not published a concrete challenge. Of course, which yes. Is the case of, of the SIG ISEA. Yes. So you have, do you want to share your screen or not? Uh, no, I don't have any um, okay. presentation to share. Um, just just a, um, one last question. I see that uh, Paul uh, is also uh, well, here not. and yes. maybe, I don't know if he wants to, to present the data set because uh, um, he's the expert here in the, in the house for, with, the, with those kind of data. And uh, uh, Paul, are you here? Uh, yes, I'm here. Okay, maybe, maybe I'll do it just because I have the doc document open also, and then I can show you what okay, it is. Thank you. Thank you very yeah. much. But okay. I also wanted to credit it, uh, David, because it was his idea, but we have two minutes, so we should maybe rush a bit. Yes, yes, of course. Uh, let me see if I can share because. Uh, the WebEx, I even, do you see my screen now with a, you should see an Excel spreadsheet? 
Okay. Yes. Um, so the data set that uh, Sikizea, the um, Swiss Institute for Art Research, is providing is this. You have a CSD of like 50,000 exhibitions um, from 1945 until March of this year. And um, the columns that you have is you have the title of the exhibition, you have when it started, when it ended, the institution where it took place. And then, because this is really what we're trying to document at our institute, uh, the artists that participated. So you have the names of the artists in one column here, and then you have the IDs, which is the internal ID from our database to these artists. So the, let's say the first person here will be the first person in uh, the ID column also. And then, because basically um, we publish all of this on a website, which is called Sikat, which is an artist uh, lexicon. Here's the link if you want to see how we right now are publishing it, but we're also working on a new website that will launch later this year. If you have any questions about the data sets, uh, ask Davide or I. I think there could be some very nice uh, things done with visualization, what happens when, who's uh, exhibiting with whom, who's exhibiting in many places, who's mainly in one region these kind of questions. So um, I'm very curious to what people will come up with. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. So sorry, I was told I had a terrible sound quality from my own computer. So I had to change and I forgot to give people the opportunity to ask questions after the fit for speeches. So maybe for the sick ISEA, the exhibition list, is there any question from the audience? If not, you can join Davide and Paul later in a room. And were there any questions about the Fundación Capauliana? No. Uh, no. Good. So our next speaker is Anne Bosche from the Stiftung Pestalozianum. Um, can you unmute mute yourself, Anne? Yes. 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 Okay. Hello. So I'll start my... Are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Thank you okay. very much. So I'm just talking. I don't have any slides. That's so. good. <laughs> I'm pleased to be able to present the small selection of the picture collections of our foundation, the Foundation Pestalozianum. We present here extraordinary pictures because they are from children. Drawings by children give us a unique insight into earlier times. They show us their world, the world made by children. And for this clam hack, we provide a data set containing about 300 drawings by children. And all these drawings are over 100 years old and were created during school lessons in Zurich. We provide metadata too to these drawings, like author, subject, period, place, technique, and some more metadata. From my point of view, the children's drawings are a highly interesting object of research or interesting sources. Uh, from different from different perspectives, you can find more information about the drawings and the foundation on the info sheet on the website of the hackathon. On the portal Collections Pestalozianum, you will find the link to it on the foundation's website. You can look at another six thousand drawings and get a comprehensive impression of the diversity of children's drawings. So I try to do it shortly because I have two minutes. I hope I could arouse the interest of some of you in working with the children's drawings. Uh, yes, that would be me very happy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anne. Are there any questions? And, and Anne has already created a Slack channel project children drawing, right, Anne? Yes, I do it okay. yesterday. So now we have other data sets, but institutions which have also published challenges. So we'll see if they want to present the data separately or 
with the project challenge. Uh, the first one would be with the data from Ticino, uh, Marta and Yolanda, who, who wants to present. Um, hi, everybody. I try to share my, uh, I, I'm not sure, I try to share my uh, desktop to show you uh, the presentation of data. I don't see if you... If you yes, see you can screen. now put the uh, full screen. Okay. Otherwise, I just and then I'll start. and I will share the. It's too difficult. I will share then the um, the presentation on Slack. So from uh, Ticino, the first challenge was to um, give value to open data to Ticino, and uh, for this hackathon, we um, collected. Um, uh, open data from uh, five, uh, five institutions. The first one is the um, Osservatorio Culturale from uh, Canton Ticino, and data um, uh, concern all the cultural operators in Ticino. Those data has already been published on uh, uh, Wikidata and OpenStreetMap in 2018 by, by, by our laboratory of visual culture. Uh, at Zupsi. The second uh, uh, set of data um, concern uh, an ethnographic museum, uh, that is the Museum of Leventina, which is an important ethnographic museum in Ticino. And uh, we have uh, the honor today um, to have uh, with us the creator of the museum, Diana Tenconi. Uh, data and text of uh, the Museum Leventina website uh, are now released with open licenses that are in CC0 licenses and text in CC by SA, and they refers to the object of the collection, past events, and exhibitions. Uh, another ethnographic museum that released uh, uh, open data and uh, text in CC by SA license is the Museums of Valverzasca. Uh, in this case, uh, license, um, content also refer to five um, itineraries, ethnographic itineraries in Ticino, and also include uh, audio files uh, rather than um, data and text. Then we have uh, data from uh, the Cantonal, Cantonal Museums of Natural History of Lugano, um, they are released with the CC by SA license, uh, and uh, we and uh, they include uh, data, text, uh, and images, and uh, geographical information about, about the Valpiora natural areas, whose objects are represented in the museums. And uh, finally, uh, we have data from an uh, uh, important project in Lugano. This is a permanent interactive installation. Um, at, the, at, um, at uh, the pedestrian tunnel of Besso in Lugano. Those data are released uh, by the municipality of Lugano in CC0 license and refer to the interaction of the public with the, with the installation. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Marta. I stretched a bit because you had so many data sets to present. And so somebody else will then from Ticicino present your project idea, right? Uh, yes. Or uh, you? Uh, mm, well, I, can, uh, I will present also the project challenge and, um, that I have already published in, uh, the, um, in uh, your website. Uh, actually, we have uh, mm, presented uh, a main idea is that the, mm, well, today uh, the, the COVID uh, has uh, changed the way that we access to the building and the spaces. And so museums, uh, uh, for safety reason, has uh, restricted and uh, regulated the access to uh, physical buildings. So um, an idea is to um, connected the cultural life of a place with the, the out well, yeah, is to um, um, visualize the ecosystem of connection that the uh, museums and cultural sites can have with the outdoors. 
maybe connecting the, the, the collection of the museum, the provenance of the collection of the museums with the, with the building, or either working on the new uh, thematic uh, and, uh, itineraries outside the museums in order to uh, allow visitors to explore also the territory uh, rather than the, um, the, the building. Uh, Johan, okay. Yes, thank you, Marta. Do we have any questions from the audience? So maybe you can stop sharing your screen. If you go to the top or the bottom. Okay. Uh, wait a second. I don't know if I can do that for you. But my screen is shared right now. I, I don't understand. Just a second, Marta. Wait, just a second. I don't Okay. You know, if I can, because you should have this on the top. If you go with your mouse to the top of your screen, you can choose stop sharing your screen. Yes. Uh, okay. Because oh, now, Andrea, all, all is, thank you, Andrea. <laughs> okay. Just, I will try to sit back at my computer with another headsets to see if you can hear me. Just give me one second. Okay, so is my sound still as terrible as before? We can or hear is, you. Okay, because I was told before it was terrible with echoes and... But is it better now, Beat? Yeah, we have some echoes, but it's not, not necessarily you, I guess. Okay. Wait, I'll have to mute. Just go ahead, I think it's, it's okay. Okay. So, the next picture would be Luca Tane from the PTT archives. They have prepared three data sets and they also have published uh, an idea, a project idea. Luca Tane with unmute Marta. Why oh, can't... Wait, Maybe you mute everybody and then unmute... Yeah, the uh, problem just... is that and I'm not on the computer. Yeah, Andrea will mute everybody and then we will unmute Luca Tane so that he can present his data set from the PTT archives. You just give me the okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, just wait because Marta is still, oh, now she's muted. Okay. Yes, Luca Tane, we are with you. And will you present first only the data set or already in together with the challenge? Yes, I will I will present uh, more or less some context to the uh, data set and to the challenge. Um, as you mentioned, you will find the data sets, uh, closer descriptions of the data sets and the challenge, which is pretty open on DripDat. Um, but just to give you some uh, perspective of what we hope for in this hackathon. Mm. Okay, so I'll give you four minutes because you present first the data sets and the context and the challenge. Okay, thank you so much. Okay. Um, well, first, some few words um, who we are. Um, the PTT archive um, holds all the historical sources concerning um, the postal telephone and telegraphy, telegraph um, uh, services in Switzerland. 
And right now we are at the at the really crucial moment also for our institution because we're digitizing all our holdings and are searching for new ways how to uh, present them to the public. And we have come um, to the hackathon with some samples from our databases. Um, and they are all about uh, postal cars and the mountains. Um, we have come with so-called in German, it's Postkurskarten, which uh, means that those are maps that show all the routes of postal cars um, in all of Switzerland uh, at uh, different points in time. The second thing are uh, postcards with, uh, with uh, scenic places in Switzerland and um, that have all postal cars on them. <laughs> and the third uh, thing, the third um, sources are so-called Poststellen Chroniken, which are chronicles of different postal service stations. And we are hoping that we could find um, solutions to present them on a map that we could use also for a new um, website that we are building and hope that we can um, geo-reference um, those sources that come with metadata um, on a map of Switzerland or to come up with new ways to present those sources and make them interesting for a public that is not uh, uh, into uh, the history of the postal and the telephone and telegraph services. Okay, so you did everything very shortly. That's uh, really nice. That is it, I think. Uh, thank you, Luca Tane. Does anybody have a question for Luca concerning his data sets from the PTT archives? And please feel free to contact me uh, on Slack. If yes, there are questions coming up. And then you will be in one of the rooms so people can join you. Maybe one question I would have yes. looked at is um, the pictures, are they geo-referenced in any way? Um, they are in the metadata. Yes, with exact um, locations. Um, n not with that I'm not sure. We'll have to check that in the room. Okay, just because like it's a topic I think I and some other people are also interested in. So okay, so okay. we we can we'll see yeah, we can. Okay, okay. that'd cool. be great. Okay, okay. Thank, okay. You. thank you. Thank you. So the next group I would like. Um, I, it's a bit the same, the National Library and the Association of Swiss Archives, Matthias Nepfer and Heike Bazak. You have both prepared a data set and you also have a challenge idea. So uh, do you want to present it? I don't know if it's Matthias or Heike. Wait, uh, Matthias, just a second. Can you unmute yourself or does Andrea have to unmute you? Did it. Uh, please, you should unmute uh, Daniel. He will explain everything. Daniel uh, Burkhardt. Yeah, just a second. Uh, okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we yes. can hear you. Lovely. Thanks a lot. So I just have to switch to the document. Uh, yes. Um, well, our challenge derives from the project of the sum of all glams that has been going on for quite some time now. And the goal is to create an open linked inventory of all Swiss GLAM institutions. And if you are interested in the background of this project, I recommend watching the first part of the presentation uh, held by Beat during the site program sessions. You will find the link also in our channel on Slack. Uh, the Swiss National Library and the Association of Swiss Archivists provide their inventories of GLAM institutions to work with during the hackathon now. So um, our data from these databases is very heterogeneous. That means in respect to actuality as well as in respect to data structure. 
there is a lot of structured and semi-structured information like institutional names or address information, but there is also a huge amount of unstructured data such as historical information or information about the funds and collections of the institutions. Most of these descriptions are text blocks and need to be analyzed and processed to be, as, to be used as structured data. So it is our hope that during the hackathon, we can find ideas of how to deal with this interesting but unstructured data and make it useful for further projects. Uh, furthermore, it would be great if we could find a way of comparing the both inventories of the um, Association of Swiss Archivists and from the National Library in respect to integrity of the inserted data and in respect to the data models that were in use. And last but not least, we are also interested in ideas of how we could maintain the database in the future. So for example, is there a possibility to establish an automated interface from our um, LOD database to Wikidata? And could we also make it reciprocally so that we could get updates when something is changed in the Wikidata and we could uh, this also integrate in our own database. The mentioned data from the National Library is available on Open Data Swiss, the homepage. There is a CSV sheet as well as linked open data in a SparkQL endpoint environment. And the data from the Association of Swiss Archivists are available over a Google Docs CSV sheet. Yeah, I guess that's what have to been said about this project. And we are looking forward to meeting you guys in uh, our channel. And yeah, we're interested on what ideas you guys came up with, what we can do with our data. Thank Thanks you so much. very much, Daniel. Are there any questions regarding the inventory of Swiss GLAMs? No questions. Um, then I wanted to ask um, Anne Catherine Seifer. She also has some data which she could use, but I'm not sure if she wants to present it. Um, I mentioned it in the email with all the data sets. Catherine, uh, do you want to, to say a word about your data? Um, yes, I can do that. I'm not prepared, so uh, I just try. Um, there are some prints from the Graphische Sammlung Etia Zurich, and uh, we just uh, added some icon class notations. So if anyone is interested in um, linked open data or machine learning, I think this could be interesting because we have metadata and the pictures. So um, just contact me on Slack if you want to do anything with it. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, okay. Anne Catherine. Um, okay, um, I have not seen him with uh, in the list yet. Jörg Hagman, he had posted also a, an older data set about ecclesiastical archives with an idea, but I think Jörg, maybe he couldn't join us this morning. Yeah, I think he's not here. So we'll just go now to the next challenges which have been posted. And I would like to start with Martin Vollenweider with his Europa meets Europe. So Martin Vollenweider, Andrea will unmute you. Martin Vollenweider, Hello, hello everybody. I actually have two projects. The first project is I will help the multimedia production students with their projects and I all welcome the, the students. My second project, I prepared some slides I would like to show to you. It's an art project. It's called Europa Meets Europe. And the idea is I would like to connect the continent of Europe with the moon Europa from Jupiter. The moon was discovered 1610 by Galileo Galilei. I'm 
taking data from the NASA API. They have different pictures from the moon available. And I'm also taking pictures from webcams from different European cities. And those are live webcams from Zurich or Munich or London or whatever. And I would like to join do those two worlds and those two pictures together. The idea is that I will take random pictures from the NASA and random pictures from the webcams and overlap them, make a transition based on a pixel base. You cannot see it here, of course, but uh, the idea is that the, the NASA data, I will take some pixels and the size of the pixels is then connected with a piece of music which I have to evaluate and to integrate. And then at the beginning you see few pixels and if the music is playing on, you see more and more pixels. That's the idea of my project. If you are interested, contact me on, my, on, on the Slack channel. I'm especially looking for people who, who can help with the design of the graph. Thank you, Martin. Are there any questions of understanding from the crowd? No. So then Nina Maria Evanson, you have also published a challenge on genre categories. Do you want to tell us something about your challenge? Yes. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, this, this challenge could be approached from a very basic point of view and in the full depth. And so my main, my first start is to say that we have a, a huge amount of different kinds of material on the playwright Henry Gibson. And we are trying to sort this material into different genres. Uh, so at the easy, uh, the easy approach would be just to discuss in general what kind of genres uh, could be sort of useful to divide the material in. But I can, if I can just, do you see my screen now? Uh, have yes. I shared my screen yes. with you? Yes, yes. Um, I would just like to sort of give a, a half a minute presentation of the different kinds of material we have in case somebody has any experience of mashing this kind of different formats. Because we have a, uh, we have a big critical edition of everything Ibsen wrote in TEI XML. We have a relational database called Ibsen Stage, uh, presenting all international performances of Ibsen's plays all around the world from the first performance to, up until today. We have um, a set of translations sh uh, showing uh, side by side uh, translations in different languages of his texts. And we have a bibliography international with 40,000 entrances. Uh, and we have a lot of pictures from performances from the art Ibsen made uh, and, uh, and photographs of him, uh, including also texts encoded in HTML. So this is, uh, we are creating a virtual Ibsen portal, trying to mash all these different data sets. So if anybody has experience with mashing this kind of material, we would love to hear from it. Is there any questions? So my, my, I'll just add, I'm keeping the, the, easy, or the easy approach is to just discuss the genres on, of this. But we could go into the depth if somebody uh, were interested. Thank you very much, Nina Maria. So if there are no questions, then I don't know, people, can you stop sharing your screen or do, does Andrea have to do that for you? <laughs> okay, so 
we have talked about the GLAM inventory already. So now I would like to give Bert Esterman the word about the metadata and en enhancement to deep learning. Can you just tell us something about this challenge, Bert? Oh, wait, we have to unmute you. So I'm unmuted now, right? So the metadata enhancement through deep learning challenge uh, grew out of a student's project um, at the Bern University of Applied Sciences that was actually presented on Tuesday night. And you can see the presentations also online. Uh, the idea there is to uh, extract objects from images, photographs on Wikimedia Commons uh, by using machine learning algorithms and then map them to Wikidata. So we actually have uh, linked data enrichment of these images on Wikimedia Commons. It will be a semi-automatic process in the sense that there will be for some quality checking also a person in between. Some stuff can be automatized and some of it needs to be a quality process by a, a human. And what has already been done during the students project is like the, the whole process of, of using uh, out of the box, out of the box object recognition services. And they have also have a, a proof of concept for the ingestion of the data into Wikidata. And now what could be done during the hackathon is like, first of all, uh, train a custom model on that, not just use uh, out of the box. Uh, services. They suggest using Watson for that, uh, where you can actually just tr start training a model yourself, and which will also facilitate the linking to Wikidata afterwards, because you can directly enter Wikidata items as, as the output uh, for that uh, recognition. Then what we will be very interested in also is like brainstorming use cases, what would be of interest uh, um, for this recognition service. Uh, how, how would you like to use this enriched data afterwards? Uh, what data is actually of use? What other data is maybe of lesser use? And then have a reflection on that and to see how we can further develop that, that prototype. And regarding the prototype, it would be nice to have an application that integrates the various steps that now are kind of still done manually one of the one after the other to integrate them in a, in an app uh, where you also integrate the whole human computer interaction aspect uh, the students won't be present during the hackathon one of them will be available uh, by phone if there are any urgent questions uh, but if you go on the explore uh, tab on the challenge description you also find further uh, information about what they actually suggest uh, could be done during the hackathon. Thank you very much, Beat. Are there any questions about this challenge? Okay, maybe the questions will all come after when you interact with each other. Uh, the next challenge on our page was one that I had posted, uh, the Glam Hack Insights. But the students of the multimedia production are actually now kind of taking up this challenge. Uh, the idea was to, yes, create um, a documentation of our online hackathon to give others an insight after the event. So I won't say more, but if the challenge is published. So the next one, um, oh, I didn't see him in the participant list, Bernhard Ebersold. Uh, he had published um, a challenge called 1914, two French-speaking newspapers translated to German. Are, are you uh, here, Bernhard? Yes, um, that's actually ah. the Coffee Break group. Do you hear? Ah, you're the Coffee Break group. Okay, thank you. Yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah, actually, we found some data of two uh, French-speaking newspapers from Switzerland. and. Um, these data date from 1914, so they are quite old. And we are trying to translate these uh, newspapers from French to German. And then we would like to visualize them on a simple website. So we created uh, kind of a timeline 
and compare the data from 1914 to the data from today. So what are the concerns from people in 1914 and what are the concerns from people in Switzerland today in 2020? Um, to actually achieve our goal, we are trying to work with the um, Beeple API or the Google Translate API um, to make this, um, yeah, to make this work. So if you have any questions, feel free to um, ask us on Slack. We already have a channel there or just uh, hit us up here in the, in the chat function. Thank you very much, Bernhard. Are there any questions about this project? Not yet. Sounds really interesting. Thank you. Uh, mm, the next one, uh, maybe Gregory is, he's in Canada, so it's maybe a bit early for him, but he also published a challenge on cultural event calendar. Maybe Tani, uh, Tammy or Caitlin, do you want to pitch that? Uh, you have to, you can unmute yourself. Yeah, tell me. Yeah. Uh, so essentially, I think Gregory has posted two projects. So one is the cultural event calendar. Is there a way with a linked open data set in the performing arts to automatically, in a programmatic way, generate a cultural events calendar? Can it be done simply? Because in the performing arts sector, a lot of that work is done manually. Um, it's a very heterogeneous set of information. So is it possible to do that? It's a very simple use case, but a very um, practical use case. And the second uh, project that he posted, and we're going to see which one generates interest, is a da data wizard. What is it called? Data wizard content, data wizard. So can we walk through someone who is a, not an expert, someone from the performing arts sector, can we walk them through with a data wizard? Could they model the information that they have in a way that, that can be used as data? Can we help them model? Um, walking through uh, with a very simple instructions. That, that, I think that's the more interesting one for Culture Creates. That's the project I know that Gregory is more keen on working on. Um, so is to get the non-expert to understand uh, what data modeling can be. And then by walking them through it, they get the aha moment and, and seeing the utility. Oh, that's why I need to model my data. So it's really for the, for the layman, um, which is a harsh challenge to do, which is very, also very worthwhile. There we go. So that would be data wizard, you said. A data wizard, so a walkthrough, a chat, a, you know, can we walk someone through uh, modeling without telling them that it's modeling and that's what they're doing? Okay, okay. Yeah, and Gregory is going to join us during the day uh, at yes. his place, like at Tammy's place, you can see now dawn is breaking, it's five in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> I think he's going to wake up soon. Okay. Great. Um, so Marta has already presented the extra munia. And the next one, uh, this is what Luca Tane has presented with the georeferencing and linking archival documents. And then the Swiss Federal Archives have published a challenge, uh, but there was no name. So I don't know, is somebody here from the Swiss Federal Archives? Hey, Valerie, I, this is Oleg. I, Simon asked me to um, support the challenge because he's going to be unable to join us this weekend. So do you want me to say a few words about it? Yes, please. Okay, so uh, just a few days ago, the Swiss Federal Archives, that's Bundesarchiv, or actually Federal for everyone who's used to it, um, posted a, an official challenge, not just for our hackathon, but um, for everyone uh, in Switzerland who is interested in using um, their new digital uh, document access. Um, they have an, uh, a, new, a data search API that they're really keen to see used by more uh, people in our community. So, um, Right. So, right, as you know, basically, there's uh, they, they just have millions of documents from, you know, the history of Switzerland and uh, the government and parliamentary debates and all kinds of things. And all those documents have titles, reference codes, um, creation periods, that kind of thing. Um, there's uh, there's an API which has been published um, and they have uh, they allow us to request up to 10,000 results per search request. Um, and they're the, the let's see, the 
the carrot uh, at the, in, in this challenge is that they will try to invite the most exciting projects to the federal archives to get an exclusive tour, um, opportunity to meet um, their staff and so on. Um, and also they're looking to feature apps that we develop into their new online access platform. So they, they're really looking for things that make it useful for everyday people um, to um, you know, explore the Federal Archives data. So again, that's that's project that's been posted on our challenge page, number 12, has all the details and links. Um, and I'll be happy to proxy uh, and support any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Oleg. Mm -hmm. Anybody has any, a question for Oleg about this challenge? Okay, uh, the next one is the Swiss Augmented Reality by Thomas Weibel. Thomas, do you want to tell us more? Yes, I'd love to. My <coughs> project um, is published on the challenge page, Oleg mentioned before. It's called Swissar so far. Might be a brand name problem afterwards, but we'll see. It's an ongoing project. Um, I've been working on rebuilding Switzerland in virtual reality, in VR. Um, I, if I can share my screen, uh, you can catch a glimpse on the project as it is now. Now you should be able to uh, see what you could see if we actually were in Coor, where we um, were supposed to be, if you are in Coor and are looking southeast. This is uh, what you would see. The model itself is interactive. You can navigate, you can fly uh, to any point you want. But here I am again. But um, the model may look nice, but it's of no practical use. Because if you're hiking, if you get lost somewhere in Switzerland, um, you don't have any large screen, and uh, after all, you would not want to see a model of Switzerland because of the Switzerland's topography is around you. So what I'm going to do with um, during these two days is trying to transform this project into an augmented reality web app that you could use from your smartphone. Um, you should be able to launch the app look through um look to uh, your screen look through your camera uh, point your camera to any point you like and get relevant geographic in information from where you are at the moment for the whole switzerland this is what i'm going to do i probably won't uh, need help to code because uh, the code so far has been done by me it's not so easy to understand but what i really um, would need uh, would be someone um, willing to make a sort of um, um, how-to video for someone who would like to use the, uh, the app and doesn't know how. So if there are any video makers out there willing to make a, um, a video, a, a, a um, tutorial video of how to use the app, well, um, feel welcome to join. There is a, a project channel on Slack. More information can be found, as I mentioned before, on the uh, challenge page. Feel free to contact me anytime. Thank you very much, Thomas. Are there any questions about Thomas' project? Not yet. Um, and the last project which has been posted before I give others the opportunity to pre present softwares or ideas that they want to uh, use or do um, is the project uh, of Laurel Zuckerman about text analysis to detect looted art. Uh, Laurel, you can unmute yourself. Wait, Laura, we can't hear you yet. You have to unmute yourself at the bottom of your screen just by pressing the microphone button. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Wait, is now it unmuted it's... now? Yeah. Is it okay? Do you hear me? 
Oops, sorry. Yeah, yeah, we can hear you, Laurel. Okay, I'm going to try to share the screen. Um, let's see. Do you see my screen now? Mm, yes, it's starting up. Okay, uh, I have kind of a slow connection. But we can only see a screen broad broadcast. Ah. Um, so maybe you have to choose another application to, to share with us. Maybe the, oh gosh, I don't know. Usually when you press on the share button, yeah. then you can choose an application which you want to share with us. Oh, I just wanted to show you my actual screen. Oh, okay. Well, then now we can see um, the screen. Oh, okay, so now I can, okay, now do you see now the you can, challenge? Exactly. Yes, yes, okay. okay. Oh, good. So I'll, I'll first present the data sets and then the challenge. Okay. Um, there are three data sets. The first one is 60,000 art provenance text for analysis, and they look like what you see there. It's just a URL, then a text, then an accession number. It's the bare minimum. It's really a kind of a text block analysis uh, issue. Then the second data set is a thousand red flag names that look like what I'm showing um, you there that's drawn from uh, reports from the Art Looting Investigation Unit in 1946. Um, and it's the last name that's probably the most important. And the third is a bunch of data sets with red flag words or phrases that one would be attentive to in the text. Um, so the idea is to try to use text analysis to look for flags um, and to count them, to quantify them, to characterize them and to quantify them, and then to add them to the data um, in order to try to figure out which of all of these artworks are the ones that most urgently needed, uh, that most urgently need additional provenance research. Uh, the difficulty is you have millions of objects in museums and provenance research is very time and resource intensive. So you need to figure out which ones are the ones that are most likely to um, have a history, which is uh, uh, one li linked to looted art, if you do assign those resources to investigate it. So um, the kind of skills that I'm looking for are people who are interested in the problem of analyzing text very quickly uh, to count uh, names or words or things that happen to be in the text or to look for structures in the text, um, to look for similarities in the text, patterns in the text, that kind of thing. There's also a whole component of uh, data linking which could be interesting. Um, so it's very open, uh, the idea Ideally, what kind of thing uh, would we look for? Um, ideally, a successful result might be as simple as for each one of the 60,000 or 70,000 items to have a numerical figure with the number of red flags in that specific provenance, whether they be names or words or whatever. Um, uh, the count of all the different elements that we think are interesting to flag. And we could always add new elements like the number of question marks in a text or the number of the words private collectors that appears in the text or the number of the words unknown or art market, which all indicate uh, that there's certain information missing. Some way of scoring that total count, either just a straight score or uh, um, with some kind of weighting. And then to rank the text according to which texts look like they're the most problematic uh, of all. So the, um, that's the basic idea. I'm going to try to unshare my stop the broadcast now. Thank you very much, Laurel, for this interesting challenge. Um, are there any questions from the audience? Oh, and I'm very happy to answer any questions. <laughs> so. Yeah, probably after when we split you guys, when you go in teams, there will be a lot to discuss. Mm, good. So now we have gone through all the published challenges. I know that Nobutake wanted to present shortly the Omeka, uh, which is more a software, uh, which he maybe wants to, to use for a project. Nobutake, you want to tell
tell us something about Omeka. Yes, um, thank you. I sent my link and I can share my screen also. So we have the link in the chat. Okay. You. Um, as a, this, this is a site um, I created uh, with Omega S, and um, um, Omega S is a kind of um, content management system, and you can create a kind of galleries um, with uh, um, different kind of media. So you can audio data, and you can play it in that. And also you can you can put it the image and you can combine it in the map and you can publish um, the image uh, with the triple IF standard. And naturally you can create uh, metadata for for these media. And I want to suggest for today, um, maybe we can um, uh, create a metadata for um, many images and uh, <clears throat> publish uh, with Omega S. And you can we can find the description here in, on my site. And um, and you can also use uh, another <clears throat> uh, modules for Omega S and for example Foxonomy. And then you can you can tag on the images and you can. You can collect the tagging informations, and maybe you can use it for another project and so on. It could be maybe uh, interesting for, uh, for us. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nobutake. Are, does anyone has a qu have a question about Omeka, about the software? And Nobutake is because we have some data which um, do not have any concrete project idea. Do you think maybe the images uh, that we have could be used even if they're not fully open data? Like the data sets that we have from the Fundación Capauliana and Pestalozzianum? Uh, okay. Um, <laughs> Maybe not good, but um, we we can create a metadata and create a site at first. And uh, we do not publish not yet. But if you can <clears throat> uh, use uh, images for, or you, if you can publish uh, images, um, and then you can publish it, maybe. <laughs> okay. <laughs> or or you can use some uh, images from the public um, thing, so public domain. Public domain. domain. Okay. Very good, thank you. So now we're through everybody who had announced. Um, so if somebody else wants to present an idea, you can either just unmute yourself or you can write pitch in the chat and then we'll uh, let you present your idea. So if someone wants to so pitch, yeah. Can I um, yeah, Husha, yeah. say something? Great. So, do you see my screen? No. Yes, now it's starting. Yeah. So, what do you see? The WhatsApp or? No, it's still loading. Just oh. a second. But it's going to be the desktop. Okay. Probably. So, um, ah, but we can't see anything yet. Yes. So now you see. Now we see your WhatsApp. Yeah. Ah, yeah. <laughs> so that's our uh, channel, and uh, yes, we want to uh, work with uh, data sets um, of names. And as the description already says, um, we want to uh, connect names out of data from 2018. And we like to integrate the data into a map for Switzerland. Uh, maybe, I don't know, something like Google Maps. Uh, we, we see with what map it can, it can work or other, um, some other visual form of map. And um, this is the data set. So uh, a group of four, we had a look at the data sets. 
And here you can work with uh, four names or family names. And the thing is, um, maybe we just like choose four names or just choose family names um, because of yeah, the privacy of some real people. <laughs> and then we would like to take the names and uh, make a visualization um, how many times a certain family name will uh, be appearing uh, in a map. Um, for example, family names there we can see um, when, yeah, how many there are of a certain family and so on. And uh, maybe, yeah, we want to work with Google Maps or um, what I saw, what I really, what I really like is kind of something abstract. So um, that's a project I saw and maybe we could, um, I don't know, uh, display in, so some names and then when you click on the name then, um, we would see where the names are or in which canton the names uh, appear the most and so on. So, yeah. Thank you very much, Kausha. Sounds like an interesting project. Um, does anybody have a question for Gerusha? Uh, just a short note from my side. Um, I think that's the data set I used last hackathon if i saw it right i didn't map it or anything i made more of a from project out of it but um maybe we could chat about it later ah that would be so awesome thank, <laughs> thank you, you so dominique. much <laughs> thank you dominique um okay um somebody else wants to pitch um, yes i would like to Philip Net, yes. Um, my plan is to make an old game. I found uh, some data sets of the British Museum about an old uh, board game, which it is a race game and it's called the game of Ur. And I found from Augusta Rarica another game, which is uh, it's a simple version of Nightmares Morris. I've never heard that actually in English. I just know it as Mühle on German. Um, so it's a simple version of that, and I'd like to like go into those to look at them, find out which one fits better, and make a playable game out of it, so that you can like experience a four thousand year old game. That's my plan. And yeah, if somebody's willing to help me, I'm really in need of help. It would be cool to join. I see Thomas Weibel nodding his. <laughs> Our game man. Um, I used to get to be the glam hack gamer for a couple of years. Now I'm, no, I'm not anymore. Now my students are. Yeah, you have a successor here. Yeah, yeah, great and uh, inspiring. <laughs> Thank you very much, Philippe. Um, yes, somebody else wants to pitch an idea. Sure. Can I go jump in? Like. Oleg, yes. I'll just share my screen here. <laughs> I'm, I'm brushing my teeth. I'm sure you guys will be very happy to know that I brushed my teeth before uh, pitching a challenge. Now, actually, I um, speaking of toothbrushes, my kids have this amazing electric toothbrush. When you push a button, it goes. Bzzz. It tells them when they should start doing different moves with their tooth brushing. Um, it tells them how long they should keep brushing their teeth for. There's even an app, which is terrible. Oh, don't install the app. Um, but yeah, I was thinking about these electric toothbrushes and I thought I'd pitch a quick chatbot challenge. So it's um, the idea basically being that we have this chatbot, it's installed on Slack. We've been hacking on it for a couple of years and it's useful for connecting to open data sources. So. All those GLAM hack uh, data sets, which are published to opendata.swiss, you can search them now by just typing GLAM bot and then search and then whatever the data you're looking for is. So if you just add that chatbot to your channel in the Slack, that should be working already. But it's an open source chatbot. And if anyone has ideas of how to um, make it more fun and useful and help us to have an awesome hackathon, please. Um, Suggest them right on the the um, 
the challenge page, which is challenge number one. Here it is. Um, and uh, there's some examples of how it can be used. For example, I thought we could connect to a interesting source of quotes, maybe some medieval chivalry statements that people used to say to each other to motivate themselves for the battle. Something fun like that would be a nice thing to do. So that's the chatbot challenge. Thanks very much. Thank you, Oleg. Any questions about the Glam chatbot? No, so now does anybody else want to pitch an idea? If not, we already have many, many ideas. So now, um, does anybody, because now we have prepared some WebEx rooms um, for you to spread. Uh, I think we have 20 now, 20 WebEx rooms. Uh, uh, because, yeah, we, we first we had 10 and then they wanted to create 10 others but we're not sure they're working yet. But in any case, we will now assign rooms to you. And if you then rather open up a, a Zoom meeting or anything, another program which you feel more comfortable with, you can, also, you can do that, but please inform us so we can put the right link where people can find you. And please also post the link on your Slack channel. So now, we will have a short break. I think everybody's happy to have a break, uh, 10 minutes, so we can prepare the rooms and then we will publish the overview. And for those of you who have never been to a hackathon, maybe you feel a bit lost and you don't, maybe you didn't understand everything the others were talking about, don't worry, you'll have the overview and then maybe you can just choose whatever inspires you the most and then in the smaller groups, you will be able to get more information. Okay, so yes, we'll publish the, the overview of the rooms probably at 11.40. Let's take 15 minutes break. Okay, so see you later. Or either, maybe questions before we go for the break? No. Okay, see you here later. We can also just hang out here, right? Olega.
there. The next challenge is, well, it's the data set of the Kapalya now. And is anybody interested in working with the data set from the Kapalya now, maybe in combination with other data? Okay, so maybe we'll also put me as, um, I'll join the, the Slack channel and we will do that over Slack if people want to to work with the with the data from the Kapauliana. And then we have the room for the list of exhibitions from 1945 to 2020 from the SIC ISEA. So Paul, you're still here. Davide, I can't see his camera, but I think he's still here. I also we... want to say we're we're making a new version right now because I thought like we have international participants and I just want to have the column names in English and stuff. And then like we'll have the data from up to today. I'm adding some more geo data. So uh, the people who will join the room, they will get, uh, how should I say, a nicer version even of the data. So maybe that's uh, uh, an encouragement to come. Thank you very much, Paul. I do hope people join you and you will be in the room number three. Okay, thank you. And just in case the participants, you can feel free to add maybe links to your challenges or to other websites and stuff on this overview. Uh, we couldn't uh, do that for all the projects, but at least the Slack channels are, are there. Then um, we have one room for the people from Ticino with their project Extra Munia and the data. So either if you want to join this concrete project or work with this data, you can join in room four. And then we have the room six for the PTT archive data and their georeferencing project. We have room seven for the looted art project of Laurel with the text detection. Then room number eight is for the Swiss clam inventory for people who want to work on the inventory of Swiss clam institutions. Then room number nine is for the Europa Meets Europe project. Room number 10 is for the data set from the Stiftung Pestalozianum with the children's drawings. And we have the we did just one room for both the cultural event calendar and the Danta entry wizard as it's with the same persons. So they can then uh, figure out which project they want to work on. And if you want to work on both projects, you can just copy the document with the description and do a description for each project. And now Oleg, I don't know because Nobody from the federal archives are here, so is it worth having a room for them, or should we also do that via Skype, uh, Slack? Or like uh, maybe if people want to ask you questions about this land challenge, or is anybody wanting to work on this uh, federal archives challenge? Okay, so maybe we'll do the federal archives challenge on, on Slack only. Um, and then we have opened a room for the genre categories on Ibsen, number 13. And then, Beat, probably you're not going to, for the data enhancement through deep learning, should people get in touch with you via Slack also more? Yeah, the best thing is probably Slack. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not the entire time, I guess. Yeah. Okay. And there's a possibility. I have the phone number of one of my students who can be contacted uh, okay. at certain times during today and tomorrow. Okay. Um, we have a room 16 for the newspapers at Wars. And then, because actually now I'm noticing when we were planning this, it worked very well in our heads. But now I suggest we have the Slack channels. So you can now see which room we have assigned to you, the WebEx room that you are free to use for your to discuss your ideas. 
and just copy the link again in your Slack channel of the room. So people can just join the Slack channel and then they can join you in the room. And if you'd rather use something else, you can use something else. But now, yes, Lothar, Andrea and I will try to join, just go from one room to the other and assist you with, um, with, date, with your project formulations. And it's always difficult. Maybe if, if we see that some ideas are not going to be uh, realized, then maybe you can go back to another room and join another project so that we have teams of maybe four persons. Um, yes. So now I suggest that you all join the rooms that we have assigned to you and use Slack to communicate. And you can contact Lothar, Andrea, and myself via Slack if you have any trouble. And I would suggest you join your room. It's important that the, the person who pitched is there and maybe wait, give the people some time to join you. And if you don't, if, if, you're, if you just want to start with your project, uh, you can also just write in the Slack channel that you won't be in the room, but people can contact you via Slack. Okay, so now I'll let you spread. And I think maybe we have to leave. I don't know if you can be in two rooms at the same time. No, you can't. So we'll have to leave the, this room and then use chat, uh, Slack to, to communicate.
Postkurskarten. Those are the um, the routes, the routes of the of the postal. Uh, well, different means of transportation of the postal service. So there are um, uh, maps uh, where there are still uh, uh, station wagons with horses, and then uh, the uh, postal cars uh, begin, and uh, you can see all the. The, the the it's 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 a combined route um, map and also there are timetables. So that's the first that's the first a uh, data set and uh, I guess we'll take some time afterwards um, to just browse through the data to look what they look like. Um, Heike, you would you would add information. Um, <laughs> So, I have a question. Is anyone of you, um, have we have to speak English or would be German okay? German is okay. For is me, it for everyone okay? German would be fine. German, great. <laughs> yeah? Alors, okay. on va on par, on parler français maintenant. On peut parler français. Nein, also. Dann, umso besser, ja. Ich habe gar nicht dran gedacht. Ich war schon so dran gewöhnt. <lacht> ähm, die die, Post die Postkurskarten, ich denke, am Ende des Hackathons werde ich es richtig aussprechen können. Auch schnell. <lacht> also die Postkurskarten, ähm, wir haben, ich habe gar nicht gesehen, wann die jetzt bei beginnen, bei diesem Set, das wir bereitstellen, aber die gehen sicher, also beginnen sicher vor 1900. 1852, das ist der allererste Fahrplan. Es ist eine, eine grafische Darstellung ähm, des Fahrplans in der Schweiz. Der erste nationale gesamtschweizerische Fahrplan. Und da sind es natürlich noch Postkutschen. Und erst seit 1906 kommen dann die Postautos dazu. Und ich schaue... Vielleicht noch, um mehr Begeisterung mal. dazu bringen... Man kann anhand der Kurskarten, weil es eben ein Timetable dazu hat, ablesen, wie schnell eine Postkutsche 1850 von Genf bis nach Zürich oder St. Gallen gebraucht hat. Und damit sind wie die Kommunikationswege, die, die Schnelligkeit der Kommunikationswege abgebildet. Und man sieht auch, wie dieses Netz über die Zeit immer dichter wird und das ist irgendwie auch noch spannend, weil man sieht, wie, wie die Schweiz und die immer kleineren Gemeinden immer genauer und besser erschlossen werden. Und wie irgendwie so ein, der, der Bund. weil es einfach die zentralen Wirtschaftswege sind. Und man sieht eben auch, wie Luca gerade gesagt hat, ähm, wie die Alpen erschlossen werden, weil 1850 ist der Alpenraum quasi leer. Da gibt es keine Straßen, die, die wirklich befahrbar sind für Kutschen. Und erst im Laufe der Zeit werden die dann ähm, ja, gebaut, dass Postkutschen fahren und dann später eben dann auch die Postautos. Und ein Fun Fact, ähm, die letzte äh, Postkutsche, die wurde erst in den no 70er Jahren des 20. Jahrhunderts aus, äh, äh, aus dem Betrieb genommen. Das war, oh. ich glaube, sogar in Graubünden, oder? Ja, im Travers, in dem Tal Travers. Okay. Ja. Ähm, das war ein Teil der, der Daten. Und der andere Teil, der ist äh, noch anschaulicher, da sind es nämlich Postkarten. Ähm, Postkarten, die das, äh, die eigentlich von der von der Post herausgegeben wurden und der Werbung gedient hat. Das war das war Marketing und da sieht man ähm, die, da sieht man meistens sind es Passstraßen und da sieht man also äh, ein, ein bisschen Schweizer Idylle und natürlich immer noch äh, das gelbe Postauto in Szene gesetzt und die sind ähm, bei uns ähm, einfach nach Ortschaft abgelegt. Also man sieht das auch im, im Dataset, da hat es jetzt steht Gotthard Pass. Was wir aber nicht haben dazu ist, 
dass das jetzt schon georeferenziert wird, dass man jetzt schon sehen kann, von wo dass das aus gemalt worden wäre. Ähm, vielleicht dazu auch spannend, es dient bei uns auch der Umweltgeschichte als Quelle, weil man anhand der Postkarte im Vergleich zu heute sehr gut sehen kann, wo Gletscher zum Zeitpunkt äh, dieser Alpenbilder äh, standen und wo sie heute stehen. Genau. Warum wir auch Postkarten genommen haben, eigentlich sind es keine Postkarten, sondern Ansichtskarten. Die sind mhm. erst seit den 1890er Jahren eingeführt worden, als die Fotografie soweit war, beziehungsweise da sind es Bilder. Ähm, man sagt, ab so Anfang des 20. Jahrhunderts waren Postkarten die SMS des 20. Jahrhunderts, weil zu der Zeit wurde die Post noch dreimal am Tag zugestellt und es war preiswerter als zu telefonieren und natürlich preiswerter auch und vor allen Dingen schneller als einen Brief zu schicken. Deswegen ist es nochmal extra spannend im Zusammenhang mit den Kurskarten, wenn man da quasi wie den Weg äh, von der Postkarte auch verfolgen könnte auf dieser ähm, Straße. Und es zeigt natürlich Beginn des Tourismus. Man hat natürlich die Sachen abgebildet, ähm, die interessant waren, nicht nur für die Schweizerinnen und Schweizer, sondern für den allgemeinen Tourismus. Und das dritte Set, äh, das wir hochgeladen haben, das ist etwas anderes. Das sind nämlich Metadaten zu den ähm, Poststellenchroniken. Vielleicht zuerst was zu Poststellenchroniken und dann etwas zu den Metadaten. Ähm, Poststellenchroniken, das sind kleine Minigeschichten, die die Posthalter, also diejenigen, die diese Poststellen betrieben haben, ähm, führen mussten über ihre Poststellen. Was geschah mit der mit der Poststelle? Wer ähm, hat die übernommen? Ähm, in welchen Gebäuden war die? Und oftmals findet man, halt, findet man halt auch Informationen über eine Gemeinde, weil die Poststellen halt dann oft auch Veränderungen in den äh, Gemeinden dokumentiert haben. Ähm, und das ist eine dankbare historische Quelle für viele äh, Lokalhistorikerinnen und Historiker, weil man dort halt ähm, oftmals Bilder oder kleine Pläne oder kleine äh, Notizen findet, ähm, die sonst nirgends ähm, abgelegt worden. Und da haben wir eben, äh, das ist einfach ein Auszug aus der Archivdatenbank mit Metadaten ähm, und die wurden ähm, von Nikola Kessler, einem äh, Arbeitskollegen von uns, dann im Open Refine äh, aufbereitet und ähm, alle Dossiers wurden dann immer einer Poststelle äh, zugeordnet ähm, und dann vermittelt dieses Reconciliation Service von Open Refine ähm, wurde das mit den dazugehörigen und auch heutigen administrativen Gemeinden auf Wikidata verknüpft. Und das ist also so ein bisschen, das wäre nochmal ein anderes Projekt, ähm, da wird es vielleicht darum gehen, die Einträge für die Poststellen auf Wikidata selbst zu erfassen und die Verknüpfung mit den Gemeinden oder über diese Verknüpfung dann eine grobe Georeferenzierung der Poststellen zu, zu ermöglichen. Aber so wie ich das jetzt verstehe, gibt es eigentlich zwei Teile. Es gibt irgendwie die Verbindung zwischen diesen Postkurskarten, es geht, und den, ähm, den, den, diesen Ansichtskarten mit den Postautos ähm, und das ähm, ja, irgendwie georeferenzieren zu können, miteinander in eine, in, in eine Verbindung zu setzen. Und das Zweite sind eher dann diese Verbindung zwischen unseren Metadaten ähm, der Postschellenchroniken mit äh, Wikidata. Also ich glaube, es gibt so ein bisschen diese zwei... zwei ähm, getrennten Challenges. Ähm, muss vielleicht auch vorausschicken, ich, ich selbst äh, bin, bin kein äh, geübter ähm, Teilnehmer beim, beim Hackathon und habe sicher ähm, äh, äh, ziemlich naiven, naive Herangehensweise und da bitte ich um eure Nachsicht auch. Also äh, <lacht> 
Genau, also wir sind auch sehr offen für, für, eure, für eure Inputs und wenn ihr seht, hey, nein, also da muss man jetzt was anderes machen, kennst du das oder das, dann noch so gerne. Also wir sind einfach offen für alles. Ähm, und offen auch deswegen, weil wir zurzeit gerade an einer neuen Webseitenlösung arbeiten. Wir möchten eigentlich diese Bestände und da sind die, die Ansichtskarten und diese historischen Karten natürlich äh, sehr wichtig für uns. Wir möchten die irgendwie cool präsentieren können. Wir möchten, dass ähm, jemand Freude hat, die entdecken zu können. Und da fragen wir uns auch, wie das gehen könnte und wären auch sehr offen für Ideen, ähm, hier am, am Hackathon. Genau. Das kann ich nur unterstützen. Ich bin eben auch äh, recht naiv jetzt an diesen Hackathon herangegangen und ähm, wir wollen einfach die Chance nutzen, um zu schauen, was, was von unseren Beständen gedacht wird und was man da weitermachen kann, dass Nutzung niederschwelliger ist und Archivquellen nicht nur ein elitäres Informationsgut sind für wenige, sondern dass man die Informationen eben weiter ähm, streuen kann. Wie, wie sieht es aus? Könnt ihr mit diesem mit unserem Input etwas anfangen oder ist, bräuchtet ihr eine, eine konkretere Challenge? Also ich persönlich ähm, muss sagen, es ist mein erster Hackathon und ich habe überhaupt keine Erfahrung und ähm, kann daher auch nicht wirklich sagen, ob ich was damit anfangen kann. Also ich muss einfach mich anschließen, was die anderen meinen. Merci. Danke. Ja, Kenny, du lachst. Es ist, nein, es ist ein sehr, ein sehr spannendes Datenset. Jetzt, jetzt ist im Moment halt die, die, das Thema noch recht offen. Jetzt müssen wir irgendwie wahrscheinlich zusammen ein kleines Projekt finden, das wir in diesen zwei Tagen ja. machen können, vielleicht auch als Proof of Concept, wie man dann weitermachen könnte. Mhm. Mhm. Vielleicht erstmal zu eurem Hintergrund. Was, was haben wir denn für, für Kenntnisse im Team? Was machst du zum Beispiel? Habt ihr das schon, pardon, wenn ich das jetzt nachfrage? Ich? Ich bin ja, ich, <lacht> ähm, ähm, ich bin Programmierer. Ah, ja. Softwareentwickler. Ja. Und ich habe schon ein paar so äh, Open Data Hackathons ah, super. gemacht. Ja. Verschiedene okay. Sachen dabei gemacht. Eben, wir sind naive Historikerinnen und Historiker und Archivistinnen und Archivisten. <lacht> okay. Ähm, Sarah, ja, was ist dein? Ja. Ja. Also ich habe Informationswissenschaft studiert, aber das ist jetzt schon ein Jahr her und es interessiert mich einfach sehr, aber ich ich bin selbst noch nicht so sicher, was ich da überhaupt beitragen kann. Ich hoffe, dass ich was ja. beitragen kann. Also zumindest Ideen, zumindest auf Nutzerseite, wie es dann weitergeht. Von daher, jeder Gedanke zählt. Sehr schön, danke. Also, na gut, danke, ich weiß nicht. Ja. Ja. Was ist äh, das dann? Äh, ich bin Bibliothekar und aber ich habe bald dann, also kein Programmier, also, aber Erfahrung habe ich ein wenig, zum Beispiel mit Leaflet. Also ich habe halt dann so eine Karte erstellt mit äh, Polygons und äh, Linien und so. Ich ähm, kann mir gut vorstellen, dass man halt dann wie so mit ähm, GeoJSON und Leaflet kann man halt dann so sehr gut die Metadaten oder die Bilder halt dann einbinden kann in eine Karte oder so. Ansonsten könnte man vielleicht so tatsächlich mit äh, Omega S halt die äh, Bilddaten mit Metadaten beschreiben und, äh, und mit Omega S kann man halt dann eben Metadaten auch mit der durch API halt heraus schicken, also rausspucken lassen und dann kann man halt dann ähm, zum Beispiel halt dann in Omega S halt dann äh, mit Wikidata verbinden, also in Omega S kann es halt dann URL auch einbinden, dann dann kriegt man halt dann so alle Verbindungen quasi so ähm, in einem Software. Das könnte halt dann einfach sein, aber die Mapping in Omega S, das ist dann nicht so nicht so gut. Also man kann nur halt dann Point Marker setzen und nicht Polygons oder so. Darum, wenn man halt ein bisschen kompliziertes machen will, dann könnte man halt dann wirklich so an andere. Also Leaflet ist ja wirklich einfach ähm, und dann kann man halt dann relativ schnell halt dann solche Ideen 
realisieren, glaube ich. Okay, das hat mich, merci viel mal, das hat mich jetzt okay. ein wenig überfordert, <lacht> muss ich zugeben. Okay, okay. Also die Fett ist halt also eine JSON Library, also nicht JSON, äh, JavaScript Library. Und äh, das, äh, ich, kann, ich kann euch gleich einen Link schicken. Äh, und mit dem kann man ja halt eigentlich ganz schnell halt eine Karte erstellen. Okay. Und äh, wenn, wenn ihr halt dann dort auf eine Karte halt dann noch eine GeoJSON Data oder halt einfach so eine Daten hat er verbindet, dann kann man halt dann ähm, halt dann freiwillige ähm, Markierung auf der Karte setzen. Ah, okay, ja, ja, ja. Ja, verstehe. Und da könnte man jetzt auch, also das ist jetzt so ein Brainstorm, aber da könnte man auch äh, die historischen Karten nehmen und äh, die irgendwie über bestehende Karten drüberlegen. Da muss man dann georeferenzieren und äh, ob dann die solche Karte tatsächlich so nicht so verzerrt wird. Also weil häufig die solche Karte werden, hat er häufig total verzerrt, wenn du georeferenzierst. Ja, ja, klar. Darum ja. könnte es dann halt ähm, könnte schwierig sein, aber ich weiß nicht, also man muss probieren. Mhm, vielleicht. Mhm. Ein, also etwas, das ziemlich oder das möglich sein müsste, wäre aber die Ansichtskarten ähm, zu georeferenzieren und ähm, vermittelt äh, Leaflet äh, darzustellen. Sich das richtig? Ja, es ist, sollte es eigentlich einfach sein. Oder Kenny kennst ja wahrscheinlich besser gut aus. Ja, oder? kein JavaScript-Spezialist, kein Leaflet-Spezialist, aber ich denke, das sollte machbar sein. Die Frage ist, ob man das automatisieren möchte. Wenn ihr, ihr habt wahrscheinlich nicht nur diese zehn Ansichtskarten, sondern ich weiß nicht, wie viele ihr noch habt. <lacht> möchte man wahrscheinlich nicht für jeden diese, diese Georeferenzierung von Hand machen. Nein, eben dass nicht. Dass man da vielleicht ein kleines Tool machen könnte, dass man aus den Beschreibungen die Georeferenzierung... Ich glaube, das sollte auch möglich sein, soweit das dass man irgendwie mit OpenStreetMap hat, hat so ein API, wo man Adressen suchen kann. Ich weiß nicht, wie gut das klappt mit so Beschreibungen wie Oberalpass oder so. Wo die halt nicht, das müsste man mal schauen. Das wäre auch eine Möglichkeit, dass man da ein kleines Tool macht, um euch diese Georeferenzierung zu vereinfachen von den Bildern, die ihr habt. Ich glaube, da wären wir sehr, sehr, sehr dran interessiert, weil das ist auch unser Problem, dass wir viele, viele ähm Bestände haben, die etwas äh, Konkretes zeigen und das aber eben auch ausweisen, wie Maloya passt, aber wir wissen nicht, wie wir das nicht manuell georeferenzieren können, äh, dass das passt. Also ich Und ich weiß auch nicht genau, wie genau äh, man da georeferenzieren kann. Oh, jetzt bin ich nicht sicher, hört ihr mich noch? Ja. Okay. Ja. Ähm, wie genau, dass man da georeferenzieren kann, eben wenn man nur solche eigentlich oberflächliche äh, Beschreibungen hat. Eine Möglichkeit, wo oh, jetzt habe ich gehabt. Oh, that's bad. Uh, yes, no, no, I could see it. For a moment. Okay. Okay. Comes and goes. So if I click here or here, the tile is not selectable, so I have to be define the rules which apply to whether a tile is selectable or not. Yes. When it is, um, I store a variable containing exactly precisely this tile <laughs> and compare mm -hmm. it to a second selectable tile. If they, mm -hmm. if they have the same value in this case, they will disappear. Otherwise, the click will be ignored. Yes. And if they are the same, um, like here and here, I remove them by means of a, another CSS property. And so um, the tile underneath becomes selectable and will be part of the game. That's basically everything. So, in fact, uh, on the layout level, you have several tables laid um, over each other. Right. And they are in HTML? 
Um, no, they are. Uh, this is dynamic HTML. So mm -hmm. if you go to the code, um, you see. Oh, the code is quite heavily uh, commenting. So this is the code. Mm -hmm. Function playable with a a variable. Um, check if playable. Yes. This is uh -huh. the the number of the 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 tile number being handed over as a variable. So now I can just uh, check. This is sort of complicated because it has to do with this um, specific layout, but never mind. What I wanted to show you is something else. Um, this is something that Philip knows already, because here you see um, the source code in HTML mm -hmm. just um, mm -hmm. consists of a couple of buttons here and of a canvas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And an overlay. So, what I do is, where are we? Right here. Of course, it is uh, heavily looped because uh, the basic HTML of any tile resembles the other one. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't make sense to code 144 tiles uh, manually, so to speak. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. So I did what I did was two loops, and then um, uh, there is a, an array called tile. Yeah. This is it. And here in this, within this loop, this, um, this is an array. This yeah. array mm -hmm. is uh, filled with tiles. So this is uh, the number I assign, tile number 0, 1, 2, 3, up mm -hmm. to 143. Um, and then into this um, variable stored in this array, I put just a, a text string, this one. This text string consists of an HTML image tag mm -hmm. with an ID consisting of the same number. Yeah. Mm -hmm. With an event handler on click. Mm -hmm. Because you are supposed, you as a, a gamer, are supposed to click on these tiles. Then on click, the, uh, the check function handing over the same number, the same mm -hmm. number, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, assigning a CSS class tile, where any graphical information on this um, type of image um, is stored. This is just plain CSS, so not yeah. the yeah. graphical mm -hmm. information. Mm -hmm. The um, Source attribute. Yeah, the, the image, yeah, yes. where, where the image is stored. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, name, I don't remember why I um, had where a name was necessary, but uh, some, at some place in the code, I need this uh, type of information. No, mm -hmm. um, no alternative text, and that's it. So you see, I store plain HTML mm -hmm. into a variable. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Then I do the loop in um, yes, exactly. This is a, a bit, a little bit more complicated because uh, um, how many are it? Eight tiles occur four times in the game, and the rest just twice. So this is very game specific and not interesting for your purposes. But this is. Mm -hmm. Um, a common principle of doing any type of graphical appearance in dynamic HTML, this, which mm -hmm. means you don't hard code what you see on the screen, 
Sure. Yes, yes. You code it in a JavaScript, and then the JavaScript uh, creates the HTML. Exactly. So far, each situation in the case just stored in a variable, and then what um, what you need to do in the end is to um, say that the element called canvas uh, must be filled with a with a virtually created JavaScript which is very simply done by means of a... Can you see my uh, text editor? Yes. So if you have a, a large um, variable containing all the HTML, say, tile, and then lots of HTML. Mm -hmm. um, sorry. Then the only thing you need to do in the end is to say um, document get element um, by ID. That's a very old fashioned way to do it, but it works. Um, canvas, which says um, get this div with the ID canvas here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm property in a HTML, right? Okay, I do not really understand inner HTML. Inner HTML is the property of this object. The, yeah, inner, the object the inner HTML, where your mouse is, yeah. Mm -hmm. The inner uh, HTML of this div consists of this here. The we genau or so. Das Problem is, I think you have already said that ich sage, dass die neueren Karten vor allem, die sind sehr ähm, stilisiert. Ich meine, die sind nicht mehr, wahrscheinlich nicht mehr korrekt geografisch. Sondern And here, uh, English translations of the column names, just to make it a bit more legible uh, of what's what. It's just the column names in, in German and then like below there's a line. You can uh, just open the CSV and replace the first line with those and then you should be good. And the new version now will of course have the English names. Ah, yeah, that's nice. No. Um, hi, uh, so we have a new uh, participant, I think. Hi. Hello. Ah, hi. Late. hi. <laughs> Hello, Brooke. Nice to see you again. It was nice to see you also the, in the past uh, WebEx and Zoom meetings of all the workshops. You know, we, we were in the uh, ICOPAD group. Yeah, yeah, I know. I remember. Yes. It was like, oh, Brooke, I know this guy. Ah. Yes. So you already are doing, I see you already are typing your, your task. I'm already what? You're already typing your uh, project description. Uh, I think uh, Ishi and David, and maybe you two are in the project description. Uh, uh, one quick question. Birk, do you see, because I don't know how this is on WebEx, if you join later, do, this, do you see the previous chat? Good question. Let me see. No. Okay. Because... Yes. Um, wait, I'll just copy paste everything and paste it again. It looks like, ah, okay. just to have you updated because I'm making a new version, um, with more geo data. So I'm adding latitude and longitude, uh, and also the link to the, uh, Getty, uh, of geographic names, um, and also putting uh, English column names because the, the uh, CSV right now only has German ones. And so I provided a sort of translation to make it a bit more easy to work with. Okay, that looks good. Now I just have to get all of those. Mm-hmm. 
Maybe I'll pass the links uh, uh, in the Slack channels as well, so, so that we have everything there. Yeah, I thought it, it would be good to have one place where it's all together. Yeah. And the uh, Ishan is this uh, is now the, the data set more um, accessible with the English translation, or uh, you still have some question about it? Uh, it's much uh, it's much better now. <laughs> <laughs> I I, re I replaced all the German words with uh, cool. the yeah. English translations. No, sorry about that. It's funny because we have the same problem kind of within the institute. We're a multilingual institute, and our database is only in German. And so well, we're missing a new version of the database interface. And the idea would also be that for our French speaking and Italian speaking um, colleagues, they don't have to have a chart next to them all the, all the time to see like what means what, you know, because, yeah. Mm -hmm. And we're looking for it very, very yeah, much. So yeah, I'm posting a new link in the chat in a moment. Um, Hi hey guys, I'm just checking up on you again. <laughs> I joined your Slack channel so I can be informed and you can contact me if you have any problem. Yeah. So I see, are you, you got it, you got started on it's the still not, Yeah, we're still working on the new version of the data set. Okay, and but then that's also something. Yeah, something. Working with your data and making it better. And then from there, uh, we will see if there's um, ideas, questions, remarks, everything, yeah. Okay, okay. Well, if you need anything, you can just write to me on Slack and I'll try to join you. And otherwise, I'll, uh, I'll try to check in again. And just in case you all want to leave the meeting, just leave it and do not end it. So the room is still open so you can join the room again later. Okay. Uh, yeah. Who's the official? Who's the official host? So who has to always be in the meeting for it to not blow up? It's mm -hmm. called the Glen Hack Tree. Uh, so yeah. You, you so it's are. our computer. It's, it's just a computer here in Cool. Okay. Okay, that's good. So that's just, the. Yeah. yeah. Mm. I just, I'm on a VPN that is somewhat unstable and I needed to access the database. But so if that kicks me out, sometimes I might have to rejoin the WebEx thing. Okay. So, that shouldn't make a problem with the chat for others, right? Probably not. Okay. Yeah. We'll, I mean, otherwise we will just uh, get in touch with you on the Slack if we set it up again or something. Okay. 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 Good. So I'll check up on you later. Thank you. Bye. So Ishan Chihau, Berg, I posted this. Uh, Example of there is the Getty thesaurus of geographic names. Um, I posted the the link in the ch chat here. And the new okay. data set it will have the ID of this uh, thesaurus, and um, this is also where we get the latitude and longitude data. But the cool thing about this is there you can see the um, uh, the hierarchy. So you can go from a town to a region, to a country, to a continent, so in the end, the uh, world, the planet, you know. Um, 
and not all of the data that we have um, will have this ID because sometimes it's an exhibition in a very small uh, village that is not in this thesaurus, but many of them will have this. So um, I think the latitude longitude thing is good because like you can use it with anything. Um, and, and if you want more data or if you want other language labels for the locations, uh, you can get them from there. Uh, but I'm warning you a little bit because we did import from there and it's not necessarily, uh, how should I say, it's not necessarily super easy, nor is it super complete. But I just wanted to give you some, uh, yeah, some authority file for the, um, for the geographic data instead of just, I mean, in the end, latitude, longitude is the ultimate authority file. You say this uh, centimeter on earth, this is where this is, but also these things shift sometimes. Um, Birk, since you joined later, um, I'm, I'm wondering what the info is that you don't have yet. Maybe you should know that there's also a second. Um, uh, sorry, more second on the part? artists themselves. Yeah, there's a second data more. set. Okay. And they're kind of interlinked. So the data set that we're, that we're sharing here is the exhibitions, and then you have the, the artist IDs. And the second data set is more on the artists themselves. So like when they were born, what their names are, um, where they were born. I, mean, I think it's very like basic. Data. Maybe there's also, I guess there's a G and D in there. VF, not yet, I think. But um, yeah, um, David, do we already, because I, would have, I would, was not monitoring the Slack channel a lot so far. Um, I post the links. Um, yes, so I'm still, still, yeah. still waiting for the for the new version of the exhibition data set, but uh, you, will, you will find the, the link to this biographical data uh, in the Slack channel. Yeah. yeah. I can. I, I, can post, here right now. I can post it in the chat as well. Yeah. No, this is not the right one. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, that one. We have to revise a bit on the. It says um, with the artist data, it says language language independent, which really it isn't. <laughs> it's like English, and uh, we can post other versions. Did you further specify the goal of your project? Um, I'll <laughs> go into the. Uh, so we, I think we st we're just sharing this um, data without a, a precise project in mind. I think what what could be interesting is the thing that you had done initially, uh, Davide, which was, uh, so the things, we have this data and it's very, in a way it's very dry. And like Zika, the place where the data gets consumed is not very visual. And uh, one thing that Davide had done and I think uh, we could do in a in a even how should I say more more detailed or a fancy version is um, one thing I I think would be very interesting to see is like you have a map and you see where exhibition takes place and then that could also be some kind of time lapse that you see oh at the beginning of the 1950s you have a lot of exhibitions in Bern and then it shifts maybe towards Geneva and Lausanne so basically. Uh, mapping this data to the map and then also through time and uh Isha had already said it would be interesting to be able to filter by artist so that you can see um if you have an artist where they are especially exhibiting or what time period are they especially exhibiting in, and what you have in mind uh, is also very much like a, a, a wish a dream vision would be this kind of map where you can 
search for an artist and then you have um so you would have the filter of um by navigating the map you only see that part of the map and uh, by filtering for more several artists you only see their activities and then filtering also for time periods maybe um i think that would be very interesting yeah i mean another I, thing that came into my mind was that uh, one question is that if you look at um, individual artists mm -hmm. can you categorize them after if they only in exhibit basically in one air city, you know, like really local artists, or if there is some kind of divide of Switzerland, you know, like between the French speaking and the German speaking and the Italian speaking part. So is there people who are only exhibiting basically in the French speaking part and yeah. never cross the border to the German speaking? So if you could see some kind of clusters there, mm -hmm. that would be interesting. Yeah, um, so, some that I totally agree with you and the, um, so in the biographical data set, you also have um, um, a field, which is called, uh, I can't remember, so, but there is a, a kind of a ranking. Mm -hmm. And um, so the ranking is based on five level, um, A, B, C, D, and E, I think. And this rank, mm -hmm. the ranking is related to the, actually it is related to the geographical um, reach of, mm -hmm. uh, of an artist. So the, E level is international level, the B level is national one, the C is uh, um, is super regional level. So uh, an artist exposed in Lausanne in the French speaking um, part of Switzerland, but also in uh, in the German one. And then uh, uh, the E and D are uh, a very local level. And it would be nice maybe to so this this ranking is now. Um, um, set uh, manually by editors. So mm -hmm. we, we go through the exhibition, we look at catalogs, and then we decide the ranking. And we, maybe it would be nice to like to compare, you know, um, mm -hmm. this ranking manually set by editors with the uh, actual data in the in the data set, and to see if the, it is current or if there is a uh, anomalies. That, that is also something that could be nice to explore. I don't totally agree with you. Another way I'm, I'm really interested in is collaborations. So you have an exhibition with more than one artist and to see um, uh, the network that uh, an artist can create um, through exhibitions and uh, uh, by um, yeah, working with other artists, how this, uh, how the network is structured. Um, um, is it, uh, the, yeah, does it, does, does he or she uh, collaborates with uh, only a few specific artists or does he have a, like a, a more broadest approach with many different uh, uh, collaborations. That's also that's could, could be also something uh, interesting to to, do, to explore. Yeah, I mean, in general, independent from this specific project right now, I think that's one of the big problems that you don't really have a lot of data on exhibitions available. I mean, it's I mean, as an art historian, I always encounter this problem again. You know, there is no real. I mean, I see you have the artifacts link there. You know, like basically the only source for or if you want to get an overview over who is exhibiting where is a proprietary database mm -hmm. so in general i mean right now it's maybe not the best project for right now but it would be really great for example to ingest this data on wiki data or to, yeah. to you know <laughs> that more people are doing that I, I think it would be also it also would be nice because uh maybe this is something that we should also specify um, you will see sometimes seen uh, you will sometimes see in the data it's written in German in the string, right? uh, where it says uh, andere ch künstler. Uh, <laughs> so what that means is um, since we are an institute that is uh, funded 66% by the government of Switzerland, um, our aim is kind of our our task is to document what Swiss artists are doing or artists who are active in Switzerland. But so the problem is if you have a group exhibition and it's in, in Paris, for example, and there are 10 people taking part, but only five of them are Swiss, only those five will be in our database and the other five don't get documented by us, which I think is kind of a, I'm very unhappy about it, but it's this kind of thing of uh, division of labor of like, oh yes, the Swiss database should do the Swiss artists and the French database should do the French artists. But then of course, where do they come together? And they come to get, they could come together, for example, in Wikidata by every institution stating what data they have and then putting it together and then you get a more complete picture. Yeah, no. Right now, what we have is kind of, it, it seems like there is a lot, but there is also things that are 
not there and that always has to be communicated, I feel. Go for me. Yeah, we have the same problem in our data for performing arts. So. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, also, I have a question. Um, I provided this data set as CSV because I thought it's not a non compartment format and everything. Um, I can also provide you in uh, an Excel file or HTML or whatever is best for you. So apart from CSV, it's easy to go from whatever format you want. But um, if you tell me, if we all say that Excel is better or something, I could, I could do that. Um, so uh, for your example, Ishan, what is the best? Is CSV okay for you or would another format would be, or does it not matter at all for you? Uh, I think CSV is all right. I mean, okay. I'm, I'm trying. I'm trying out to kind of like use play around with the data a bit. So I try to see what I can do. Yeah, so let's just pick it. I'm just doing that for now. I think CSV is kind of the common ground for whatever you want to do. You can go up there from CSV. Yeah. yeah. Also, maybe there's one thing I should mention. There's a kind of an Easter egg in the data, which I thought I would just. I'm specified in there to to let you find out um, yourself, but since we're also a small group, I can I can let you in on the secret. Um, there are traveling exhibitions, and so a traveling exhibition is where you have an exhibition that takes place at three different locations, but most of the times it will have the same title, and it will have the same artist participating. Um, we have an ID that kind of would give you the information of like, oh, what is the traveling exhibition and how do you group them? Uh, but it's kind of, uh, right now we just kind of look at them all of like, oh, this was one exhibition station, so to speak. And maybe there's another station or maybe there's not. But if you group them by exhibition title and maybe additionally, but you, do, you wouldn't really have to, if you group them by exhibition title, and exhibition, uh, the artist IDs, uh, you can find out where those traveling exhibitions are. And I think since Davida was interested in this network approach of like, who's collaborating with whom, who's showing, who's showing where, that would also be interesting to see. You have uh, three exhibitions, um, no, I'm sorry, you have three institutions that often work together and have traveling exhibitions. For example, I know more from the photography world, but there's a place in Paris called Le Bal, and then there's the Photo Museum Winterthur, and then uh, there's uh, CO Berlin. And yeah, like, yeah. I I've had this thing that I've seen the same exhibition twice, once in Winterthur and once in Berlin, and it's the same exhibition, but of course it's a bit different because the space is different, but they, and then the Volkwang Museum in Essen, I think is also part of this group of four exhibitions, of four institutions that share their exhibitions. And so through exploring the data and grouping by title and artist IDs, you can kind of figure out which of the institutions are also collaborating. Maybe I can share with you the, the sample I did a couple of months ago. It was for a presentation on universities. Um, so it's very, very, very basic <laughs> trial with um, um, an application called, um, how it's called, Giphy. Are you familiar with or Giphy? How do you call this? I know. Yeah, I, I, I know about it, but I never used it. Yeah, so it's, it's a very um, powerful application, I think, and uh, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just starting to experiment with it and uh, so this is a, 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 a trial an example where I, I tried to to combine this the special the, the, the geographical data with the chronological one and uh, to see how if it was possible to yeah, to visualize the evolution in time of the connection between uh, the small dots with our um, artists Swiss artists and um, 
Um, so I selected only uh, the major uh, institutions in Switzerland and their exhibition on how they um, evol uh, evolved in time. And I don't know if you do you have access to the to the little video. Yeah. Okay. And maybe I also can share. I have to say, uh, David, the, the data set that you were working for, that visualization was a bit more limited in the mm. sense that um, this was only for exhibitions that had five or more participants because you were specifically interested in like artists who were showing together. So like if you would do the same visualization with the data set that we have now, where you also have exhibitions where only one artist is exhibiting, you would get different results because you have more data points. Yeah, a lot more data. Yeah, of course. And also I reduced the, yeah. uh, the, the data set uh, to only um, five or 10 uh, institutions. So it's a really uh, a small, uh, okay. small window from the, yeah. the whole um, data set that is now available. I mean, and that's another way to maybe I'm always thinking of this kind of visualization on map. That would be another way to to filter the exhibitions. An exhibition where you only have one artist versus a group exhibition where you have two or sometimes, I think in the most extreme cases, we have like 60 artists in one exhibition, um, somewhere around there. Yeah, and maybe something to, to note as well is that uh, I I used as a, so in order to place the dot the artist dot on the map, I used the um, the birthplace, which of course uh, doesn't really match the working place of an artist. Mm. Um, so this is maybe something that you have to. You should be bear in mind if you work if you want to work in this direction is that uh, right now uh, I think the biographical data give you access only to um, places of birth and death and not the workplace of an artist, which of course can be um, a little different. Is there at all any source for or I mean do you collect this data at all? I mean, it's sometimes difficult to define where somebody's work. I mean, everybody writes that in their CV, you know, living and working in. <laughs> um, but it's kind of, um, I didn't ever saw that in some database, let's say, you know, that where somebody's working. You also know that's the problem. I think it would be very interesting to have this data. Uh, also in the sense of, I mean, artists are always the first uh, wave of gentrification. So if you see where <laughs> artists live and where they have their studios, you know will know where the housing prices will go up in the next five years. You can do this with Berlin. You can do this with Zurich West. With anything, you will see. This is why I'm interested in this data. The problem is we don't really have this data. Um, and Davide, what you know, we have some uh, some addresses of artists in the database, but that's very much internal information. And this is uh, data that we use to communicate with the artists if we need updates on them for something. But for example, for Pippi Lottiris, who in Switzerland is one of the most famous artists, we have an address of where she used to live in 1991. So you can't really make the data so spotty and like not up to date that you can't really do anything with that. And uh, I think also the only way to get this data accurately would be in Switzerland, the, the Kreisbüro, the office where you you have to say where you actually live um, and where you rent your apartment or something. Yeah. Um, and I'm very interested in this data, but I think for privacy issues and all kinds of things, it will never be really possible to get that data. I mean, I'm just looking at Pippi Lottiris entrance uh, on Wikidata, and they have a work location which comes from a Dutch database, RKD. Oh, yeah. Okay. No, then the so they give, they have kind of, uh, I mean, they give a work location and they give a source for that. Could and you that post one, the chat quickly? Wait a second. No, RKD, they do this. They are the only ones to really do this thing. Um, and it's especially interesting for historical artists. Thank you. 
for historical artists who have traveled in many countries and like work, uh, and they also map this historically when who was where when. Yeah. But it's also this question of like what is the reality of of um, artists today in the sense that. Uh, the really big artists will have several places where they live and or work. Maybe they officially do something, but unofficially are really doing something somewhere else. So I would always take it with a grain of salt. Because, yeah, they say Platz van Werksamheit, so the location where she works, they say Zurich, uh, which... Which is probably better than her place of birth, which is Graz, where you don't know where it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. No, maybe, we, maybe. the thing is, I know internally we have the address of like her studio where she works. And I know it's an address in Zurich, but um, oh, again, maybe she has moved five times since then, and we wouldn't really know. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Maybe it would be possible to the. Also, I want to say just because I think R RKD it's only in Dutch, right? Oh no, it's, oh, this is yeah, this is English, but they don't translate some of the labels. Uh, the thing is, I'm half Flemish, so I speak Dutch. Um, they say in qualificasis, and this, so they say that she's a pop singer. Ah, yeah, I see. They also they also list her as a musician and pop singer. <laughs> she's. I, I like that she has some artworks where she is singing in the videos, but uh, to call her a pop singer is maybe a bit of a stretch. <laughs> exactly. Maybe it would be possible to derive the. Um information about the working place from exhibition data. Um, you can see probably the, the place where one, um, so an, an artist is more, um, I call this, um, um, the more, more, prob um, more chance that to see, um, yeah, an artist will, an artist will work, uh, will ex exhibit in places clo closer to his working place. And then maybe it would be possible to, like to confront or to, I don't know, make this kind I, I of... Think it, I think there's not really much of a correlation because it's the same as with like people who do sports. You know, like Olympic athletes, I think, I, how does the sentence go? Like, uh, live high, uh, live high, train low or something. No, it's something about like, they, they do their practice up high in the mountains because yeah, you yeah. have less oxygen. So there's more of a practice effect. And then if you uh, have the competition on a lower altitude, you perform better. And I think artists do the same in the sense that they have one place where they live, but that is not li not necessarily tied to where they exhibit. Or like, it's also what I hear from gallerists. Every gallery has a, a location in Berlin, but they don't sell anything in Berlin. They go to fairs and they sell in, in Hamburg, Frankfurt, London, but they, you don't sell artwork in Berlin, even though you have a location there. Yeah. So, uh, this is certain. Uh, yeah, that's probably true for the uh, international um, uh, rank uh, artists, but maybe for the like, the original one. And um, yeah, I don't know. That was uh, some some random. <laughs> so. I think I still I still want to check one room with a performing arts um, related topic. So maybe I will join you again later. Okay. Sure. Perfect. Yeah. See you. Okay. See you later. See you later. <laughs> um. I don't. I don't know how you want to. Are you plan to uh, to work in the next few hours? Maybe. Um, um, I was thinking making a po uh, break now, and then maybe we can. I can catch you later um, uh, during the. Um, what do you call this? The yes, provider like session. Okay. Data provider session. Oh wait, yeah, there is um at, at the table. Okay. Okay. Um yeah, at fifth uh, at the uh, three PM. At three PM you'll be back.
Uh, yes, yes, 3 p.m. So in, in, in two hours, because uh, Ishan and Chihau, we know you're in a different time zone. So, ah, yeah. of course, yeah. <laughs> in two hours, yeah. Um, I will have the new data set ready, I think, in about, in about half an hour. I will be able to share... Uh, Maybe I just I just uh, throw it up on Google Drive and post a link here. I think that's the easiest. I'll post it here and in the Slack. In the Slack channel as well. Yeah, this is a good idea. Um, and then for any questions, you can post them in the Slack channel. I'll be in and out of here also. Um, but I think it's, it's it's lunchtime here, so I will start cooking something. Make the file ready. <laughs> exactly. Uh, the we'll think about that. The files also cooking. Yeah. yeah. But if you have any sure. questions at any point, uh, just ask. See you later, guys. See Bye. You later. Thank you. Bye. OK. Um, müssen wir das ausführen? What is needed skills? Programming? Data sets. Um, knowledge of indexing, huh? Mhm. Jetzt schreibt, weiß ich nicht mehr, wie man Knowledge schreibt. Könnte kurz jemand übernehmen. Ich weiß nicht mehr, wie man Knowledge schreibt. Oh. Merci. Merci für meine Sache. Okay. Und Long Term Vision. Um, is ein, um, ein quasi durchwandern der Karten, eben Coaches on the way müsste jetzt kommen, mit der Kutsche durch die Schweiz zu fahren. Virtuell durch die Schweiz zu fahren, hä? Oh. Okay. <lacht> Das wäre super cool, als, als so End. Also, ja. das ist nicht, aber wenn man ja. dann an jeder Station noch diese Geschichten hätte von irgend, ja. irgendwas, was da passiert ist, wäre sicher cool. Mhm. Ja. Mhm. Können wir so mit dem anderen Projekt, mit dem äh, diese Augmented Reality zusammenarbeiten? Dann <lacht> Ja, ah. Schön. Ah, ah, das vom 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 Fistopo. Ja. Ja. Was meint ihr dazu? Also ja, das wäre spannend, wenn das geht. Ja. Okay. Ähm, so und jetzt ist eine naive Frage: Wie geht man davor, dass man da also ich finde toll, wenn, wenn du das machen könntest, Kenny, mit diesen Möglichkeiten, das, weil das ist ja erst der erste Schritt. Aber vielleicht könnte man, je nachdem, was wir heute herausfinden, ähm, dann mit der Augmented Reality zusammenarbeiten. Ja, das müsste man mit Thomas Weibel, glaube ich, macht das. Ja. In diesem Hackathon. Dann, wenn wir in der georeferenzierten Daten hätten, vielleicht könnte man da irgendwie ja. Also, dann versuchen wir uns heute darauf zu fokussieren und ich schreibe jetzt gleich nochmal Thomas Weibel an, ob wir uns gegebenenfalls am zweiten Tag, ob er heute Abend mit uns nochmal sprechen kann und ob wir gegebenenfalls am zweiten Tag dann mit Ihnen zusammenarbeiten können, was das heißt, ob das möglich wäre. Mhm. Ja. Okay. Sind alle glücklich? Ja. Super, danke. Ja, du auch noch was? Gut, danke. Okay, gut. Also, ähm, ähm, huch. Aha, jetzt bin ich weiter gut. Ähm, soll ich das bei der Long Term Vision da drauf schreiben noch? Das, oder, ähm, Sarah, könntest du das beim Long Term Vision? mit possibility to um, to work with uh, wie heißt die Gruppe denn augmented reality group oder wie die heißt ja swiss ar heißen sie glaube ich im moment ah okay 
Hallo, so hat. Okay, vielleicht ein Fragezeichen noch. Super, weiß ich immer. Ja, okay. Gut. Also, und, also Kenny, du arbeitest da dran und ähm, Nobutake, du machst das, was, was du gesagt hast, was du probieren willst. Und ja. Sarah und ich gucken, welche Möglichkeiten es gibt, wie wir, wie wir auch ans Ziel kommen können. Mhm. Ja. Wollen wir uns irgendwie um eine Uhrzeit treffen nochmal, dass wir uns schauen und abgleichen? Ja. Ja? Ähm, um, um welche Uhrzeit? Ich glaube, 14.30 Uhr müssen wir das fertig haben, ist das richtig? Ja. Vielleicht ja. schreibe Provide Description of the Project. Okay. Um 14 Uhr. Gut, also treffen wir uns doch um 14 Uhr. Ist das okay ja. für alle? Ja, ich, ich bin dann eben, wie gesagt, in dieser, ja. in dieser Präsentation von der Kollegin. Okay. Gut, also. Aber ich sollte so um ja, kurz nach drei, wahrscheinlich bin ich wieder zurück, Super. bis etwa fünf oder so, halb sechs. Okay, ja, okay. Ja. ich bin auch bis fünf dann da. Gut, super. Merci, dann bis um zwei für Sarah und Nobutake. Ist das okay? Ja. ja. Alles klar, ja. Super, bis dann. Tschüss. Tschüss. Ciao. Ciao. Maybe you uh, also can mark on the map from where you took the picture. Like, okay. what do you think where it was taken from? Like this. We just need motivation for people to do that because otherwise it looks more like a marathon or something. Like a crowdfunding, I don't know. Like people working together to fill this data with new images. It's not really a game, it's like a challenge or something. Oh. I think it's quite difficult to find the exact spots, so we would need metadata. And I think there's metadata provider with some. Um, mm -hmm. She said something that at least they know who draw it and they watch time and they watch region. I still imagine it quite hard to find the exact spot in nowadays landscape. Um, Not sure. I think it would be hard to find people who would actually go outside and mm -hmm. find. Um, I think lots of people would be interested in doing yeah. that. There's lots of people hiking in Switzerland all the time in all the possible places. Uh, and it would be the perfect Corona challenge. <laughs> <laughs> no, like, like for real. We're not allowed to leave the country, but we're allowed to, leave, to go hike in the summer. And then you could... Um, yeah, I was just thinking, I know that, like, you know, those Instagram pictures with stunning landscape, and they mostly don't tell you where it's taken. And then in the chat, it starts like, well, wh where was it taken? And then it goes all down until someone says, I was there last year. No, 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 that's just in this place. I think, um, maybe we could like find in the photography community a community that's interested in participating in our game challenge however you call it okay hey it could work yes you're right it could really work um we don't have to do it if, like, if we make a challenge out of it um so kind of we ask the question, who is able to find this spot? And please uh, mm -hmm. take a picture of it, just to prove mm -hmm. that you're there. Mm -hmm. It does the exact same picture. Mm -hmm. 
or, for now or it looks not... like it's built purely on enthusiasm of the people mm-hmm. like if we get the local photo abbiamo cioè il nostro livello di visualizzazione è molto forte sulle mappe poi magari i contenuti audio non, non è che proprio ce li ascoltiamo tutti cioè, cosa che invece magari un art lover potrebbe fare no? è più identificare il percorso dove dobbiamo andare il, dove andiamo, dove si parte dove si arriva e, cioè, possiamo farlo quanto è lungo e anche a differenza della famiglia col camper, l'art, l'art lover, se è un urbano, ehm, dovrà, eh, dovrà sapere se ci sono servizi. Eh, perché a differenza del nature lover non è un vero montagnino, quindi arriverà con le scarpe sbagliate, non saprà dove andare in bagno, non si porta al pranzo, al calo di zuccheri, a metà. Cioè. Um, sì. È veramente che distingue è il move by disperation o move by passion che secondo me distingue una persona con family in campo metti anche servizi cioè parcheggio è fondamentale eh certo il parcheggio ci siamo servizi di cioè che ci puoi arrivare sì. puoi arrivare fino a un certo punto ci sono le strade il parcheggio accessibile poi dopo c'è tutto però perché secondo me o si muove con il camper oppure si muove in giornata la famiglia mm. uh, quindi vai e torni non è che andrei molto di più mm. oppure se messi è perché sei comunque abbastanza organizzato per ce la fai con... mm. quindi del tipo viaggi di solito, che possono essere viaggi non so, di un giorno o un weekend secondo mm. me sì è più, uh, è più realistico mm. Mm. No, io due, no, metti anche due giorni in camper. Cioè, okay. Secondo me se vai in camper due giorni li fai. Se sei invece un art cultural lover, fai un giorno. Sì, giornata. Eh, io sì. mi muoverei in giornata, poi ritornerei a casa. Sì. E come servizio hai bisogno anche del bar, del, cioè, mm. interessa anche a socializzare, sì. a conoscere qualcun altro. Invece noi che viaggiamo in famiglia non abbiamo nessuna intenzione di socializzare con altri. Oh. È arrivato Said a portare il sushi per <ride> Scusate, veramente. Vogliamo fare, la... Vogliamo fare una pausa? Eh, però magari se sì, possiamo usare um, la whiteboard, mm. insomma, magari durante la pausa possiamo mettere delle cose che ci vengono in mente. Sì. Sì. Eh, una cosa volevo dirti però, eh, Giovanni, per la parte sì. dei dati, mm. adesso Wikidata, eh, ma in realtà Wikidata può contenere pochissimi dati, cioè in realtà eh, è mo- ha molti limiti. È un repository che comunque è abbastanza restrittivo, per cui a parte che non hai tutti i dati su generali, su uh, quello che è esercenti non ce l'hai, mentre invece è una cosa che in mm. ce l'hai, quindi non ci sono problemi. Sì. Per anche eh, i musei non, cioè, devono essere delle istituzioni, è come se fosse una preselezione di istituzioni, per cui quello va un po' tenuto conto. Ok. Sono caricati però dei dati sulle collezioni e questo... Mm. Eh, dà un po' più di prestigio comunque struttura un po' meglio l'informazione per cui in realtà i, le informazioni sulla collezione del museo della Levantina potrebbero stare lì il problema è che ci sono dei musei che hanno delle, delle collezioni terminate poi di oggetti d'uso per cui ah. il wikipediano medio di solito va fuori di testa cioè gli insetti ok ah. ma non so i, le ciotole no cioè, sì. Ci sono, ah, dei problemi eh, ci sono delle restrizioni rispetto ai tipi di contenuti. Eh, ci sono comunque delle tensioni, mh, però le collezioni potrebbero andare su Wikidata, quindi in realtà potremmo georeferenziare comunque un oggetto e collegarlo a un luogo sulla mappa, cosa che non possiamo fare con eh, OpenStreetMap. Questa secondo me è una distinzione interessante. Beh, okay. pensi, non lo puoi inserire, cioè il luogo di deposito, il museo di Leventina, mu- luogo di provenienza comune di, e tante volte era anche segnalato luogo di produzione, cioè... Mh, no, come no, è il Prismat parti dal luogo, cioè non puoi dare un'informazione su un oggetto, puoi dare un'informazione su un, un luogo, un edificio, quindi deve essere un luogo fisico che ha un maggiore... Non è infatti, cioè... 
la collezione ah sì no su Wikidata sì allora gli oggetti della collezione possono essere messi su Wikidata che è una cosa interessante perché anche per la Leventina e anche per fare dei collegamenti rispetto a eh, il, um, il museo quello della Val Bertacca può essere utile e forse anche il museo di storia naturale non so se ha una collezione il museo di storia naturale che si collega alla Val Fiora questo è scusate è arrivato Said <ride> pronto? Mi okay. sento più. Ciò pensato invece di generare. Eh no, sulle collezioni il museo cioè non, non sono espressamente collegati. Però sono diversi oggetti che sono anche lì, sia um, alcune rocce oppure alcuni animali. Cosa, scusami Vanessa, non ci ho sentito, scusa. Stavo guardando. Cos no, Yolanda, Yolanda chiedeva se c'erano delle collezioni del museo legate alla valle. Eh, ci sono, ma non sono, sono miste sono messe nelle altre collezioni magari ci sono alcuni campioni di rocce oppure ci sono alcuni scheletri di animali che sono presenti anche nella Val Fiora ma che loro non... cioè, che hanno al museo non sono solo lì magari oppure nell'erbario ci sono delle piante che sono anche lì però non sono collegate neanche a livello di catalogo Potrebbe essere interessante questa cosa di uh, poterle mettere su Wikidata, georeferenziarle e quindi farle apparire nella mappa, perché a quel punto avresti la citazione della collezione, quindi un riferimento diretto al museo. Questa può essere una strada. Ma io direi una cosa, visto che mi pare di capire che siamo solo noi uh, nel, uh, nel progetto, possiamo considerare i dati che effettivamente potrebbero finire su Wikidata, Mentalmente, se per questioni tecniche no, non riuscirò ad ottenere realmente la Wikidata, facciamo un, un piccolo fake, ottengo, otteniamo i dati e poi li visualizziamo come se venissero da Wikidata oppure da, eh, dalle altre piattaforme. D'accordo. Va bene. Però, però questa cosa qua fanno rispondere tutti. Perché eh, è una cosa beata, se la collezione dei musei dovrebbe sapere mm. molto bene questa cosa. Io cercherei anche... Allora, ma sì, i compiti che possiamo darci ci può essere... Potremmo guardare i materiali eh, che abbiamo a disposizione. Non so, magari Marta può guardare la collezione degli oggetti delle ventine e identificare, non so, due oggetti o due riferimenti rispetto al territorio. Magari che poi ci sono anche fatti in cuore. Okay, cioè... cioè, interrompo, inter interrompo la condivisione perché... Vedo che il mio computer comincia a faticare, eh, si blocca tutto. Ecco. Ok. Ma per presentare i dati eh, alle, alle 14 o alle 14.30? Alle 14.30 fra un'ora. Ok. Um, quindi questo disegno può essere una, un riferimento, cioè potremmo usare questo come, come schema? Se volete lo, lo metto in pulito e vi mando il link. Per questo appunto mi serviva giusto schizzare. Eh, mentalmente direi di passare, eh, uh, questo appunto l'ho utilizzato per schizzare perché non, non avevo idea di che cosa usciva fuori intanto da questa discussione. Possiamo passare a un altro tool e vi do a tutti voi gli accessi in modo tale che potete, potete editarli. Siamo, uh, lo conosco, siamo Figma direi, così ci ritorno utile anche per la, per la parte di progetto. Aspetta, faccio fatica a sentirvi forse c'è condividiamo sì. su Slack così almeno che Valeria sì. io lo vede sì 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 ok perfetto eh, lo, adesso ve lo condivido però penso che per la presentazione che dobbiamo fare alle due dobbiamo usare quella Grazie. scheda eh, che ci hanno dato su Google Drive quindi va, va trasformato in una slide che mettiamo all'interno del brainstorming e vanno sì. aggiornate Beh. Faccio una cosa, eh, ve lo imposto su Figma, per cui poi bisogna semplicemente fare lo screenshot di, 
di quella porzione. Faccio che lo oriento già in modo tale da farla in, pro in proporzione per la dimensione della slide, così non si mai a rifare centomila volte le stesse cose. Ok. E poi eh, vanno... Io all'interno comunque, secondo me, qualche prova di caricamento su Wikimedia Commons, eh, Wikidata e mm. Wikipedia, dei materiali che abbiamo rilasciato, quello me ne posso occupare io. Mm. Okay. Secondo me bisogna anche aumentare le relazioni con le persone della Hecaton. Cioè andiamo a caccia mm. di... Eh, mm. Sì. Eh, che anche quello secondo me può essere utile in modo tale da farci aiutare, perché... Eh, sì. Eh, sì, appunto, se c'è qualcuno che, che, mi, che mi dice come si fanno le, le API per ottenere i dati dai, dai, uh, dei dataset, dai, uh, dai tool che abbiamo deciso, per me sarebbe perfetto. Io poi mi posso curare il design dell'interfaccia, uh, cioè di, di curarlo nel senso di implementarlo realmente, quindi farla diventare una, una pagina web. Quindi come facciamo a recuperare dati da Osma, da Wikidata? E sì. eh, per quanto riguarda mh, quelle che sono la parte di commenti o così, sì. può essere libero. Que quello lì non c'è problema, per quello so come ottenere, cioè come creare una sorta di piccola database, anche se non lo è, e inserire e ah. caricare dei dati. Quello non, non è un problema. Quando parlavate con Valerio nella, in Slack degli strumenti esistenti, quindi tu hai citato, ma boh, lui ha citato, sì. lui ha tirato fuori questo at, uh, Atlas Fork che l'ha fatto lui, quindi era una mappa sì. sulla quale mm. recuperava. Però la mappa è basata su Osma, e poi immagino che aggiunge dei sì. punti. Esatto. Sì, eh, sia lì a Flat che Mapbox sono dei tool, cioè ma Mapbox è in realtà proprio una piattaforma, un, un, un sito web che ti permette di... Eh, oltre che ottenere le mappe che vengono da OpenStreetMap, anche di customizzarle. L'IAFLET è una libreria JavaScript eh, più a basso livello che ti permette di aggiungere alcune piccole cose, però non c'è tantissima possibilità di... Cioè, meglio, c'è tanta possibilità di, di ricassare se ci fosse il tempo. Noi, visto che abbiamo solo due giorni, è meglio andare su una piattaforma che, che, che prende già sì, un'interfaccia grafica più immediata. Quindi pensavi di usare questa come, come possibile strumento per... Sì, per... Infatti, andando sulle mappe direi di utilizzare Mapbox. Invece questo GeoJSON è sempre collegato con questo? Quello lì è collegato nel momento in cui otteniamo... Uh, cioè, o meglio, quello lì è un tool che poi vi posso magari spiegare brevemente come funziona, che, che permette di, a livello grafico, proprio interagire in una mappa, quindi aggiungere un punto, oppure tracciare un percorso, individuare un'area, uh, quindi graficamente nel primo pannello. Sulla destra c'è un, un generatore eh, dinamico di codice che in funzione di quello che viene tracciato sulla mappa lui crea già il GeoJSON, ossia eh, impacchetta già i dati in modo tale che poi possano essere riutilizzati eh, in un sito web oppure caricati online. Quindi in qualche maniera si fa, fa da traduttore tra quello che viene visto nello schermo e quello che poi effettivamente serve uh, in, un, in un database per storare quelle informazioni. Allora, eh, beh, compiliamo direi... Eh. Sì, faccio che io adesso eh, metto in pulito quello che abbiamo visto prima e vi mando il link in modo tale che tutte voi lo possiate condividere. Solo eh, Irene, eh, ti chiedo cortesemente se mi, lasci, se mi mandi qui un, un, un tuo indirizzo mail in modo tale che te lo possa condividere. Per gli altri. Certo, lo, sto, lo sto scrivendo okay. io purtroppo questo pomeriggio sono precettata e mi posso riconnettere domattina okay, però no, vale. tanto quello che, che cerco di seguire le comunicazioni sì 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 ah, anche se non ci sei noi ovviamente condividiamo tutto quanto e cerchiamo di, uh, di tenerti aggiornata ok grazie Seguo sul canale Slack come Valerio, così vedo okay. cosa succede. D'accordo? Sì, perfetto. Um...
Dici, ci prendiamo il tempo di mangiare? Ci, sì. Non so che ora, <ride> che ora ci ritroviamo. Sì, direi di sì. A mezz'oretta, così abbiamo un'altra mezz'ora per... Mm. Io comunque sono collegata, così poi ci sono da aggiungere cose. Io, io faccio che mi prendo dieci minuti per mettere in pulito e condividervi il file e poi vado anch'io a pranzo. Ci ritroviamo, so, sì, l'ora e mezza, in, facciamo intorno alle due, minuto, sì. minuto, minuto meno. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. Allora, scusate, sì. adesso perché io non posso andare fino a, avanti fino alle due invece a lavorare, magari dieci minuti me li prendo dopo. Eh, visto che okay. vi ho perso un sacco di volte, ehm, mi sentite? Sì. sì. Ok. Le, allora, eh, Giovanni diceva che ripuliva quel file, quello lì che ha... Che ha preparato, che abbiamo condiviso eh, certo. e ce lo condivide. La, le, la slide invece che hanno presentato del progetto, che parla della short description, idea, eh, goals, cosa facciamo? Le, eh, quello che fa Giovanni sostituirà questa slide o, oppure lo, lo aggiungiamo a questa slide? No, ma direi che quello che faccio io lo, lo mettiamo in coda a quella slide per farvi vedere che abbiamo già pensato a un'idea un pochettino più concreta su, sulla quale lavorare ok, okay. va bene perché se no io dire ah, dire esatto ah, eh. era quello che sì, era esattamente okay. quello che ti stavo chiedendo se cominci a riempirla tu poi eh, dopo ci lavoro un po' sì. anch'io quando ho dato da mangiare ai ragazzi che i miei devono lavorare alle due hanno lezione Qui devono ok, via. va bene. Allora, io questa mezz'ora comincio a fare quella cosa lì, perfetto. Va Anche bene. Mille. Poi dopo mi disconnetto, cioè cambio connessione e andrà meglio, ecco. E troviamo alle due, allora così lavoriamo no, insieme. Dopo, grazie mille. Ah, no. okay. Chito, ciao. Va bene, ciao, ciao, ciao. ciao.
Marta, occhio che ti si sente. Ah, ok, perfetto. Aspetta che tolgo l'audio. Conviene, sì che sei almeno più privata. Okay. È bello sentirti lavorare. <ride> Un bacio. Arrivo tra poco, comunque.
Tá, Marta. Ciao, rieccomi. Eccomi, ho allora, riacceso il... Vediamo se con noi il video anche funziona. Sì. Allora, aspetta che stavo un attimino... Sì, sto facendo un po' di confusione tra i goals. Eh. Allora. Mi veniva in mente una cosa in realtà, sì. perché da una parte c'è l'accesso a tutti i dati, no? quindi possiamo creare, dei, um, uh, possiamo creare un accesso molto pieno a tutte quelle che sono risorse, l'albergo, il museo, l'itinerario, insomma tutto quanto, quindi possiamo renderlo uh, assolutamente accessibile e OSM è un, po un ottimo posto per creare questo accesso ai dati. Però il problema è che quello che vorremmo fare noi in realtà è un lavoro un po' diverso, cioè noi facciamo un lavoro sostanzialmente curatoriale, per ah. cui ehm, in realtà la cosa interessante sarebbe, è il fatto che siano degli itinerari consigliati dai musei, degli itinerari che il museo invita a fare per una certa ragione, per cui in realtà c'è questa dimensione curatoriale che è molto interessante. Perché tu come amante della natura o un po' pubblico colto o comunque interessato a, a sfruttare anche magari perché andare a volte in, in alcuni musei con dei bambini piccoli è un casino, mentre invece fuori è più facile. Quindi è come se ti desse un'alternativa rispetto ai tuoi itinerari eh, museali oppure se sei una persona amante della montagna, amante della, della cultura, comunque hai una sensibilità per andare a cercartelo quel luogo. Oppure se arrivi davanti al museo, il museo è pieno e ti dice dove puoi andare. Però il fatto che te lo dica il museo e che ti consigli come farlo è in effetti uh, un punto di forza, perché altrimenti uno rischia di... Cioè non è la stessa cosa se sono tutti gli itinerari e tutti i dati, perché diventa molto piatto e diventa sostanzialmente eh, invisibile. Non so, secondo me potrebbe essere comunque una... Poi anche lì, poi in modo piatto mettere tutti gli oggetti della collezione anche sulla mappa, quindi puoi visualizzarli. Però anche lì è quando il museo ti dice, guarda, e ti segnala una cosa come importante che diventa di valore perché è come se ti facesse una playlist sì che se vuoi per il museo della Val Verzasca è già così perché comunque hanno già fatto questa scelta degli itinerari che ti presentano che ti mandano all'esterno a vedere quindi e, e gli altri sostanzialmente potrebbero un po' prendere spunto da questo cioè la... una pratica condivisa comunque anche dai musei poi esistono comunque ma secondo me esistono poi alla fine questi, questi itinerari segnalati, non è che siano così remoti, anche quello che diceva uh, giustamente um, uh, che diceva uh, Irene con anche gli itinerari del Deco, del Liberty a Milano, del Cimitero Monumentale, quindi esistono già queste, queste risorse, però non le trovi soltanto se vai dall'ente che le promuove. Quindi l'accesso è sempre attraverso il sito dell'ente, attraverso la conoscenza dell'ente, mentre invece sarebbe interessante avere un accesso eh, più aperto, per cui non è che devi conoscere ogni singolo ente e allora ti, ti raccomanda i suoi, ma ti basta conoscere, avere questo accesso a questa mappa che vedi tutti gli itinerari consigliati da, dal mondo dei musei. Sì, secondo me questo ha senso. E anche il web tool, cioè sì, perché alla fine poi diventa una visualizzazione quella che fai, cioè, non so, non mi viene in mente, se tu clicchi su un museo ti può vedere, a partire da, dal museo quali itinerari si possono fare, però per, il, per esempio per il museo della Leventina tu devi crearli un po' da zero, cioè non essendoci qui Diana Tecconi che ti dice, ah oh, dai, Devi crearli un po' da zero uno perché non sai i dati da, da che provenienza arrivano, cioè, quindi da che comune arrivano. Adesso bisognerebbe fare una, una selezione dei dati. E poi cioè, devi proprio pensare all'itinerario, cioè creare, cioè, immaginare tu l'itinerario che potresti proporre. Stai leggendo quello che... Sto guardando su uh, uh, Giovanni che ha mandato... Ah, aspetta, io quello di Giovanni non l'ho ancora aperto, aspetta un secondo. Ok. Beh, 
Beh, perché alla fine questo permetterebbe di allargare la loro offerta culturale, cioè dei musei, cioè è una cosa che secondo me farebbe molto comodo anche a loro, cioè per, per esempio, eh, ok, usciamo dai musei e anche collegare il... il perché piuttosto che crearti un diario dello storytelling di come è stata la tua esperienza eh, o, al, um, in quell'itinerario, che secondo me non è molto usato, cioè non è una cosa che veramente funziona, cioè condividi la tua storia, al massimo puoi condividere una foto. Ha senso, come dicevi tu, inserire l'elemento della sicurezza. Quello è insomma incredibile, cosa dice eh, tutti, no, cioè, poi... cosa me ne frega? Ma più che altro cosa me ne frega a me della tua storia, cosa me ne frega a me della tua esperienza? Sì. Non lo so quanto sono effettivamente usati questi diari. Io poi non sono la persona più adatta, però non so se li userei. Cioè non mi faccio io un itinerario, un diario di bordo dell'itinerario che ho percorso. Più che altro ti dico, attenzione, perché lungo questo itinerario non ci sono bagni, oppure quelli che ci sono non, non sono puliti, per esempio. Cioè... Eh, questo, questa è una segnalazione che si potrebbe fare e che comunque eh, è utile anche agli altri. Credo che la parte sulla sicurezza può essere pertinente in questo periodo. Poi decidi se rimuoverla a un certo punto, no, magari la parte sulla sicurezza non è più bisogno. Mm. Tu hai ricevuto il link per editare il, il documento? Per editare le, le slide? Sì, stavo, sì, sì, infatti stavo scrivendo sopra lì, cioè per cercare di mettere io e Giulia appunti che, che avevo un attimino in mente. Sì, però... Sì, però era poi in generale. Eh. Non so se l'hai visto. Sì, sì, lo vedo. È scritto sbagliato extra moenia. Manca la X. Io non, non posso editarlo. Non ho il... Proviamo. Ma mi avevano messo come Yolanda pensa. Aspetta che aggiungo io. Eh, no, chi è che puoi editarlo? Condivido, lo condivido io. Ma lei, che poi è una... Yolanda, ma tu sei come Yolanda pensa Supsi o Yolanda pensa Yolanda che ce lo pensa punto i? Adesso ho messo io pensa che ho ce la gmail punto com, è meglio perché. E io quello non ce l'ho, cioè ho tutte le cose tra le... Vabbè, metto... ti metto tutti. Yolanda pensa e io, e pen e io pensa che ho c'ho la gmail.com perché sono entrata con quell'account, forse è meglio. Ok. Io ho la gmail.com. Sì, ma poi mettiamo anche Giovanni, aspetta che lo inserisco, e Vanessa. Ma, ma dove, scusami, fai... No, perché è sulle, sulle, sul PowerPoint condiviso, dici? No, quello non c'è problema, siamo già condivisi. Ah, vedi che mi ha messo io uh, pensato allora, aspetta che... Sì, ma perché non eri editor? In effetti, non mi... io potevo scrivere, ma tu non, non so se... Hai, hai usato Open Bla Bla? Occhio che sei sul... Marta, sei sullo Slack sbagliato. Invece sei in note. Eh, con... Sono sullo Slack sbagliato. Sei sullo Slack open bla bla. Allora, torniamo qua, quindi. Non so. 
Io potrei muovere io mi sto con site metterei sviluppatore metto e che altro ah no scusami no <ride> penso sì sì eh, program Software developer. Software developer. Cultural developer. Ah, software. Programmatore si dice software developer. Non credo programma. Vabbè, metti... Sì, mi piace, ma software developer. Ma io parlerei solo di mosaic, facciamo così, facciamo una più semplice, perché under, um, under outdoors. E mettiamo uh, suggesting possible itineraries. Sì, no, metterei, uh, io metterei museum creators. Okay. Allora, allora, ideas on how to proceed. Uh, Anche Valerio. Valerio, com'è che si chiama di cognome? Bod, non lo so. Vediamo forse nella mail. Bozzolan. Bozzolan. Bozzolan, quello qui. Sto cambiando il mio nome. Ok, based on open data. Per una volta il data non con data. Quindi una web tool data not data e license waste vision highlighting generated selected possiamo mettere questo metterei gold questa è stata sul museum website museum website you upload data from the museum <ride> oh, mi sono iscritta anche a un corso di inglese in, questa, in questo lockdown eh, che ho appena cominciato ma mi sono iscritta anche a quello museum collections <ride> on uh, uploading this data and on no, va bene così Osmo no, non metterei tanto i dati ma mi domando se non si può scusami l'obiettivo per questa cosa è 
Du bist in der Demo. Ma scusami, ma siamo sicuri che non esista già questo, questo tool? Perché è un'esperienza sempre che poi di solito dai... No, scusa. Ah, no, perché... Ecco perché io mi chiedevo se eh, Ticino Turismo non aveva fatto qualcosa di simile, perché l'unico che potrebbe averlo fatto è Ticino Turismo. Però i tutti di Ticino Turismo non sono aperti. Utilizzano le mappe di OpenStreetMap, però non, non, non sono aperti. Loro ti danno informazioni, cioè sulla Valpiora, eh, suggeriva Vanessa, che ti danno delle informazioni. Però non è che... Cioè, che visualizzano cioè, il Ticino, arrivano il Ticino, gli itinerari collegati ai musei. No, so, no, c'è solo il percorso sulla cartina con alcune cose importanti, ma esatto. non c'è così tanta informazione. Però non so se su quelle cartine lì le dobbiamo rifare su OpenStreetMap o le possiamo modificare. Aspetta, aspetta che guardo il, il link. Che... Mi piace anche il fatto di avere, oltre l'itinerario, la possibilità di avere come sotto delle gallerie con dove tu puoi entrare e vedere più in dettaglio l'oggetto, no? Perché voglio dire, sì, c'è la foto, però non è solo la foto del posto, come puoi anche metterla in Google alla fine così, ma c'è la storia dietro... Eh, se magari lo studio fatto da quello o se vuoi saperne di più puoi andare eh, so, direttamente al museo o, o da altre parti cioè, ci sono altre informazioni quindi mi piaceva la possibilità di avere la scheda funziona bene se, anche se hai dell'audio per esempio no? sì. Sì. tu riesci a creare testi, descrittivi immagini dove ci sono immagini audio dove ci sono immagini cioè dove ci sono degli audio mm. Mm -hmm. sì per esempio la mappa di, del sentiero delle leggende è una mappa grafica cioè quindi i test cioè, non so io per esempio quello che posso fare è recuperare il, il dato geografico di ogni stazione dove all'interno di ogni stazione abbiamo Uh, dei testi specifici tra l'altro in quattro lingue e, uh, e gli audio gli audio forse sono solo in italiano e tedesco adesso... ma c'è un sito, una cosa dove si può vedere questa mappa della leggenda? sì, sul sito ah, aspetta che lo condivido perché il sito tra l'altro adesso lo stanno, lo stanno rifacendo e mi hanno dato gli accessi al, al sito nuovo certo, che aspetta che te lo Ah, aspetta che l'avevo messo da... l'avevo messo su Slack aspetta un secondo allora, ah questa qua è la, la presentazione ho aperto ok Ma non ho capito, l'erboretum ha come logo, <ride> ha come logo una, una foglia di marina. <ride> Chi? Che bello, Uno la canna passativa. Ha linkato uh, eh, Arnold Arboretum, che è un progetto ad Arnold. Sì. Che... Di Gerardi sono segnalati con delle foglie di marijuana. <ride> Grandi! <ride> Vabbè, più, più naturalisti di così. Vabbè. Allora, aspetta che ti, ti, ti condivido il link. Non so quanto tempo... Non c'è con... Devo metterlo in un, in un posto più visibile perché non... Allora... Va bene. È una foglia d'acero. Ecco, <ride> vedi. Ecco che vedi Maria dappertutto. Eh? Sì, a naso si fa... Io l'ho trovata qua, qua camminando. Una pianta enorme. 
Sì. 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 Allora, scusate, gli itinerari culturali del Consiglio d'Europa, tipo il cammino di Santiago di Compostela, la rotta dei vichinghi, cioè tutte queste robe qua, saranno mappati in modo facile da trovare? Perché, allora, una cosa Cultural che mi viene in mente... Si chiamano cultural routes eh, in, eh, eh, in Europa. Aspetta che... Però quello che mi domando è che, allora, nel momento in cui tu guardi soltanto le cultural routes che sono certificate europee, ne avrai una cinquantina, cioè non sono molte comunque, sono, è come i siti patrimonio dell'UNESCO, d'accordo, ti segnalano i siti patrimonio dell'UNESCO, li puoi trovare tutti insieme, però non è che ti dà un panorama culturale, perché adesso non è che uno va solo a vedere quelli. Mm. Però la, a me sembrava interessante il fatto che l'itinerario culturale o naturalistico sia comunque suggerito da un, un museo perché è un itinerario uh, curato. Era quello che stavo parlando um, prima di questo con... Oh, questo visualization data. Aspetta, producing a demo. Sì, ma quindi la long term vision è anche estendere l'offerta culturale dei musei? Cioè, perché quello che... No, magari è collegare, mh, è collegare le collezioni al, al territorio. Sì, però in una visione a lungo termine, cioè, si vuole proporre un'offerta culturale nuova, cioè, sul piano turistico culturale. Magari estendere il museo eh, al di me... fuori del, del museo. Comunque collegare le collezioni all'esterno, cioè collegare le collezioni al territorio ed estendere l'esperienza uh, outdoors, mi sembra, entrambi sono sì, sì, sì. punti validi. Anche dare un modo per dare visibilità al museo, okay. al di fuori del museo. Eh, perché appunto il rimando è dall'esterno verso l'interno, che è molto più visitato l'esterno che l'interno, perché in realtà ne beneficia il museo. Però il museo, ha, lui, loro dicono che non, non viene vista la loro ricerca, quello che loro fanno sul territorio è invisibile. Invece sono come delle tracce, no? Delle tracce del museo lasciate nel territorio. Beh, in realtà è viceversa, perché il museo le, le ha portate via dal territorio, cioè di solito. <ride> ok, what is needed? Chi è che fa la presentazione? La facciamo fare a, a Giovanni Profeta, la faccio io. Potrebbe anche un altro Sentire come... Non potete ah, fare in due? Ah sì, che così lui parla. Così più la più parte più. teorica una, lei in blu invece fa la parte un po' più pratica. Aspetta, visto che tra un quarto... Molto bella. Bella. Vanessa, era molto bella la presentazione che hai fatto. Oddio, sono quasi le due e mezza. Era molto bella eh. la presentazione che hai fatto della Valpinora. Si sta a vedere le immagini, cioè è veramente molto bello. In effetti uno capiva anche la qualità poi della... Da, che mi è piaciuta. Io mi sposto in casa, mi disconnetto un attimo da qui, vedo se regge la connessione mentre uscito le scale, ma nel caso di tre minuti e sono riconnessa. Come è complicata questa cosa dello online? Eh? Vabbè. Come l'oggetto rosso e oggetto verde. No, abbiamo finito con l'oggetto rosso e oggetto verde, tranquilla. Non mi dica che. <ride> Io li avevo scelti, cioè non avevo capito subito perché il servizio era così. Eh, non avevo subito capito la commissione al semaforo. Sì, no? Guardate cosa ho scelto come oggetto verde. <ride> e anch'io c'avevo lo spazzino <ride> allora quindi qua dovrei essere dovrei avere accesso eh, 
Eh, ma ne chiedeva? Oddio, un sacchetto di zucchine. Ma io non ho messo pure la catonna nel legnoso. Non si vede la verzasca. Che mi ha messo questa pianta? Ho una new entry in casa. Vanessa, eh, chiedeva a Giovanni di completare un attimo le schede, quindi Vanessa allora, ha messo Giovanni è un insegnante, amante dell'arte, dell invece Vanessa è un nature lover di lavoro, che cosa fa? Eh, faccio la grafica, un lavoro qualunque, insomma. quindi un lavoro creativo? Graphic design. Sì. Ok, eh, Fanticino. Poi come viaggia? Viaggio a, a piedi o con mezzi pubblici? Okay. O con la bici? Posso anche viaggiare in bici? I tuoi bisogni? Uh, allora, facilities for children, the hunting street by social activity. Tu cosa vuoi? Uh, clean environment? Sì, lo voglio pulito. Protected and clean environment. Uh, non voglio molto le strade battute, voglio le cose tradizionali, autoctone, magari voglio sapere pure delle informazioni più tipiche. Magari punti panoramici anche, la lunghezza dei percorsi così me li posso studiare meglio. diciamo informazioni tecniche sui percorsi il dislivello che so okay. va bene poi la nostra Marta che lavoro fa? che è una mamma la eh, mamma fa la casalinga no? Ma sì, no, no in che, in che lavora in ufficio in lavora in ufficio Mettere un hysterical employee, <ride> a stress employee, è una tipica madre, è una piegata isterica. Avete proprio una visione voi? Uh, come si dice impiegata? Okay. Employee. Employee. Sì. Secretary. <ride> no, non è proprio impiegata. <ride> Aspetta, mi sentite adesso? Uh, allora, è, è piegata, vediamo. Uh. Ah, ok, metto l'employee. Poi, Poi, allora, aspetta che guardo anch'io. io. Allora, travel with the children. Ok. Counter, ok. Sì. 
Needs. Uh, no, metto... Va bene, dai. Uh, un po' lungo qua il, il needs della... Vabbè, va bene. Ok. Io trovavo oh. quello che... No, riesco a capire. No, Ma mettiamo... Voi... Eh... Aspetta che non lo vedo. Ma metto, mettiamolo che per me è importante la questione sicurezza. Fa, vabbè, facilities for children. Security. Safety. Mm. Security è... Safety, sì, sì. Dopo un violet case. Eh, Security è criminalità. Cioè. Eh, va bene. E altri bisogni? Un parcheggio? Needs? Scusa, ho sbagliato. Uh, safety, facility per children. Safety, ho sbagliato. Yeah. Safety. Uh, uh, Parking uh, sites? Ok. O camping, se proprio... Ok. Va bene. Ok, eh, bisogna fotografare questa cosa, sono le 2.20, sta per iniziare. Com'è che è il programma del pomeriggio? Non detto general, vediamo cosa dicono. Posso mettere che tipo che vengo dalla Germania? Perché quelli là sono più... Esotici. No, no, no perché non di più di noi. Grazie, no. cielo, ti lavi. Come? La tua igiene personale è... Ci sono il classico turista naturalista tedesco che non si lava. <ride> sì, ma sono... <ride> Beh, comunque sono molto esigenti, eh. vengono, vengono in tanti dalla Germania per la natura qua. Sì, è vero. Sì, è una buona idea. Però abbiamo qualcuno dal Ticino, sì, tanto c'è Giovanni dal Ticino, per cui va bene. Sì. Puoi mettere Andrea <ride> come nome? Andrea. <ride> Ulrike. <ride> Ursula. No, qua dei, dei no. Diciamo anche, anche ecco più qua. lunghi. Punto non sono più dei litri, c'è così differenti. Addirittura ah, non flipp. Sì. Vabbè, posso mettere dire? due o tre giorni. Sì, secondo me sì. Allora, bisogna fare lo screenshot e aggiungerlo alle slide. Sì. Eh, come sono le slide? Abbiamo finito. Aspetta che non le ho. Addressing to the target, ok? Goals during... Ecco, uh, the demo, the pool, starting the... Va bene, eh, Giovanni, se io faccio... Eh, presento ancora il, il pitch e, sì, e sì, magari no? senti tu sulla, sul tool. Va bene. Dobbiamo fare in tre. Penso che ci saranno... Vai, vai, vai. Abbiamo sempre due minuti come prima, perché i due minuti possono velocissimi. Non lo so. Vai, portate 30, all glam teams must provide a description of the project. Ok, adesso vorrei 5 minuti. Finito. Secondo me abbiamo già finito. E piuttosto possiamo dare accesso... Il, il link che tu hai creato è aperto per la visualizzazione. Sì, sì, lo possiamo fare. vedere tutti, sì. Allora, aggiungo quel link alla nostra scheda. Così mettiamo le nostre risorse tutte insieme nella scheda che hanno creato loro. Ok. okay. Questo qua è al contrario alla domanda. Aspetta. Completa la scheda? La... Slack channel no, la Slack channel Slack channel l'ho appena messo io non è giusto Marta devi mettere l'ho copiato ah ok scusami non mi sembra che sia ah l'hai copiato da lì invece qua l'hanno scritto diverso ok io ho copiato proprio il link va bene eh, dal, dal nostro ecco perché forse tu prima mi hai detto forse basta sempre Forse basta semplicemente. More stuff. I just, this is the stuff I just put in for now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
So uh, I guess I'll just kind of go from here. Mm -hmm. What well, would be maybe interesting, I don't know if Tableau does this because like animation and video is still a whole nother thing, but um, did you see the, the video that Davide made that, he, that was the Dropbox link? Uh, not yet. I haven't... Wait, uh, uh, I'll find it again. Um, I'll just repost it in the chat. I'm gonna uh, check. I'll do it. I already have the... I, I have the link in the chat. Ah, okay. yeah, I post it now. Thanks. All right, I'll have a look at it. What I like about this video that David made is like you see the changes over time, how the map populates. Yeah. And these kind of time visualizations I think are very cool because like you could either do it that the map kind of gets more dense, that like every exhibition kind of pops up and stays, or it pops up and then the next year it goes away, or maybe so these kind of things. And then you can see where it shifts that maybe in the 1950s, we had exhibitions that were very much in one place, and then it got more international or something, you know? Um, yeah. These kind of things. Um, but uh, I don't know if Tableau does this kind of thing or if it needs another tool, but like, I think it could be an, an interesting direction. Uh, oh, I'll try to look it up if it... Ah, I think it does. Mm, nice. Uh, hold on. Uh, it says that we need to make a dashboard. And then we, I think we need to put in like individually uh, frames. So it's like, like one year by year. So yeah. it, will, it will kind of compile all the years and then we can get this video out. Oh, that seems nice. Yeah, I'll try working on this. Let's cool. see what I can get. Um, yep. Tell me the name of your friend again. And it was Chi. Chi. Chi Hao. Uh, could you put it in the chat so that I spell it correctly? I'm just I'm uh, not sure. Martin as a as a team member in the. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll just put in his whole name just in case. Yeah. Sure. Is he still working on this project? Uh, I think he went to get dinner because it's it's, it's uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah it's, it's late here. <laughs> All right. So wait, where are you connecting from, uh, Ishan? Um, 
I'm all the I'm connecting all the way from Malaysia. Oh wow! Yeah, uh, it's it's interesting because I I just kind of stumbled upon this event just uh just randomly, and I I kind of wanted to go at least attend a hackathon because oh. uh next year I'll be applying for universities and I. Because I want to apply for a computer science degree, so I thought it might be useful for me to at least get some experience in. And I thought maybe you know it, it made sense. A hackathon would make sense. Uh, the thing is, with the with the pandemic, it made it difficult for in real life hackathons. But luckily, this came out of it, so I'm I'm quite happy that you know although what happened, I mean although the pandemic did its damage, but there's some good things like this is. One of the examples of the good thing. No, that's what I also thought. That like, uh, I also had another workshop yesterday for another thing, and like usually we would have all traveled, and like you have to take the train, you have to take two days off from work, you have to organize, and uh, and I thought both is nice. Like we shouldn't do like just the one or the other, but if we can meet like once a year kind of things but meet more frequently in settings like this uh it's it's so valuable yeah i mean i'm i'm learning a lot just 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 in the last few hours i've learned quite a bit <laughs> well, uh, yeah it's from going kind of like from zero to like a little bit above zero <laughs> so Um, do you think that the, um, the Tableau allows um, you to publish a um, inter, um, inter interactive uh, um, version of the visualization on the on the web? Uh, you mean something like an animation, or maybe something like more um, a web page where people can filter data and like interact? Uh, do you with think the, that the, um, the, the Tableau allows? Um, you to publish I think I a, saw something like that. Uh, maybe it's a more something like more um, a paid uh, intera interactive uh, 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 version uh, of the visualization on the on the web. Mm, uh, you mean something like an I'll, animation? I'll, I'll kind of look into it. Maybe like something like more um, a web page where people can filter data and yeah, no, of course, like, no, that would be the nicest thing. Like um, to really have a space where the users can interact with the data and they set their own filters. Like that. Uh, maybe it's a more, yeah, like, uh, more uh, a paid yeah. uh, Ishan, do you have um, uh, um, uh, um, uh, uh, a guys on the, on the web experience mm. with, uh, with uh, JavaScript or JavaScript framework? Maybe like called, something like a library more, um, called uh, a web page um, where people can treat JSON data and yeah, no, uh, like no, that would be the main thing. I really have a little base where the users can interact with the data and they can bring in filters. Only ever maybe it's a more a paid Ishan, do you have um, 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 I've never tried JavaScript before. 
experience with the yeah. uh, JavaScript or uh, 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 JavaScript uh, framework, maybe uh, like a library uh, called the uh, web page, and uh, it into the can create uh, some of the data. And you can uh, okay, uh, okay, uh, 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 interact with the user. Oh, that's what I mean. Do you have an experience with the JavaScript or JavaScript framework? Maybe like something like a library called the web page, and it into the can create some of the data. And I don't know how you guys want to proceed with uh, what we are planning to do now. Maybe it would be if, uh, if we split up in groups and take uh, in the special uh, one data set after another. So uh, the data set of the archivists and the ICL data sets um, and, and like Creative. I don't know how you guys want to proceed with uh, the use what we are planning to or do which now. You Maybe think that, that would be yeah, could make uh, sense to you. We split up in this uh, and for the inventory. Uh, we in want to have established uh, one where data sets and then uh, after another. So uh, see where the are the overlaps, the archivists, and them. the ICL data set. You think um, and, and <laughs> like. Creative. I don't know how you guys want to proceed yeah, with uh, the use what we are planning to or do which now. you think Maybe that would be yeah, could make sense to you to split up in this uh, and for the inventory. Uh, we in want to have established uh, one where data and sets then after um, another. So uh, see where uh, are the old have you already created the IT data sets or do you have like like. Know, and I don't know how you guys want to work yeah, with uh, the use what we are planning to, which you think that would be yeah, could make sense to you. I wonder how uh, uh, which data sets you want to have to choose them now. Uh, yeah, I think it would be good where you can uh, choose them now so we can start uh, uh, the I2 uh, uh, data working on them. Or do you have a like. Um, I don't know how many ones you want to work the, with. Uh, the use, what you uh, is it an overview? That would be yes. a good sense to you. Uh, uh, I wonder if I think I saw an overview. Uh, which data is. To, um, to look into the, um, <laughs> the old uh, lamp inventory? Is it the, um, to get a overview? Uh, uh, I wonder if I think I saw an overview. Uh, the one you posted. I add uh, the... So. 
to um, to look into the, um, like, like, the old uh, glam inventory. Is it to the together the uh, 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 when we are not talking then it will be a greater sound maybe so uh, yeah, Kirsten, I, was go, uh, again. I was wondering if there were a data set on Thomas Mann the writer Thomas Mann have you seen that? When we are not talking, then it, I think that would be interesting, but I don't know exactly how to handle nope, with it. I haven't seen. Okay. Because I went to the. Um, uh, yeah, Kirsten, I, was go if, again. I was wondering if there were a data set on Thomas Mann, the writer Thomas Mann. I will have you seen that? send you a link uh, when I'm not talking. Then it, I think that would be interesting, but I don't know exactly how to handle nope, with it. I haven't set. seen. Okay. Because I went to the. Um, uh, yeah, Kirsten, I, was go, uh, again. I was wondering if there were a data set on. Thomas Mann, the writer Thomas Mann. I will have you seen that? send you a link uh, when I'm not talking. Then it, I think that would be interesting, but I don't know exactly how to handle nope, with it. I haven't seen. Uh, institutional approach that we have. Uh, Daniel, can I ask you a question? Mm, sure. Do you hear me? Um, uh, you're saying institutional approach. Did you originally, um, uh, had you originally decided to only go for specific institutions? Uh, institutional approach that we have. Yes, it's, it's our data we have, it's um, this ISIL uh, data we have from the National Library. Uh, Daniel, can I ask it's you a question? What about does ISIL mean? Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't um, know the, the uh, You're saying institutional ISIL. approach. Yeah, Did you originally, um, standard uh, had you originally for decided system. to only go Something for like specific yeah. institutions? And it's uh, institutional approach. It's a persistent have. identifier yes, it's, for it's libraries around the world. Yeah. It's, um, and I guess they it's have ISIL used this earlier data we have from the National Library. Daniel, can I ask you know, the inter-librarian loan system, sure. I, I, I don't know so uh, the, the uh, every library institutional was, approach. Uh, I Did think you know, originally um, um, I feel not uh, under uh, and had today.
Yeah. And they are kind of, sometimes they are overlapping, sometimes they are not overlapping because they are archives who haven't an ICL number and so they are not in our inventory yet. I see. So, uh, and so, I wonder if it should, if it could be, uh, because you're, you're suggesting we're splitting into groups, right? Yeah, I thought so. so. On different yeah. parts. I think and it could be a good idea if, uh, if, if Christian and I join uh, different groups so that we learn from what you are, you know the archives so better than we do, so that we can yet. sort of see what you are doing and, and uh, so. help on the way. Do you think that's I a good idea, or should, do you want us to be a separate be, uh, Because you're, well, you're suggesting uh, we're splitting into groups, okay. right? Um, Christine, yeah, I thought so. Uh, brought in this uh, Thomas I think it could be a good idea if, uh, if Christine and I join uh, different and, uh, groups so I thought that we learn from the also be a good idea. You know the archives so better than not, we do, I, I really so that we can sort of see what you're doing and, and uh, so help on the way. I think that's a good idea. Or do you want us to be a separate group? Because you're suggesting we're... You know, all um, the uh, manuscripts yeah, and letters so, uh, brought in by Thomas Mann. I think it could be a good idea if, uh, uh, if it could be a good idea to also, uh, I thought maybe it could also be a good idea to also in such a detail. I don't know what it goes when they talk about and help on the way. Do you think that's a good idea? Yeah, I thought so. I think it could be a good idea if we learn from the way. Do you know the archives better than we do? Does anybody know the English word for that one? You know, I think it's um, archives. Yeah, and yeah, and so, uh, so, uh, is it archives? Yeah, 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 you know, to specify the uh, manuscripts yeah, and properties that are used in the original archive, we can express them as well as the two old. So we have like a good one that we can use to offer such a detail. Okay, so that's not what it goes in. So maybe we could come from the institutional side and you guys come from the archival side. Maybe we could just say that. Das, also händisch einfügen, wenn das automatisch geht, ist ja vergebene mhm. Arbeit dann, oder? Äh, ja. <lacht> ja, also ähm, die Frage ist halt dann, ähm, was wir automatisieren können und äh, was nicht und so. Und es hängt halt dann wahrscheinlich von äh, Kennys Arbeit ähm, ja. ab, oder? Also wenn er halt alles automatisieren kann, kann er halt dann schon alle Daten halt dann irgendwie so über äh, irgendeine API halt dann holen, also zum Beispiel Koordinaten ja. und äh, irgendeine Link kann er halt dann sicher holen oder so und dann dann ist es ja super, dann ist er, <lacht> dann dann muss man nur halt dann auf die Karte übertragen oder so. Ja. Dann müssen wir halt dann wirklich nicht so viel mehr machen, aber wenn es nicht geht, ja. dann, dann müssen wir halt davor also ja, zuerst halt dann nur manuell machen und dann müssen wir halt dann manuell irgendeine Daten erstellen. Oder so. Okay, also dann Excel-Tabelle ausfüllen ist immer noch sinnvoll. Zwischenzeitlich, <lacht> bis okay. Kenny irgendwas sagt, okay, wir können das automatisieren, wenn dann brauchen wir nicht mehr, aber wenn er sagt, okay, wir können dann doch nicht, dann <lacht> ja. Okay, also dann, dann füllen wir deine Excel-Tabelle aus, oder? Dann, die du vorgeschlagen okay. hast. Okay, also aber gibt es äh, gibt's noch keine weiteren Vorschläge oder so? Was in die Tabelle kommt? Ja, ähm, äh, zum Beispiel ja, oder hat er eben auch so eine Tabelle zu machen oder so? Gibt es noch weitere Ideen oder so? Also für außer Excel-Tabelle, weil man die am leichtesten importieren kann, okay. weiß ich leider nicht. Ähm, welche Möglichkeiten es gibt, eben außer wir bekommen das, was du vorgeschlagen hast, wo wir direkt reinschreiben können. Das wäre natürlich die idealste Form, was du Oleg gefragt hast. Aha, ja, also mit Omega und so. Ja. Okay, also ja, er hat halt schon so geschrieben, also da müssen wir halt irgendwie so äh, eigenes Server haben und selber installieren. 
Ich könnte machen, aber Server benutze ich halt meinen eigenen Server. Aha. Und äh, das ist dann halt dann nicht wirklich so ideal, dass man halt dann, ja. weil ich würde auch nicht ewig ja, ja, begleiten und so darum halt dann. Ja. Okay, ja. ich habe keinen Zugriff von hier auf, auf, auf den Server. Ähm, das ist okay. also nicht möglich. Also dann fällt das quasi wie weg. Aber was ist das Server? Ja, genau. Also wenn, wenn, wenn du halt dann so einen Institutserver hast, ja. wo du halt alle, alle Softwares installieren kannst, ja. dann kannst du halt dann dort alles installieren und äh, dann, dann bleibt es halt dann länger auf deinem ja. Institutserver und dann kannst du halt länger behalten oder so. Wäre halt dann meine Möglichkeit, ja. Bei uns ist, muss das die IT machen, der ist der Administrator und der ist nicht dabei, der ist hm. gerade. Deswegen Ach so, okay. kann, ich das, kann ich das leider nicht machen. Ja. Okay. Da kann man dann langfristig dann eventuell überlegen. Also, mhm. aber du, ihr, ihr müsst ja sowieso das mal überlegen, ob ihr das tatsächlich machen wollt oder nicht. Ja. Und wenn es dann doch nicht so sinnvoll ist, dann macht sie keinen Sinn. Also, ja. so, ja. ähm, insofern dann, ja. Dann okay. man halt dann nicht, oder? Okay. Mhm. Also, ähm, aber damit wir ein bisschen spielen können, wäre es vielleicht schon gut, wenn wir per Hand mal ein paar Daten eingeben, oder? Äh, In deine Excel-Tabelle. Ja, ja, also, ja, also irgendwas, um irgendwas zu machen, ist hat dann sicher gut, ja. Ja. <lacht> ja. ja. Oder habt ihr, wollt ihr denn mit den, mit den ähm, Ansichtskarten lieber weiterfahren? Ähm, was wäre dort die Idee? Auch da wäre es die Möglichkeit, dass wir ähm, die Geo referenzieren, aber da müssen wir die Orte quasi wie noch eingrenzen, weil es eben Pässe sind, die dort angegeben sind. Und da müsste man wie genauer dann suchen, wo auf einer Karte, wo genau das sein könnte. Also sprich beispielsweise was wie Stoppo, ähm, die Sachen anschauen und dort dann die, die, die Koordinaten dann ähm, auch in der Excel-Tabelle dann eingeben. Okay. Ja. Ja, komm, machen. Zuerst, weil dann, dann habt ihr halt dann mindestens ähm, so eine Koordinatendaten. Ja. ja. Mindestens, dann, dann könnt ihr später halt irgendwas verwenden oder so, oder? Ja. Hm. ja. Aber wie gesagt, ich bin immer noch nicht ganz, ähm, mir ist immer noch nicht ganz klar, ob jetzt diese Excel-Tabelle gut ist oder nicht? Aha. Äh, die Excel-Tabelle ist dann nur halt, also du kannst dann später CSV-Daten halt dann daraus ja. ziehen. Ähm, aber wenn du zum Beispiel so mit, äh, mit Leaflet arbeiten möchtest, also äh, die, die Karten, die ich halt dann ja. gezeigt habe, dann, dann musst du halt eben CSV, also von CSV V-Daten zu GeoJSON-Daten umformatieren. Okay. Und dann okay. geht es dann. Okay, gut. Also, ich überlasse es euch, was ihr machen möchtet. Das ist euer, <lacht> euer, euer okay. Karton. <lacht> okay, okay. Also, das sind die, möglich die beiden Möglichkeiten, die jetzt da sind. Entweder ähm, erfassen wir jetzt analog die, die Daten mhm. der einzelnen Ortschaften und verlinken vielleicht mit wirklich Histab den Link, mhm. damit wir die haben. Oder wir machen ähm, Schnitzeljagd äh, in, in den Zustopokarten und versuchen ähm, mhm. Pässe beispielsweise zu identifizieren, wo, wo die sind und die genaue Lage herauszufinden. Mhm. Wie würdest du denn vorgehen bei den beiden? Weil ich kann mir das noch gerade nicht so vorstellen. Also ich äh, würde jetzt, also bei den, bei den Ansichtskarten würden wir die identische äh, Excel-Tabelle nehmen aus meiner Sicht. Aber wir müssten auf Swiss Topo bei den historischen Karten gehen, also dort, wo der Link jetzt gerade war. Mhm. Ähm, und beispielsweise Gotthard eingeben mhm. und auf die ähm, Satellitenansicht gehen. Und 
quasi den Gotthard abfahren und schauen, wo dieses Bild gemacht wurde und dann dort einen Link setzen in der Karte mit, dem, mit der Signatur und der Beschreibung. Mhm. Ja. We, were, we had like in terms of a percentual uh, uh, infections, we were ahead of, at the beginning we were just right behind Italy and then we were just right behind Spain after Spain had overtaken Italy. Right. But now we really, it's under control for now. And it's, the numbers have gone down, so we're kind of relaxed about it. But we don't know for how long it will last. Yeah. yeah. No idea. Yeah. But people, our kids are back in school. and. Uh, oh, your kids are in school, physically in school. Physically in school. And we will be back at work now again, like we're back at work. Oh, because my son's still not in school. My yeah. son's still. Yeah, but you, we had we went into that lockdown. The school lockdown was mid March. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yours came maybe a bit later. I don't know. Uh, no, no, mid March, and he won't go back to school until September. Thirteenth of March. And in September, yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't know. In September, I don't know what school, what kind of school he's going to go back to. Mm -hmm. Is it going to be a hybrid? you know, alternate days, morning, afternoon, and then half of it's going to be online at home, half of it, or maybe two days a week at school. We, I, we have no idea. Mm -hmm. All of it at home, all of it at school, we don't know. We're still, we don't know. So my son's loving it. He's not in school. He hates school. So he likes the pandemic because he hangs out on his, with his friends online playing video games. Loves it. I, mean, Guys, like, I could not find a Laval photos. I don't know if no? maybe. Well, what's a good search term? It's a, a historical theater there, Tammy. Uh, there's not uh, a lot. There's not. If they're not nothing historical. You have made all these off. No, but Laval. let's focus on, on 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 current current um, stuff and Zurich. On uh, the historical. Historical so, nineteen. 30s what's to the, 19, what, Tammy, what's the name of a theater there? Maison des Arts Laval. Okay, let's try that. Yeah, I don't know if that's going to work. Um. So who is doing what now on the project? I'm just looking for pictures right now. You guys are 10. Through the uh, slides, I'm just doing some setup. So, mm -hmm. have you seen the Wikidata query to to get that the data from Zurich? Um, okay, I'm going to look at it now. So the performing arts productions produced by Schauspielhaus Zürich. Zürich yeah. 20. Then you get the, the list of the productions and from there you can go further. Okay, so we have data first performance. Do we have individual performances? Uh, no, it's always the production with the information right. about uh, the cost. We do have a uh, date of first performance. Yeah. We do have a uh, production company. Yeah. Usually we did not, because we don't really have the information about individual performances. I think it did just one example for a premiere that is completely modeled as a performance, but it doesn't give you any additional information because it's the same, yeah. the same data. And the date of first performance, uh, I'm looking at the format for the search. Yeah. So is that um, ISO 8601? Hmm. Uh, you have to see what you get out of uh, yeah. Wikidata. Yeah. I, it, it should be, uh, uh, it just also has an indication about uh, the crime, about, uh, what do you call it, uh, exactitude. Uh, Precision. But I think, yeah, that's this the precision. Yeah, I think it's um, 
it's it's this ISO state standard you should get back. Okay. So the Maison des are opened in 1986. So I've got, got go. an image of I've got an image of that. Could Beat, um, yeah. if we look at that query, mm -hmm. what data makes sense to display on the calendar? If we look at our slides, um, I had put down on slide four. Mm -hmm. So if we can we look at that together? Yeah, sure. Slide four. Yeah. So start date, that's good. Mm -hmm. uh, end date, we don't really. We, we don't, don't have, have it that. here. I think the beer could have data about how many times it was shown, but I don't think that end, end date. Let's yeah. say that that's not that, that useful. Mm -hmm. um, title we have. Yeah. Uh, description. Is there a description of the event? Well, the only thing, the description is the Wikidata description that is called theatrical production of Schauspielhaus Zurich during the season, so and so. Right. Okay. So but there's no, like there's no longer, said. there's no longer description. Okay. So, but that can serve as a description. Okay. Yeah. Um, images. Are there any we don't images? have well we don't have direct images sometimes we may have images for people and yeah. we probably have images for the for the building for the okay venue. so we could we could sort of follow, follow yeah them yeah we can know. check where we actually have images and yeah. maybe even add them from wiki media commons if they're yeah. missing let's okay. hope that we'll find some images yeah, yeah. uh but usually what we find in such in such projects is that uh there's a big lack of images, of yeah. free images. But um, at least if we try and follow as far as possible the links. Yeah, we'll have a few examples with nice images and we'll have many yeah. examples with, with a few images. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Location that we have. Yeah. And performer, performers. Yeah, the cast and, members. Yeah. yeah. And we have the character names. Character we even names. have. Yeah, yeah, we have the character names. We don't have characters modeled everywhere. Right. I have an example for that, but I think just one. And we have the production company, I think. Yeah. And uh, roles, different roles. Yeah, the roles are strings. The name of the character roles, just as strings. Okay. And the the work it is based on, we have it for some for some of them, but not for all of them. Because it was not possible to to create them on that basis. But we can we can look it up and then connect it. So I wonder if we take an approach here in the calendar where we show as much as possible or we limit the view to a few more consistent uh, fields. What is your opinions? What are your opinions on that? Well, on the calendar, you would have probably a basic view with a few data, and then you can click on a specific event where yeah. you get more data. Yeah, so that's on slide five. Mm -hmm. So. so so you would you would have a list sorted by date, you know, title and mm -hmm. location, mm -hmm. and then when you click, you would have the event details. Yeah. And on the event details, you would you would see all of all of the data points we're listing, mm -hmm. um, and links out to more to other detailed pages. Mm -hmm. But if we just keep it to the event listing and the event detail, my question would be. Is our approach more inclusive of 
trying to show as much data as that shows up from, from the Sparkle endpoint? Or should we try and limit? Uh, the advantage of limiting is you have a more consistent feeling. It looks, it feels less like a, just like a, a data dump, you know? Yeah, we should we should maybe uh, focus on what we should, would like eventually to have and what is, seems realistic. Yeah. But uh, be ready to also show the, the holes in our data because it should so, be a motivator to add that data at some point. Yeah. Okay. So that gives me an idea that maybe we show a, like a layout in the top of the detail, mm -hmm. event detail with some regular consistent fields and then a space, you know, other underneath, which would be further down the page, but it would yeah. be sort of like all the bits and like all the little tidbits that we're not sure where to place. Mm -hmm. Would I think that could make sense. Yeah, we, we could we could just just come up yeah with uh, with some basic information that we eventually would like to uh, collect for every for standard yeah. entry that well, would maybe feature a feature or... an image an image of the venue but maybe we don't have an image of every venue. What I would propose for the images, um, let me just go on slide five here, is that we would have like a gallery a gallery of related images. So that way, instead of having it like um, per property, it could be mm -hmm. a gallery. So it would be more complete than if we try and um, separate it out. Gregory, should I move the images, the links I put on uh, slide nine, leave them where they are or put yeah. them up closer to no, that? Leave them, leave them where they are. Okay. There's also... So, uh, yes. Who's Regie that's in our room? Is that somebody else or is that one of you guys? Regie, toi. Regie. Oh, that's the ones that opened. Tammy, you're muted. Yeah, yeah. They, it's the, the one, those who opened the room. They have the host. Nice and it's the, 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 all, all these rooms have a host, right? Otherwise, it wouldn't exist. Uh, so, Regie means. Uh, it's a host. Uh, Regie means stage managing. So, it's, it, yeah. Okay, so so yeah. So there's also I wanted to mention in the um, Slack channel, I just uh, for you guys to think about as you're doing this. You know, Paul, Paul Bruner, which we met him yesterday, has yeah. the Swiss Institute of Art Research, yeah. fifty thousand art exhibitions with yeah. geolocation and stuff like that. Like this even if we can do events, he's, yeah, he's got geolocation and all of that. He he does have events, but they're. There are exhibits. There are exhibits, exactly. So I'm wondering if as a test case, it's not an interesting test case because he's got the geolocation and all the other data attached to it. Is that, am I way out there? I know we're doing performing arts, but if it works for one, would it work for the other? I don't know. Gregory, you know. I think we have enough. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That's something to think about once we have a working prototype, I think. Okay, perfect. Then we could maybe pair up with him and go, look, we've got a prototype and what yeah, we I think the, your yeah, database. Like okay. two two days usually are short. Okay. If we get the first prototype working and an idea maybe maybe Gregory can give us an idea what kind of additional data we should point him to or add. We can do that. Okay. Perfect. I just thought because it had the other elements in there okay sorry so so does this make sense so we have a search section and we have the which produces a list of search results which you can click on to see the event details absolutely event, the event details page is going to be the most interesting mm -hmm. it's going to have sort of a template that's going to be a laid out display of our of our let's say consistent fields mm -hmm. If there's nothing for a particular field, it'll be blank, but it'll still have its reserved spot. Mm -hmm. And then below, there'll be other data that's not in the template, but it's there to show if we have holes in the data and what, what is available. Uh, there'll be a few buttons. There'll be some links. And there'll be a gallery of related images. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I, I think... 
because we know there's going to be sparse photographs, I think the idea of a gallery is to make it more uh, compelling and, 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 and more um, engaging without having to leave a space and, and a reserved template spot for each image. Like, you know, if there are images of the artists or the performers, we, we add them to the gallery instead of having a, just a reserved spot. Sure, yeah, yeah sure. Yeah, I was thinking about the image maybe just for the venue. Yeah. In case of Schauspielhaus, most entries will be at Schauspielhaus. So we have an image and there are a few others that took place elsewhere. We can look them up where right? we'll find the images. Yeah. Um, yeah, they, I think these are details, right? Yeah. Yeah, but I guess the basic layout, I think mm -hmm. one thing would be fun is to try and see visually what is available because I think... Um, yeah one of the advantages of a calendar for the public is to is to have some visuals mm. yep yeah. and what's interesting yep. you know if we have the image of the shell spill house but it's from 1938 to 1968 i think caitlin having sort of images of the era there's a huge difference between 1938 and 1968 what people were wearing or how they were walking around the street or other Definitely, cities. Yeah. So that, that's part of the gallery of images. I think that would be interesting because it points yep. to the era and the time period. Does it, yeah, it doesn't have to point to the specific venue. It just no, gives yeah, yeah. people a sense of what it, to give them a feel. In the gallery of images, you know? that would be great. Yeah. Yeah. And, and if you really wanted to go wild, you could have like play the music, you know, like you could do a lot of sort of, not this time, but things to kind of bring people. <sighs> And closer to what people were living like at the time. And, you know, I was thinking, like, with the crowdsourcing, you know, when you want to, because we're doing things, you grab stuff. There's all sorts of, like, marketing materials, too, that were happening. Like, there's a lot of, once we get the prototype. Um, the only problem with all this marketing stuff, stuff is that usually we don't have right clearance right. To, to show yeah. this stuff online. Like the Sears uh, catalog, and that at some at some point we just have to tell people also like, hey guys, you yeah. have some, uh, so much material. Uh, yeah, we have to talk to people to release more more material. But I think that, uh, especially for for the 60, 50s, sixties, it would be very hard to get that images that, that have yep. right clearance. Yeah, for newer, I did for what right? for newer yeah. stuff. You can now work on it. You can you can ask them. They're still around. Yeah, yeah I mean, if we did Montreal in 67, you have the expo and probably a lot of them are copyrighted. But, you know, like there's certain, if we Absolutely. choose an era, yeah, there might be some public domain images from an era, if we choose an era um, sort of strategically, that we know there's there's public domain. Well, images. if you go really old, then you may have stuff. Yeah, but that's how it is. Um... Yep. It's just it's just so it's, it's a nice to have. It's not a it's not a requirement. Yeah. Yeah. I think it looks good and the buttons are Gregory. Well if we if, if we if you if we were doing New York opera uh let's say late fifties, we would have recordings, audio recordings. So would it be possible, Bayat, to work on a Sparkle query that would help me? Yeah, sure. Um, like starting from the one that you sent me, the performing arts productions, and yeah, I, I can I can try to give you the stuff. Uh, probably would just need snippets for each of the each of the elements because if you create a, a query that is too big, tries to integrate everything, um, it will break. And and it can be limited to a, a smaller number of uh, true yeah. results. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, that would be great if you yeah. and one that could search by date by start date. Mm -hmm. So maybe I'll add. I'll put a card. Um, I think I created a to do. A to do. Maybe we could put things. Yeah, on that's there. cool. Yeah. Uh, do you need somebody to work on uh, mockups for the for the layout, or is that already in your head? Yeah, I think that's already in my head because yeah. otherwise it, it, it could take a long time. Mm -hmm. 
um, you know, I would use some sort of prefabricated. Yeah, stuff. it's probably easier to just do something uh, by default. And then once you have something, we can start uh, adding recommendations. Yeah. What, what yeah. could be changed or so, and then you change directly. It's probably easier than to make a huge mock-up thing and then I you try to exactly uh, reproduce that. Cool. Ähm, ich schalte mich auch noch mal kurz zu. Ja. Könnt ihr mich hören? Ja. Ja, ja. Äh, ich wollte einfach nur noch mal kurz fragen, weil, ähm, hattet ihr denn schon überlegt, wie, das, wie ihr das einfach grundsätzlich angehen wolltet? Also wolltet ihr ähm, so Geo-Angaben, so Längengrad, Breitengrad und so weiter in die Bilder selbst reinschreiben oder geht es darum, ähm, quasi eine Karte zu haben und dann die Bilder zu nehmen, die man dann auf der Karte irgendwie an die richtige Stelle zieht? Oder ist es eigentlich egal? Also, ähm, wir haben eigentlich eine Karte, eine historische. Ja. Und diese historische Karte wollen wir eigentlich georeferenzieren. Ah, okay. Also es geht nicht um die Postkarten, sondern um, um Land, also diese, diese Karten, wo man sieht, wo die Poststrecke genau. lang geht. Ja, ja genau. genau. Ja, genau. Und das heißt, es ist dann auch nicht ein einfacher Punkt, sondern wahrscheinlich so ein größerer Ausschnitt aus, sagen wir mal, aus genau. der Schweizkarte. Genau, mhm. ja. Ja. Weil was ihr auf jeden Fall mal machen könntet, einfach um euch selbst ein bisschen zu informieren, ist äh, ganz normal über Google halt mal Georeferenzierung und Freeware oder sowas einzugeben mhm. oder Open Software mhm. oder sowas weil es gibt natürlich schon auch eine ganze Reihe von solchen Tools, die man benutzen kann, um, äh, um äh, Dateien halt mit, mit so Geodaten zu versehen. Ja, wir hatten welche. Ähm, Nobu, du hattest ja deine Beispiele. Nobu? Was denn? Ja. Du hattest ja diese Beispiele geschickt. Was denn? Von, ja. von, den, äh, von der Software. Äh, Leaflet. Ja, genau. Äh, oh, äh, ja, äh, Leaflet, äh, ja, ähm, ja. Aber wir können, wir können das wenig brauchen, weil wir die Software nicht herunterladen können. Ja, okay. ja, ja, genau, genau. Man muss, man muss halt ein bisschen Ausschau halten, also jetzt für, um es auf die Schnelle machen zu können, nach irgendeiner Open Source Software oder ja. Freeware oder sowas, mit der man halt, also ich weiß, ich war vor, ein paar, vor zwei Jahren habe ich sowas auch mal gemacht und es gibt schon so ein paar so mit so relativ wenigen Funktionalitäten, aber doch so ein paar äh, Tools, mit denen man zumindest sagen kann, ich gebe jetzt mal den Längengrad und den Breitengrad ein und dann auch nicht das dem Bild zu. Und das okay. geht natürlich in beide Richtungen. Also es gibt einmalseits die Möglichkeit, man hat das Bild und schreibt in die, sozusagen in die Metadaten des Bildes halt solche Geodaten rein. Mhm. Oder eben den umgekehrten Fall, dass man halt die Karte hat und dann das Bild auf dem auf der Karte platziert. Und in eurem Fall ist es wahrscheinlich eher diese zweite Variante. Okay. Ich meine, es hätte auch mal von, einfach ganz normal von Google Maps so eine offene, offene Variante gegeben, wo man sowas machen kann. Da könntet ihr vielleicht auch mal gucken. Mhm. Da hatte ich damals auch rumgespielt, so mit irgendwelchen Zürich-Ausschnitten, wo man dann wirklich so, eine, so ein Rechteck über die Zürich-Karte von, von Google Maps ziehen kann. Ja. Und dann halt quasi in Zahlen ausgeschrieben, die die Geodaten bekommt. Und die kann man dann von in eine Tabelle reinkopieren und hat dann zumindest schon mal die Liste der Geodaten. Okay, gut. Dann ist natürlich nochmal der zweite Schritt, dass man dann wieder die Liste mit den eigenen Bildern verknüpfen muss. Aber eben, also ich glaube, irgendwie auf, auf so eine Art und Weise müsste das gleich gehen. Gut, okay. Also deine Empfehlung ist, 
ja, ich habe hab gesehen, ihr habt es auf dem äh, General Channel <lacht> schon mal geschrieben und vielleicht kommt ihr jetzt von irgendeiner Seite nochmal eine Hilfe. Ja, okay, gut. Also das danke schön. Das, also, ich hüpfe immer so ein bisschen zwischen dem ja, Projekt hin und her und äh, sonst schreibt einfach direkt. Ist gut. Dankeschön. Ciao. <lacht> gut, gut, ciao. Tschüss. Aber dann würde ich vorschlagen, dass wir jetzt wirklich diese Excel-Tabelle ausfüllen, oder? Ja, finde ich gut. Ja. Und als Link nehmen wir einfach ähm, eben die, 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 äh, ähm, mhm. wie heißt sie? Vom Histab. Ja. Mhm. Mhm. Und machen wir das jetzt mit den Karten oder mit den Orten der einen Karte? Also für mich wären die Karten schön und darauf die Orte. Also nicht die, also die, die, die Reisen, mhm. die, die Reiselinien. Ja. Mhm. Wäre das okay? Das fände ich gut, ja. Ich kann mir nur noch das Vorgehen noch nicht ganz... Oder ja. Ich auch nicht. Ich muss gerade gucken, wie wir das jetzt, äh, wie sind wir denn, wo sind wir denn? Also gut, ähm, ich, mach, ich, ich bastel mal, wie ich mir das vorstelle, ohne zu wissen, ob das so ist, wie es richtig ist. Gut, ähm, also. Gut, also ich würde jetzt hier tatsächlich deinen Vorschlag von Uster nehmen. Hm. Äh, uh. <lacht> da gibt's nicht. Kann nicht sein. Okay. Müssen wir das eingrenzen auf Ort? Also Ort. Mhm. Ähm, also eben, ich bin hier auch am Suchen. Nee. Huch. So. Kann schon sein, dass es fehlt. Ehrlich? Ja. Also dann nehmen wir was Größeres. Nehmen wir Zürich. Da kann nicht viel passieren. Wie hast du vor den Ortstyp Gemeinde, Stadt einge eingegrenzt, Novo? Ja, äh, wie meinst du? Stadt habe ich eingegeben. Ja, wo, wo, wo hast du das gemacht? Äh, wie meinst du wo? Also wo, wie? Also wie kannst du hier eingeben, dass es nur nach der Stadt sucht? Ja, also ich habe es da halt, dann kannst du halt da unter Ort, ist, äh, unter, unter Facetten, also zu, zu, unter Orte und dann Typ. Und da kannst du halt dann wie so die Stadt markieren, wenn du nur Stadt möchtest. Ja, wahnsinnig viel. Ja. Start. Gottes Willen. Okay. Also. Man könnte es gehen, hoffentlich. Und jetzt hier auf Geodata gehen. Sind da die Geodaten da? Hm. Was ist denn hier die Georeferenzierung? Was hast du gefunden? Hier. Ja. Kopieren und dann auf deine Karte zurückgehen. Äh, wo ist die denn? Nee, da. Äh, wo ist die Karte? Wo ist deine Karte jetzt hier? Da? Nee, ich muss hier auf Chats. Ich, ich, warte. Also ich würde diese Geodaten dann übernehmen. Mhm. Und dann in die Tabelle, oder wie meinst du so? Genau, in die Tabelle dann eingeben. Ja. Also das ist halt so eine grünen Viereck. Ja. Okay. Eben Ortsname dann eingeben. Ist, ist das falsch? Ich habe keine Ahnung. 
ähm, Ortsname eingeben. Hm. Zürich. Aha du, bist, aha, du machst die URL. Also hier die Koordinaten eingeben. Hm. Oder? Ja. Und dann hier, was meinst du mit URL Geoname? Aha, das ist deine Karte. Nein, also Geoname ist, äh, ich denke, Geoname hat der eigene Portal, oder? Hm. Was? Das, das, da. Es ist halt ein eigenes Portal und das, äh, da bietet halt dann so eine äh, Authority-Daten. Aber da können wir halt dann nochmal halt ein Wikipedia. Aber können wir einfach die URL nehmen, wo wir diesen, Or diesen Ortsnamen gefunden haben? der bei Histab drin steht und dort einfach den Link rein, den Werner Link reinhauen, oder? Äh, ja, genau, also entsprechende äh, Portal würde ich halt dann zuerst. Ja. Also, es gibt dann Geonames ja. und äh, Histab oder Wikidata und so. Ja. Und äh, wenn du Geonames bist, hast du ja. Uh, hast du ja. Äh, Stadt. Äh, Permalink vielleicht irgendwo. Ja. Bei Histab gab es Permalink, habe ich gesehen. Ja. Ja. Und hat dann bei Geonames gibt es ja auch so. Äh, na, also das, dann, ja. dann heißt das, wir geben in diese, in diese Google Docs Liste einfach die, die Permalinks ein, den Namen und, ähm, und aber wie wird das dann referenziert auf die Karte? Ja, das meine ich ja halt eben die Karten, Karteninformation, also das ist ja halt eine digitale Image, oder? Ja. Und äh, das hat dann eben keine Georeferenzierung. Stattdessen halt dann kann man nur noch halt dann mit den Pixelzahlen verankern, wo was steht. Und kannst du das zeigen? Also wenn, wenn wir, ähm, also ich verstehe nicht, was das heißt, ehrlich gesagt. Ähm, wenn wir jetzt eine Postkurskarte nehmen, die, die ich irgendwo heruntergeladen habe, was heißt das? Also wie kann ich, wie, was heißt das mit der Indexierung? Ich habe das nicht verstanden, wie ich in die Karte hm. hineinfahren kann. Ich habe nicht hineinfahren kann. Hm? Indexierung. Karte ich meine, wie, ich, wie ich auf, auf der TIFF-Datei, ja. wie ich da die Angabe, die dort ist, ja. auf, auf dem Bild wie ich das, was du gerade erklärst hast, diese ähm, Referenzierung vornehmen kann. Das habe ich nicht verstanden. Aha, ähm, ähm, wenn, wenn man zum Beispiel so... Ähm, also, eine wie, Karte angucken? Oder hast du, eine, hast du die Postkurskarten schon heruntergeladen? Postkarten habe ich nicht. Ähm, also arbeiten wir halt dann an der... Ähm, Landkarte oder Postkarte? Landkarte. Ah, Landkarte, okay. Ähm, und dann, ähm, okay. <lacht> äh, ähm, bei der Landkarte gibt es ja halt ein Problem, zum Beispiel, man sieht ja nicht irgendwie, Ähm, okay, ich, ich, ich teile halt dann mein Bildschirm. Ja, gerne. Und äh, dann se seht ihr halt dann die alte Karte. Und äh, das ist aber halt dann nur eine Bilddatei. Und das bedeutet halt dann, diese Bilddatei ist ja halt gar, gar, gar keine halt dann geografische Information drin. Und die Frage ist ja halt dann, wie, wie du halt einen Bereich markieren kannst. Und dabei, dabei muss man halt dann eben wissen, ähm, wissen ähm, von wo beginnt da halt dann dein Bereich und äh, wie, wie, wie breit und wie hoch ist da halt dann eben dein Bereich und so. Und das muss halt dann in Pixelangabe abgeben. Was ist eine Pixelangabe? Also, das ist halt dann also Bilddatei 
besteht von der kleinen Pixels, oder? Also den Punkte. Ja, ja verstehe ich. Aber wie, wie, wie weiß ich, dass jetzt an dem Ort, wo das Fenster ist, was, wie, wie die Pixelangabe dort aussieht? Ähm, das ist... Man sieht, also äh, bei, siehst du bei mir halt irgendwie so ja. äh, links unten, ja. wenn, wenn ich halt am Mauscastle bewege, ja. siehst du halt dann wie so eine Pixelnummer. Das bewegt sich halt dann, wenn ich halt dann Castle bewege. Aber links, an, am, am Rand. Ja, ganz unten. Also jetzt steht da dann 700.368. Ja. Pixel oder so. Ja. Und wenn ich halt dann hier ganz am Rand meinen Maus, Mauscastle lege, dann kommt dann 0, 0. Weil jedes Bild beginnt halt dann von dort aus. Ah, das ist wahrscheinlich das da. Äh, 0, 0 Pixel. Und dann die Orte wird halt dann okay. eben markierbar halt dann so mit den Pixeldaten. Okay. Und dann braucht man halt dann wie so ähm, zum Beispiel so ähm, die Angabe, zum Beispiel Pixelangabe, äh, Angabe wie ähm, X, XY. Das ist halt dann der Punkt, wo der halt dann eben dein Bereich beginnt. Ja. Und dann WH halt, das ist äh, WH, weiß nicht, ähm, das ist dann Breitenhöhe. Ja. Okay. Die, die, diese Information braucht man halt, um einen Bildbereich zu markieren. Ja. Und da, dafür müssen wir aber zum Beispiel so eine Bildqualität identisch haben. Ja. Aber weil, das ja. Und äh, also das, das ist halt ein bisschen so komplizierter, und wir, ob wir halt dann so, so eine Werkzeuge hätte oder so, wollte ich wissen. Aber die Daten, die wir jetzt hochgeladen haben auf, auf diesen Server, ja. die wir euch vorher gezeigt haben, ja. die haben ja eine Qualität. Und wenn wir uns auf die Karte von 1851 einigen, dann ist egal, mit welchem Programm wir da drauf gehen, es ist ja immer die TIFF-Datei, können, ja. können wir diese Pixel, ähm, diesen Pixel, diese Pixel haben angeben, oder? Ja, ja, kann man angeben, ja, auf jeden Fall. Aber ähm, diese Pixelzahl zu finden, ist halt dann so ein bisschen mühsam, halt, je nach Software oder so. Und ob wir halt eine einfache Software haben oder so, wollte ich wissen, aber... Ähm, ja, keine Ahnung. Es ist einfach die TIFF-Datei, die wir hochgeladen haben, ja. auf die wir jetzt zurückgreifen können. Ja. Okay. Aber es hat keine extra, kein extra Bildbearbeitungsprogramm. Okay. Ja. So, das sind schlichtweg die Daten, die wir zur Verfügung stellen auf, auf, ähm, auf, auf der Plattform, die wir zur Verfügung gestellt haben. Und ja. Glam, und Open Glam. Es ist eine Tiefdatei oder ist eine JPEG-Datei? Ich habe eine Tiefdatei. Tiefdatei, okay. Ich habe eine JPEG-Datei gefunden. Ah, ja? Ah, dann hat er die JPEG-Datei hochgeladen. Es, dann ist es aber eine sehr hoch aufgelöste JPEG-Datei. Ja, es ist relativ groß, ja. Und dann kann man ja halt, äh, ja, äh, ja. Willst, kannst du uns das zeigen, wie wir jetzt da vorgehen sollen? Äh, ähm, wie, also der ist eine Karte von 1851. Äh, okay, äh, ja, ähm. Ich weiß nicht, wie es bei, bei euch funktioniert. Also wir haben ja unterschiedliche PCs und unterschiedliche Softwares. Ähm, ich verwende Gimp und äh, kann man auch machen und dann äh, Ansicht größer. Ja, so. Und äh, ich weiß nicht. Ja. Ah, aber man könnte jetzt beispielsweise Brienz auswählen. Oben in der Mitte steht Brienz. Ja, und da halt dann könnte ich vielleicht irgendwie so eine rechte auswählen und markieren. Ja. Und dann gehe ich halt dann mit dem Maus. Dann siehst du halt dann Pixel. <lacht> Pixel hat dann 6379,4872. Okay, 
dann schreibe ich das auf oder, oder kann ich copy-pasten? Ja, und dann, das ist ja halt dann äh, die, an, äh, wie heißt das, also der Punkt, wo man halt eben diese Bezeichnung beginnt. Ja. Und äh, dann da seht ihr auch halt dann so Pixel äh, 5, 6, ne, äh, 6, 5, 3, 8 und 4, 8, 7, 2. Ja. Und dann könnt ihr halt dann einfach so vier, vier Punkte halt dann machen. Also die Pixelzahlen halt da herausschreiben. Und ja. daraus kann man halt dann eben den, <lacht> den äh, Bereich auf dem auf der Karte halt dann markieren. Okay. Glaube ich. Aber das ist nicht so schön anstrengend eigentlich. Okay. Aber haben wir eine andere Möglichkeit? Äh, das wüsste ich gerne. <lacht> ja, ich auch. <lacht> ja. ja, also wenn wir halt dann dafür halt also so eine Tools hätten, dann dass wir halt dann praktisch, also wenn wir halt da irgendein Online-Tool oder so hätten, ja. das wäre schön. Aber nein, haben wir jetzt nicht. Okay. Äh, ähm, weil ich weiß nicht so genau, also welche Software ihr habt. Also ja, ich habe ähm, ich, ich hab, glaub, also ich habe auch ein Mac. Okay. Aber ich habe keine extra Software für, für, für Bildbearbeitungsprogramme. Aha. Hm, okay. Ähm, wie machen wir das? Äh, äh, oder wir können halt dann zuerst ähm, mit dem Bild arbeiten und äh, ähm, Ihr könnt halt dann zuerst einen Stadt, Stadtnamen halt herausschreiben auf der Liste und äh, Koordinaten und äh, irgendwie mögliche Link oder so halt dann dort hinzuschreiben. Mhm. Und ich könnte halt dann so eben dem Bild halt dann eben diesen Bereich herausfinden. <lacht> und dann können wir halt dann miteinander ergänzen oder so. Okay, das oder? hört sich doch sehr gut an. Jo. Ist das okay für dich? Wir warten einfach auf Kenny und hoffen, ja. dass Kenny zurückkommt. Ja, genau, das <lacht> er wäre ja unsere Rettung. So. Genau. <lacht> Und dass er uns dann hilft. Genau, genau, das wäre gut, ja. ja. Okay, ja. aber dann, dann machen wir das doch jetzt erstmal, dass wir in, in, in die Google-Liste das eintragen. Ja. Ähm, und ähm, dann macht Sarah jetzt, trägt Orte aus der Westschweiz und ich aus der Ostschweiz ein. Und ja. dann kannst du frei wählen, welche Orte du da <lacht> auswählst. Ja, okay. Ja, ja. Ja. okay, gut. Also, dann tragen wir jetzt fleißig in die Tabelle ein. Jo. Ach, das kenne ich. Hallo. Ja. <lacht> Hallo. Hm? Hallo, Kenny. Hallo. Hallo. Oh. Wir sind schon leicht verzweifelt. <lacht> <lacht> Ja, weil wir nicht wussten, wie wir weitermachen und haben uns jetzt gerade auf, auf eine Vorgehensweise geeinigt, ähm, von der wir glauben, dass sie in irgendeiner Form zielführend ist. Mhm. Eben, wir haben jetzt bei den Karten, ähm, wird Nobu die, die, die Pixel-Koordinaten auf eine Google Docs-Liste eingeben und wir schlichtweg die, ähm, die Ortsnamen und die Georeferenzierung. Okay. Ja? Ja, Was sicher. Man, ich, ich bin dran im Moment. Ja. Es funktioniert so halb wie immer, aber mal schauen, ob ich noch <lacht> <lacht> zu einem besseren Resultat komme. <lacht> Super, okay. Dann, dann arbeiten wir jetzt an unseren Tabellen jeweils weiter, hä? also an in unseren Arbeiten. Ja. Gut, also. Sorry, dass ich vorhin weg war. Ähm, wann wollen wir das nächste Mal treffen? Oder seid ihr immer im, im, im Webex drin? Nein, wir können uns gerne das nächste Mal treffen. Wollen wir sagen, so um, was haben wir jetzt, Viertel vor vier. Ähm, wollen wir uns um Viertel vor fünf treffen? Ja. In der Stunde. Ist das okay ja. für euch? Mhm. 
Ja? Ja, ja, sehr gut. Super. Also dann bis in einer Stunde. Dann tragen ja. wir das jetzt ein. Gut, super. Bis später. Ciao. Bis dann. Tschüss.
schicken. Ist jetzt das? Ja, also, dann machen wir es einfach auch rein. Also wenn du dann die Sache hast, du fällst dich hier oder her. Das weiss jetzt niemand. Die Kopf und Decke haben wir nicht dafür. <lacht> ja, ich probiere es mal. Ich habe eine Statistik, die du jetzt auch verfälscht hast. Du ah, musst aufpassen, sonst sind wir noch aufgenommen im Moment. <lacht> Was? Wo sind wir aufgenommen? Nein, aber die Ski 4 ist da. Ich weiß nicht, wer es ist. Was? Ist dir nicht aufgefallen? <lacht> Was? Wir werden aufgenommen? Nein, das weiß ich nicht. Im Moment muss ich sicher nicht. <lacht> wer ist der Ski 4? <lacht> ah? Ich weiß es nicht. Oh, okay. Um, ich mache weiter. Ich habe jetzt wieder 10. Lugano habe ich 10. Ich suche wieder mal meine anderen Freunde. <lacht> also, du fällst ja nichts, der ist jetzt hier. Ja, aber soll ich einfach Biel austauschen, oder was? <lacht> ja, voll. Ich da jetzt mal das ein, weil das sind CH. Super. Das ist doch super. Gregory? Yeah. I've thrown in the basic query in slide okay. number nine. In done. Yeah. Um, I think that would be enough to search by date afterwards. I think the date limitation you will do on your side, like if you say we want to just pick out five years or 30 years. Okay. Um... Okay, so we have item, location, location label, main stage, date of first performance, native label, production company, production company label. Okay. That would be for the main search, right? And then I can retrieve more information about each of them. Okay. But that I would, I would put into separate queries. Otherwise, at some point, yes. these, these queries... Also, you have to be aware that when you start adding more data to Wikidata, some of these queries may time out at some point. There's yeah. techniques to prevent that, but uh, I think that... I don't remember that there's a particular service you can call, I think, that for larger queries then. But that's really something we have to look into at the Do moment, you know I think. I wanted to ask you, do you know anyone who like has downloaded uh, Wikidata so that you can work with it locally? Do I know some, somebody who has done that? Yeah. I tried doing that. Not uh, specifically, no. Yeah. It's because I tried doing that a few months ago. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I had some, I ran into many errors when I'm trying to load it into a triple store. Mm -hmm. So... I was just wondering if anyone yeah. had experience. You should ask in the, maybe in the Wikidata Facebook group or so. Yeah, okay. Because I'm, I'm sure there are some instructions somewhere, but your, your problem is probably more specific. You want to have somebody to... Yeah, I know where to get the dump. I know... Yeah, you know yeah where exactly. To... But yeah. then you, you run into specific problems. Specific triple problems. Yeah. 
Okay, um, but I, we we don't need to do that uh, for this. So yeah, we we can um, we can look into that another time. I can yeah. uh, maybe yeah. ask on the Facebook group and connect you, or you you become member there as well and just ask. Yeah. So then I will just go on and create further queries to get more interesting stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. And I'm going to start by setting up the pieces. Um, mm -hmm. I'm probably going to do a mock-up of the user experience. Okay, yeah. Um, in, ah, cool, in so we have that for the, for the presentation. Uh, that's in one hour, the presentation? Yeah, um, two, no, two hours or more, let's see. Okay, I'll, I'll try. I'll try. Here it's only it's only four o'clock. It's I think it's it's six thirty, right? The presentation. Okay, so twelve. Let's hope not to miss it in two hours and a half. So yeah, two and a half hours. Okay, yeah. so we'll see. Yeah, we'll see what I can get. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll see um, how far I get on that. Mm -hmm. I may, I may, I may decide to. Hmm, I'm thinking about this. Um, because the Sparkle queries are sometimes uh, flaky, mm -hmm. um, I may, when the app starts, I could load a fresh results locally and then yep. run the app locally. Like that could refresh whenever someone starts a session or something. So it could, it could maybe, maybe that's a way to... Uh, create a slightly more reliable so that will mean like when you start the app and get in you get the cached data right yeah at least for the ma the, the 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 major views yeah and then yeah and then you have a refresh button that uh, reloads data from wikidata right yeah yeah and if it times out you fall back to the original one exactly yeah, that makes sense. So I may I may do something like that. Mm -hmm. So I could actually we could develop also um, the user experience on on some static data, and then and then have yeah. The, yeah. for testing. Um, but well, I'm just setting up now, so I'll see I'll see how far I get in that. Dazu oder gleich drei Fragestellungen dazu. Egal, eine für Zeichenunterricht, eine für um, Aufsatz, also für Schreiben und eine für irgendwas. Ja. ja. Ich weiß nicht. Oder auch selbst, Oder wenn die, die Schüler so wie ein Moodboard zusammenstellen könnten. Wie? Wenn die Schüler selbst ihr, so ein Package zusammenstellen ja. könnten. Genau, das heißt, ihr bräuchtet so eine Art wie beim Reichsmuseum, kennt ihr das? So eine Art Studio. Ja, zum Beispiel oder so eine, ja, ein Lightroom. <lacht> das wäre doch cool. Dann können sie nämlich die Objekte auch selber ausschneiden. Ah ja. Ein, so ein, ja, ein Stud ein, ein Arbeits, ja. So ein, ja. ein Atelier. <lacht> Und dann können sie die Sachen runterladen. Um, ja. Also, kennt ihr das, das Reichsmuseumstudio? Also, ich kenne das nicht, Irina, du? Also, nicht das Reichsmuseum, aber so Ateliers habe ich auch schon gesehen. Also, einfach so. Online. Schau. Da. Schau, da Dive. Into the collection, guck. Um. Uh, kannst hier durchsuchen. Dann klicken wir jetzt irgendwann an. Um. Nehmen wir den da. Das ist lustig. Schieber. Nehmen wir. Du kannst sie auch nur markieren als Like und du kannst sie in, eine, in ein, dein eigenes Profilstudio, wenn du eingeloggt bist, kannst du deine eigene Plattform und das bleibt dann alles in diesem Reichsstudio, aber es ist dann deine, sind dann deine Likes, ja, deine Sammlung ist das dann quasi, deine persönliche. Und hier kannst du es bearbeiten. 
Download das Work and Get Creative zum Beispiel. Teilen. Das ist ein kleiner Wickler, warum immer das? Oder das Work. Nein, das wollen wir nicht. Wir wollen es downloaden. <lacht> Und dann. Make it your own. Wie ist es gegangen? Jupp. Immer schöner. Das ist gegangen. Niemand. Man kann ihn dann schon bearbeiten. Vielleicht ist aber das. Hier kann ich es aussuchen? Jetzt habe ich horizontal. Ja, add to a new set und so muss man sich dann herumspielen. Aber so eine Art Studio könnte man noch machen. Ja. Dann könnten Sie selber mitarbeiten. Wo Sie selber dann genau sich drei, vier, fünf, vier, wie viel auch immer aussuchen und dann damit weiterarbeiten. Genau. Und auf jeden Fall, also ja, so eine Art Richtung von Studios, so haben wir das mal so schreiben. Jetzt. Ah, creating a Studio. Website und dann uh, your own, create your own collections. Ja. ja, aber das ist was, was wir zu tun haben, dieses Creating a Studio on der Website, das wäre eine technische Umsetzung, mhm. wenn man die Sachen halt irgendwie zur Verfügung macht. Und das Coole ist nämlich, dass ihr das dann noch nicht von der Hand gibt. Das ist die Frage, wie mhm. ähm, wie ihr das umsetzen könnt. Aber das wäre, das könnte man machen. Eine andere Variante ist halt einfach, man, äh, ich weiß jetzt nicht, äh, wie downloadbar eure Sachen sind, gar nicht, oder? Nee, bis jetzt nicht. Du kannst halt, und das ist, hat dann natürlich jetzt urheberrechtliche Gründe. Man müsste dann vorher das abklären, wie das möglich ist. Oder Aber was? einige gehen, oder? Hm? Einige würden funktionieren, oder? Einige würden funktionieren, ja. Wir könnten aber auch abklären, ob man jetzt als Vorschaubilder das Meer sogar öffnen könnte. Das, müß, das müsste ich dann noch machen. Ist die Frage, wie gut die Qualität sein muss, wofür es reichen muss. Ja, so, dass man es halt irgendwie zeigen kann in der Schule, ja. muss ja nicht. Ja. Und so, dass es halt dann ausdrucken können selber oder so vielleicht, oder eben selber einfach nur verschicken können. Also es muss jetzt nicht so wahnsinnig toll sein, glaube ich. Es reicht halt als so, wie man es halt so auf einem Bildschirm gut anschauen kann. Ja. Glaub, das muss jetzt keine tolle Qualität sein. Aber dass man es eben runterladen kann und dass man es verschicken kann, dass man zum Beispiel das auch als Gruppe dann bearbeiten kann und dann als Projektvorlage halt irgendwie nimmt, wofür, welche Frage auch immer. Ja. The description on the site, like the uh, the location or location below. I don't know if it, if it needs any details shown on the on the front page. Um, Johannes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, sorry, I, I, uh, I was uh, trying to set up an account on coach pen so what's what's the question sorry um the question is what do you think like we're talking front page um philip said that um he thinks it would be better to have just one image instead of two um side by side which i agree to uh but then how much information do we need on the front page what do you think like on when um do we need a name and location, I think name, yes, location, or is it the information that will be in details when you click on the image? You could have uh, both, actually. I would, so I think the home page is also here to um, kind of to browse through all the pictures. 
And in this case, I would suggest we need the name and the location. Okay. If you browse through a collection, you want to have more information than just the image. You want to have that graphical information. Yeah, I would, I would actually say we can have both. Like first one big one, which uh -huh. you have to click on it to get third information. And then maybe four, which we quite like, which uh, directly have the location below it and the information below it. Like you also can scroll on the main page. You know how I... Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you have uh, the contact of the girls like, who joined us uh, earlier, the, the ones who are doing the map? Do you know where, um, where they are? No idea who they were. Well, perhaps I can remember their names. Nicole and... We have a channel, a channel called Participants, and you can search this channel. Mm -hmm. um, I am just there. Search. Nicole, you said? Nicole. Yeah. Oh, yeah, true. Ah, oh, I made a picture. Stupid me. Yeah. Picture for uh, documentation <clears throat> purposes. Wait, maybe I have it. Yes, I took it. Um, so they are called Miriam Rodehake, Nicole Net. Yeah, so you can just go in to the participants channel, then you can search the participants and search for Nicole and Miriam. I did a general search directly on the, on the top. Yeah, like you can Nick type Nick and you will find okay. Nicole. I found Nicole Net. Okay, so because I I wanted to um, I can ask her advice on how we could um, sort all the pictures. Maybe they have an idea on how to break the carbon then in uh, in little regions or in valleys or in um, sort by mountain peaks because we somehow need to make it. To not to make the person scroll the whole length of the pictures. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think we also could like um, have a like category, which is just uh, if people liked watching the picture, like upvote, like you have on Facebook or something like that. Because then we also get like the favorite ones, and that could also be a nice category just to see what people like in the won't it hide week or the pictures something like that that, that i uh, sorry won't it hide the pictures that are more that are harder to find i mean the the harder to replicate won't it somehow hide them because hmm? mm, we want people to take, uh, to jump into the challenge and to uh, match as many pictures, as many postcards as mm -hmm. possible. Maybe not necessarily do the biggest amount of replicas of the, the one that is the most popular. I, but... I just have an idea because of that. We could uh, have a category system of like three categories. One is easy as hell and someone from the region looks at it and knows exactly what it is and where it is. Two is if you like put a bit on research on it, you will find out where it is. You have to go there and you have to find the spot. And three is we don't know where it is and nobody did until now. Okay. That, that, that would be a possibility. Sounds good. Sort them. Sounds good. And then the girls could like send us five pictures that are category one, five pictures that are category two, and five which they have no plan at all where it's from. And then we have 15 pictures to fill the page. Okay, okay, I will think about it too. Okay. Yeah. Just, just an idea. Like, you know, I just always throw my ideas at people and it sounds like a finished thought, but most of the time it's just like, take it and do with it what you want and then tell me if no, it's good or not. Same here, same here. Yeah. I just thought that we can have a, a category that is called uh, 
something like I'm ready for a challenge uh, or uh, like get a challenge category where you get a picture that is really hard to find. Uh, and you can have a culture a category that is the most popular, that I already matched, that I liked, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. mm, and I don't want, I don't, I'm thinking how to diplomatically call the category medium. <laughs> Um, not that popular, but <laughs> not that hard to match. Um, oh, okay, I will think. Hard to find or something like that. Like make it make it nice. So I want. Yeah, that's <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Yes, that's good. Um, but so you have some work, do yeah. you or not? Okay, so and so. We have to create the sidebar to create a rashto with different pages. Good. Um, hello again. Are you like, how should I speak? No, it's just strange. Um, as I have just uploaded and had the situation just done, um, it's how never does hello again or the two extra. Mm -hmm. Das hat es offensichtlich schon gespeichert, weil es ist jetzt ja bei dir angekommen. Ja. Aber ich habe jetzt nicht irgendwie einen Safe-Button oder so. Okay, dann hat das vielleicht nur ich als Host, aber... Um, how to create a fixed sidebar. Ich kann dir schnell schicken, was ich mal reingehe. Uh, dann, dann, dann. Zu viel Kommunikationstool auf einmal offen, sagst du. <lacht> ja, ich kann jetzt sagen, vorher wieder ein paar... Mails müssen löschen und ein paar Tabs wieder zu machen, nicht dass es dann auch so unübersichtlich wird. Das ist noch ein bisschen unübersichtlich, ja. Und jetzt im Slack hat es ja auch wieder tausend neue Nachrichten in fünf verschiedenen Channels. Ähm, das ist auch mal so ein bisschen. Uhu. Ähm, so, so, so. Ähm, hast du gesehen, es ist da gerade noch eine neue Person kam, die noch ein Team sucht. Und ihre Beschreibung, also sie hat auch Erfahrung im Web Development. Wo ist das? Im, in unserem Kapauliana Chat kannst du das noch lesen. Oder auch im General. Um. Yes, sounds great. Ja, und genau uh, in unserem Channel in uh, mm -hmm. im Jana sind wir noch angeschrieben worden von der Andrea mm -hmm. und ich habe gerade vorgeschlagen, dass Thea doch vielleicht bei uns könnte. Ich weiß, es hat zwei Abkürzungen. BS ist dort für Basel, oder? Ja. Und BL? Ist für BL. Das haben wir aber auch schon. Ja, schon. Oh, ich weiß auch nicht. Ich muss nämlich nicht anfangen. Dort haben wir doch BL, BL. Das ist glaub, ganz am Anfang, oben da nicht. Ja, das stimmt. Okay. Ähm. Um... Dann wäre, ja, du wäre Juri, oder? Mhm. Juri, schreib mal wie. Habe ich, hab ich andere Nuri? Also, Nein. ich glaube... Ah, Jura, sorry. 
Jura? Jura, aha. Jura haben wir noch keine, glaube ich. Um, ich bin ein ganz großes Gebiet. Wie wäre es mit Delsberg? Sehr vielversprechend aus. <lacht> Delsberg? <lacht> ja, ich tue da immer noch Größe, wenn ich aus Ding so denke, ich jetzt im Innenstadt CH Dinger. Delsberg. D-E-L-S-B-E-R-G. Okay, ich habe. Hm, nö, jetzt gib mir mal eine Postleitzahl. Ähm, jetzt sag ich mir keine, ja. Das ist etwas komisch. Nehmen wir mal zusammen, ich noch. Ich habe Möchte ich bauen. Oder mhm. da möchte ich ändern oder so. Kann das ein einzelnes Pen sein, wo wir noch halt einfach quasi schauen, was braucht es alles, damit es fertig ist. Und am Schluss kopieren wir einfach den ganzen Pen in Zita an die Stelle, was es halt braucht. Genau, ja. Und vielleicht kannst du mir dann irgendwann noch erklären, wie du jetzt eigentlich genau auf die auf unsere Webspace zugreifen. Also quasi, wie kannst du auf sie. Homepage zugreifen und sie bearbeiten, habe ich auch nicht verstanden. So, bist du schon, ähm, hast du schon abgeladen, Atom? At Home ist jetzt bei mir installiert, ja. Sehr gut. Einsatzbereit. Ja. Brauchst du ein Add-on? Das heisst, File. Wo sind die Settings? Ah, Preferences. Ähm, Package und dann brauchst du das Remote FTP Package. Hat etwas über eine Million Download. Also. Ja, wo kann ich es finden? Also ich ähm, und so. File Preferences Packages. Äh, das gar nicht. Was bin ich da ganz blöd? Ich finde Preferences nicht. Uh, und der File? Ja. Yeah. The post type. And um, uh, it's, uh, all of them are archives. So it only says archive, archive all the way down. Ah, okay. At least. That's some information we have yeah. there. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, let me just check the other... The ICE, because uh, it was a very strange format of the ISIL... List, is that right? Ah, should it be? Uh, did you go over the open open data Swiss link? Um, let me see how I did it. Um, not the open data uh, link, but the um, Uh, the web page. Yeah, open data Swiss right? uh, data set and then I open the CSV file. Mm -hmm. Is that the right one? Yes, should be. Let's do this as well. Go to resource. Yeah, that was better actually. I, now I, I opened it uh, directly instead of going through um, Excel. And that is better. Let's see. Yes, when I open it in Excel, there are these, um, you know, these fields like uh, institutional history, for example, or uh, the description of the funds that are sometimes very long. And so it. Uh, yeah, it's just pulled together. Yeah, exactly. It disrupts a bit the yeah. whole file. Yeah. But the only hit I get in, if I search for the word archive, is in the URL in the first ID field, Helvetia Archives. So it doesn't really seem to be... It's 
some other no it's hidden in the words on in the names exactly. it's yeah. hidden in the names exactly that's the problem yeah and uh that's the same for libraries and the same for museums here so we don't have these uh, institutional types Doch, i think and... no it's it's uh, that's a web address yeah no. The first row is uh, the web address from our database. Mm. And I guess in the S row, the, uh, no, the next one, the T row, there is the uh, URL from the institutions. But I think it would be great if we could have like a property as well that is uh, for institutional types. If we talk of a library, if we talk of a museum, or if we talk of an archive, and that is now lacking in our database. Yeah. But maybe like as you did it, like what is active? And one thing that I, I uh, think we should also think about is. Um, because you say you had to write a function, right? Mm -hmm. So are you only looking at the start date or are you looking at the time span of, uh, from start to end of the exhibition? Uh, both. So uh, for, for the function, I basically made two parameters mm -hmm. that contain, contain, I just named them start and finish, or start yeah. and end, sorry. And my function just is, uh, it depends on these parameters. So. The thing I'm doing on the top right here, mm -hmm. this is this is from the database. Mm -hmm. But uh, upon manipulating this thing, mm -hmm. it also changes the parameter because they're linked. Yeah. I, I made it so that they're linked. So basically, uh, I couldn't do it directly. I don't know why <laughs> I, this it, Tableau doesn't allow you to for some reason. You have to make these parameters, and then from those parameters, you have to make a function. And mm -hmm. that function mm -hmm. is basically saying, okay. The start or the yeah. I want the date of whatever uh, or whatever individual exhibition to be between mm -hmm. a particular start and end date. So here for this, for like for example, now it's 2003. Uh, as long as a exhibition ends in 2003, it will mm -hmm. be here. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it does mess up sometimes. Like I noticed that uh, I, I can't find if I can find an example here because uh, some of them. Start mm -hmm. a year prior, so it will be like 2002 to 2003. But because it ends in 2003, it will show up here, and not it wouldn't show up in 2002, even though that's when it started. Yeah, that that that's what I was getting at. Uh, these kind of things, um, because the the question is of like how nuanced, like with how which level of complexity do you look at the data? Because mm -hmm. you can have an exhibition. There are some cases where maybe an exhibition is an exhibition that is. Uh, say outside and it's open always so yeah. it opens in 1990 and it's still going on today so that dot would always be there and so then yeah. you would have to look at the it like okay it opened in 1990 and it's not closed yet so it's still active um, yeah and of course if you only look at kind of a time stamp of like when does it close you put it in that year that is the the how should I say kind of the shortcut, but then yeah you lose it in two thousand two if it opened the year before. Um, yeah, so uh, that that's something yeah. that I got. I I'm trying to find a word. I'm sure I'm trying to find it so that I can make it like uh, exactly that in that year whatever. Mm -hmm. I mean it doesn't matter when it started or when it ended as long as it was going through in that one year it should be there. That's what exactly. I'm trying to do. Yeah. If you think of an application like an exhibition calendar and you want to know, okay, now it's June 2020, which exhibitions are happening right now? You mm -hmm. also need the ones that start in April but end in August. So neither the beginning nor the end date are in June, but it's still active. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And I think, yeah. I think um, implementing that, I think that would be useful and maybe also good learning experience. And also, I think it's less complex than the trying to figure out like this thing, like if you have multiple exhibitions per dot, I think that could be quite some more difficult thing. Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, it would, 
if it's in the same area, mm-hmm. if, if it's very near, I could maybe try to make another, uh, like a separate, separate field that mm-hmm. count. I mean, that, that, that keeps track of whether mm-hmm. one, one, how near one dot is to another or, or like in, in terms of locality, but that, Mm-hmm. That would be a bit more difficult, as you said, because then I will need to take into consideration consideration is uh, latitude and longitude, and then you know, kind of see that, uh, kind of make like a little radius or like a little circle, and then the circle, how many dots does that one circle contain, or one mm-hmm. little circle that, that represents a piece of land? Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe I don't know, maybe like two, three kilometers mm-hmm. in, in radius, so it's like six mm-hmm. kilometers in diameter, so. Uh, how many dots are in this one uh, circular land, and then that mm-hmm. could just account for all the exhibitions that were in that one mm-hmm. place. So, and then how, the more the dots, the the bigger the circle representing the all the exhibitions there. So that mm-hmm. that is is be interesting, but <laughs> it's a bit difficult, and I don't know how how to really go about it. Except no. in mathematic mathematically, it makes sense, but yeah. Uh, I have no. I mean, I I don't even know if it's possible using this, but I'll I'll try to I'll try to improve on this. And also, um, if you think of it, I mean, one one thing is always the data side, and then the other side is the visualization side. And then for the visualization side, uh, yeah, you could either go like making the dots bigger and lower in the opacity, or you could also mm-hmm. work with colors. That you say like a very bright, strong, dark red has a lot of exhibitions. That's like exhibitions more than 15 per year, you know? And that like, if it's, if you go more towards, towards a lower opacity, maybe something that is not a bright red, but more like rose pink, you know, that's like maybe only one exhibition. So you can use color to show how many exhibitions are happening. Uh, but this is also something it's, it's easy if you only have one scale. Um, yeah. Because I see sometimes visualizations where like you have to, to choose your spectrum very wisely, you know, mm-hmm. because I've seen uh, visualizations where they say, okay, so you have um, red is a lot, yellow is very little, and then uh, blue is nothing. But like, and then you look at the color and it doesn't explain itself, you know? Yeah, like you have to look at what does what color mean, and ideally you look at it and just without even look or looking at what color means, you know uh, what what it means. Yeah, that that would I think the opacity changing the opacity would definitely achieve that. I I think that's maybe easier than changing the size and the opacity and everything because also then things overlap and it's kind of, um, but like just changing the color of the dots according to how many exhibitions you have with these coordinates. Mm -hmm. The good thing is also the coordinates, they are kind of precise, but only down to the city level. Like they're not uh, precise down to which street. So Mm -hmm. everything in one city has the same dot. Uh, So it's easy to group them by that dot. Yeah. Yeah. So like this right, like this star right here. Mm-hmm. Uh, the starting date is in two thousand and three, and the ending is in two thousand and four. Yeah, but it would only ever show up in two thousand and four because that's when it ends. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think yeah, that's one of the first things to look at because then also mm-hmm. you're more flexible with like smaller time frames if you want to say only this month or only this week, you know. Yeah, I yeah I could I could try that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I'll, I'll try I'll try to make it so that at least if it starts in that year mm-hmm. and and maybe if it actually I should take into account both right? if, if whether it starts and ends so I mean uh, or for certain like like for this even though it ends in 2004 but if it first started in, if it was started in 2003 I should just take it into, I mean, you should just put it into the tree instead of going all the way to the, to the four. Or it should show up in both because it starts in one and ends in the other. Exactly. Technically. Exactly. Yeah, that's, I would that, see. Yeah, that will make it better. Yeah, and I think from a technical standpoint, uh, how should I say, there's often, there's an easy, quick 
kind of sloppy way to do something. And then there's the, the proper way to do something. And mm -hmm. sometimes you do the easy thing first to see, okay, what does this look like? And then you do decide, okay, is it worth doing it properly? Um, and this, for example, I think it's great as this first draft just to see what it looks like. And it's, it's very promising. And I think mm -hmm. uh, now you have kind of two, two ways to, to deal with the beginning date of the exhibition. You can either do it the simple way, which is to say, um, if it starts in 2003, put it in there. If it ends in 2003, also put it in there. Um, mm, yeah. And it's, of course, very simple because you just check those two parameters. What's more work, and that was what I would call the proper way, is to check, say you have an exhibition that starts in 2002 and ends in 2008. So none of the parameters mm. are 2004, you know? Yeah. Um, and that depends on really what you're, what you're trying to do. If we're only looking at this from a year level, um, this is maybe also something to consider when you look at the data. You can learn from the start and the end day, uh, point of the exhibition, how long is a usual exhibition? I would say a usual exhibition is somewhere around th uh, three to four months. Yeah. So you don't really have many exhibitions that go on for five years. So maybe in this case, if you want to work on something else, it's not really worth taking the time to uh, look at that time span because you have, if, if we're only looking at a year level, you don't gain much, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, but if you want to go down to a month level or a week level or even day level, you definitely need this. It's just something to keep in mind. Um, yeah. I think I'll, I'll at least start by making it so that uh, if, if I mean making it so that the years that it's active it actually shows up in those years no matter if it ends or starts as long as it's between those years it should show up. Yeah. So you mean the prop? So like if you have if we're looking to, at two thousand five now. So if it starts two thousand two and ends two thousand ten, you want to have it in there, right? Yeah. So so like, yeah. like right here two thousand four and two thousand five. So if this one should show up in two thousand four as well. Yeah, after five, so two years. Once you, you see that it starts at the end of the year of two thousand four, or or it take any anyway, yeah, this one's the, yeah, at the end of two thousand four. So if you mm -hmm. then break this down into month level and you say you say what's going on in February two thousand four, you don't want this in there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'll I'll, I'll try to work on this now. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for the thanks for the advice. No, sure. Like it's this is this is great. Like uh, if you have any questions or want to uh, think about something together, just do as we do now. I'm I'm also working on something. I just have the camera uh, turned off, but like uh, I'm hearing if somebody sends something, so like I'm available. Ah, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. I'll, oh, thank I'll you. try to make this better. Yeah, so nice to see. Okay, I'll hear you later. All right, All right. sure, sure, sure. Okay, thank you.
manage the whole uh, codification questions. Mm. It set it as UTF-8, and then it should uh, should work. Yeah, but I guess uh, yes, the Open Refine people should should uh, be able to help you with that. Yeah, I I would really like to to learn how to do that. So, do you want us to just mm -hmm. go on great. and try to fix it? Yes, it would be great. Maybe I can see with uh, Simon if we can find a way over over uh, Python to do it, and so yeah. we have two approaches. That's a good idea. Okay, so we try it okay. from different angles. But uh, let me just make it totally sure. We want to uh, compare the ISIL file with the uh, VSA file and see uh, if all the uh, all the archives in ISIL are also in the VS, uh, uh, VSA file. Or exactly, and vice versa. Yeah. And vice versa. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, Kristin, shall we just okay. uh, try to do that? And and let me ask because now we're uh, we're sort of open until six thirty, right? We're, this is the um, we are going to to meet together again at six thirty, and then then the, con the program continues, and then after that it's the evening, right? Yeah, exactly. Because at some point I should have dinner. <laughs> I'm getting hungry. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, sure. No, don't, don't worry. I, I think we are quite open now. So uh, let's try to find out if you find something. And if you feel like it, you you, you take a break. I, I think I will do this as well. Yeah. And then I'll be here again at uh, 18.30 for the final session today. That's a good idea. And, uh, and, uh, then we can look tomorrow in the morning where we are. Yeah. Sounds good. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Shall we just continue on telephone, please? Yeah. Okay. Yes, we can. Okay. okay. See you later then. <laughs> Great. I'm leaving. See you later. Bye. -bye. See you. Bye. <laughs> Zercher, scheiße. Was ist das gesehen? Ich kann es nicht übersetzen. Was soll das also? <lacht> mein Müller, okay, das kann ich übersetzen. Wer das? Ich habe es mal farbig. Ich mal farbig gemacht, dann vergessen wir es nicht. Ähm, das kann ich auch noch. Niederwalden, Biel. Okay. Sie lesen noch Niederwalden? Nein. Oder Bio? Bio, hm? Ja. Muss ich rausnehmen, hm? Ich habe viel Müller hey. Shit. Oh, nein, ja, ja, das ist ein String, wo so und so viel Pixel. Ah, okay, jetzt muss ich los. Also, die bauen da quasi das String, wo 220 Pixel. Ja, ja. Also, also sie setzt am Anfang das Slider in die Mitte mit dieser Variable. Mhm. Aha, dadurch wird eigentlich Breite halbiert. Äh, genau, sie setzen, äh, also sie machen das eine Bild halb breit, schneiden die Hälfte weg. Genau, ja. 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 Ähm, und dann eben der Slider. Ist ein Diff in dem Fall? Ja, ist die, das Diff, was sie da oben definiert haben. Ähm, wo ist er? Ich 
quiet, you might say. Oh, so heißt du. Hä, hey, das Schritt verstand ich jetzt gerade überhaupt nicht im Fall. Das da verstehst du das Schritt? Also das, das verstehe ich ja. Aha. Okay, ich verstand es nicht ganz. Also wie machen Sie das? Ähm, also ich verstehe das so, Sie tun ein neues äh, HTML-Element erzeugen, nämlich Div. Ja. Und jetzt tun Sie die Eigenschaften von dem Div noch bearbeiten. Und zwar, Aha. das ist noch eben im, Ko im Comp Slider. Okay. Also am Schluss wird der HTML-Code heißt es nachher eigentlich div und nachher class gleich im Comp Slider. Ja, dann bauen Sie die Location vom Slider auf. Security function when the mouse button is pressed. Slider event list and the mouse down. Yeah. Slide ready. Another slide finished. Okay. Yeah, that's the that's the is quasi have an event listener. Then when the slide ready is. Also manchmal ist das eine Funktion in der Funktion, in der wir bereits sind. Yes. Okay. Also ja. du, callst, du callst einfach nur die Function und die da wird ausgeführt, sobald ähm, sobald Slide Ready called wird. Und Slide Ready wird called durch den Event Listener. Aha, ist aber das Slide Ready, ist das ein Methodenaufruf? Mm, ja. Ich glaube. Ah, ohne Klammer. Mach nicht Event Listener, rufen doch immer. Ich meine, die dürfen Methoden noch rufen, oder? Ich habe ich ein bisschen irritiert, weil hinter Slide Ready hat sie halt keine leere Klammer. Das stimmt. Also, ich komme von Java und nicht von JavaScript. Das ist ja, für mich alles ein bisschen speziell. Also, auch nachher unten die Function Slide Ready E. Also ist das eine Methode Deklaration oder ist das eine Methode Aufruf? Das ist ähm, eine Deklaration an der Stelle. Also, äh, Aber das nicht ein Aufruf. Also die wird nachher nicht ausgeführt an dieser Stelle. Ähm, nein. Übrigens, ich glaube nicht, dass das Slide Ready das gleiche ist wie oben das Slide Ready, weil Slide Ready braucht ja das Argument, nämlich das Argument E. Aha. Und dann ähm, äh, cioè, che riporta tutti gli itinerari della Val Verzasca, le, le descrizioni, le, orca, ho chiuso il file, è possibile. Ecco, con, eh, che riporta le descrizioni, le, le coordinate, i dati su dislivelli, E poi, eh, insomma, volevo vedere a che punto arrivavo, adesso li ho fatti di tutti gli itinerari, per andare un po' più nello specifico sul, uh, sulle tappe all'interno di ogni itinerario, perché sul sentiero della Val Verzasca, eh, del, sul sentiero delle leggende, ci sono dei dati più approfonditi, mentre sugli altri, mh, sugli altri itinerari vanno estrapolati dai PDF le tappe. Quindi volevo vedere un po' dove arrivavo adesso. E, sicuramente mi mancano tutti quelli del sentiero della Val Verzasca cioè del sentiero delle leggende continuo a confondermi scusate cioè... però indica... insomma essere... ok e a che punto sei? Sì. ho tirato fuori una no ho tirato fuori una, una tabella un, un excel dove eh, ci sono elencati tutti gli itinerari l'unico ci sono sei itinerari in tutto 
dal sito internet eh, con un titolo, una descrizione, con eh, indicazione delle lingue. Solo un itinerario non presenta dati sulla lunghezza e il dislivello e la durata. E quindi ho visto che questo itinerario qui non è molto ben fatto, lo toglierei dalla lista. E, e poi ho inserito, uh, ricavato i dati sulle coordinate di questi, di questi sei. Uh, per ora c'è questa tabella, ecco. Comunque stavo guardando ma funziona come un... Eh, funziona come un museo, è eh, proprio strutturato questa cosa dell'itinerario, stavo guardando anche io sul loro sito, è eh, veramente molto simile, un po' le stesse modalità di gestione dei dati. Vabbè, bene. Ok, adesso mi manca da, da estrapolare prima tutti quelli della, del sentiero delle leggende con, con i file audio e, e poi appunto eh, vedere se riesco a tirare fuori quei dati lì anche dal, dai file PDF. Questo tempo è stato questo. Io invece ho seguito Marta per quanto riguarda l'estrazione manuale del, de, di questi dati che sta inserendo nella cartella Excel. Gli ho dato qualche delta in modo tale che li possa ottenere in maniera un pochettino più rapida. Mentre io sto scrivendo lo script per ottenere i dati della, eh, della collezione di oggetti del CDE, del Centro di Dialettologia e Etnografia. Sono 2.343 item. Quindi, ah, ma si può ampliare? Come? Ti posso prendere? Sì. I dati sì. I dati... No, solo i dati. Se io le immagini non le tocco, però i dati mi dicono a che si possono prendere. Il museo di Lorenzina o anche del... Anche del museo della Val Verzasca, perché i dati appartengono al museo. Quindi, quindi eh, si possono prendere, sono le immagini che non appartengono al museo. Però a quel punto il dataset, nel momento in cui con uh, lo script li cacci fuori, mettiamolo dentro alla, sì. a Open a Swiss, quello lì. Perché mi sono informata per la storia dei dati invece. C'erano altre cose oppure posso raccontarvi dei eh, dati? No, no, è giusto l'ultima cosa. Il mio lavoro per questo non è visibile, nel senso che ovviamente ancora non ho ottenuto nemmeno uno dei dati richiesti. Però una volta che avrò fatto, sarà pronto lo script, con un click vengono giù tutti i metadati di tutte appunto le 2.400 item. Penso che mi ci vorranno ancora un 15-20 minuti e saranno pronti. Ottimo. Ehm, invece eh, io mi sono informata per la storia delle collezioni su Wikidata. Allora, in teoria si possono mettere, nel senso che di solito sono eh, benvenute le collezioni a eh, dei musei, però in pratica, in realtà, io sfido chiunque, perché se metti una brocca romana, ok, ma se metti una brocca ticinese, secondo me tu mi tirano. Per cui siamo realisti, non succederà mai. Invece ho detto che forse si può organizzare in collezioni, cioè in gruppi di contenuti, non tanto magari la collezione etnografica oppure eh, cioè, per temi, raggruppandolo per fondi. Mm. Potrebbe essere una, una, una strategia per poter comunque segnalare dei contenuti e quindi dare una, una georeferenziazione. Che fanno parte della collezione perché il museo ha più sedi, per esempio, quello della Valle della Zacca lì non ci sono problemi, bisogna anche vedere magari se ci sono le sedi collegate o la collezione, insomma possiamo trovare delle soluzioni magari un po' più tematiche. Poi io intanto ho fatto la richiesta per l'OTRS, che è um, il servizio TRS, che è praticamente il servizio che registra e archivia la documentazione di Wikimedia eh, per tutti gli autorizzazioni che abbiamo, poi ho, um, sulle pagine di Wikipedia dei musei ho annunciato che c'era avevano rilasciato i contenuti con licenza libera ho inserito l'opera di gambardella <ride> nella pagina di besto eh, e, ho, mh, e ho un po migliorato le voci sui musei che così intanto quella roba lì la so fare e mi sa che è la cosa che so fare forse è meglio <ride> Sì, su Wikidata, su Wikidata se ha senso eh, inserire le collezioni etnografiche del Ticino, cioè bisognerebbe eh, provare a ottenere le autorizzazioni per quei dati lì anche da tutti gli altri musei etnografici. Così almeno ce l'hai completa. Allora, eh, sì, cioè comunque il fatto... Secondo me è una cosa che potrei, um, si potrebbe fare, cioè, o, non oggi, però um, non penso che i musei abbiano 
particolari restrizioni a non darti quei dati Scusami, invece niente. un attimo allora da un punto di vista della raccolta dati quella sarebbe una figata assurda cioè scrivere a tutti i musei etnografici chiedendo se compilano il modulo per rilasciare esistia hanno fatto un potenziale aber wenn man noch weiter denken könnte ähm, könnten gegebenenfalls sogar die Zahlen dann erkannt werden oder dann kann man wirklich die, die Zeiten ausrechnen im Prinzip ja aber es ist wissen Sie, im Moment mache ich auch so dass ich alle die die false positives so wo, da wo er einen, einen Text anzeigt wo in Wirklichkeit keiner ist dass ich die im Moment ein bisschen ausfällt dass ich sage es muss mindestens drei Zeichen lang sein das Wort ja. sonst ist das kein, keine Stadt. Ja. Ja. Ich denke, da kann man noch viel verbessern. Ja, okay. Aber im Prinzip glaube ich, dass die Texte könnte man so erkennen, einigermaßen. Mhm. Mal. Man könnte okay. ja dann auch im weiteren Schritt noch schauen, ob man ähm, für diesen Begriff, der dann herauskommt, zum Beispiel, wenn jetzt Aug-Punkt rauskommt, ob man ähm, in der Datenbank die Oleg und ähm, Nobutake gefunden haben, ob man da Geokoordinaten rausbekommt und wenn nicht, ja, dann lässt man es einfach sein. Plus hätte man dann einfach mal. Okay. Das ja. wäre vielleicht, also für diese einen Begriff, dann könnte man ja. die auch noch wegfiltern, weil für Augpunkt findet man wahrscheinlich keine Geokoordinaten. Nein, wahrscheinlich nicht. Und mit, mit Transkribus, glaubst du, Transkribus wäre was? Dass man mit das könnte man auch mal probieren. Ich bin überhaupt, ich habe nur heute Morgen schnell das, das Tutorial angeschaut. Ja. Wenn man da ein Experte ist, nehme ich an, kann man da auch vieles. Ich weiß nicht genau, wie man das dann rausbekommt, ob man die Pixelkoordinaten ja. rausbekommt. Ja. Wow. <lacht> ob man die Pixelkoordinaten da auch rausbekommt, das weiß ich nicht. Okay. Das kenne ich das Programm viel zu wenig. Ja. Okay. Ähm, wir haben in unserer Excel-Tabelle ganz wenige Orte aufgenommen ähm, mit, mit Koordinaten. Könnte das eine Hilfe sein, dass man da das irgendwie unterstützt? Nein, ich glaube im Moment nein, hil hilft das für die Erkennung der Worte nichts in dem okay. Sinn. Okay. Ich glaube, ähm, Nobutak, soweit ich das gesehen habe, hat gearbeitet ein bisschen am, am Darstellungsding. Okay. Oder ja. Ich weiß es nicht genau. Ich bin vorhin ja zu spät gekommen, hast du schon alles besprochen. Nein, nein, wir sind auch gerade eben erst gekommen. Ähm, wo, wo sieht man das, wo, wo Nobu gearbeitet hat? Das weiß ich nicht. Ich habe nur gedacht, so wie er von seinen Meldungen im Slack-Chat ja. her. Ja, ich, ich habe gesehen, dass er mit Oleg kommuniziert hat. Genau. Irgendwie, Aber sobald ich das Webex offen habe. Ah, ist vielleicht, weil ich share. Ich stoppe mal meine Freigabe. Ja. Ich kann sonst nichts mehr machen, ja. Ah, irgendwie. Ich habe es wieder Zeit für einen neuen Computer. Jetzt hat er gleich geschrieben. Ah, mit den Kreuzlingen ähm, im Osten. Vielleicht kommt er jetzt, weiß ich nicht. Ja, also das würde ich vielleicht noch probieren, ob ich da schauen kann, dass ich mit einem, ähm, ja, einem Vokabular, das, das aus diesen Open Data Ortsnamen besteht, ob man da bessere Resultate erreicht. Ja. Texterkennung. Ja. 
ich nur so. Mein Bülach wird so ab. Mit dem kann man nichts anfangen. <lacht> oh ja, das wäre super. He? Ja, jetzt weiß ich nicht, ob, ob Nobo noch dazu kommt oder nicht. Okay. Ja, ähm, wollen wir sonst sagen, dass wir uns morgen wieder treffen und gucken, was, was passiert ist? Ja. Ja, wie gesagt, heute Abend habe ich nicht so viel Zeit. Ja. Aber Ah, e poi vedo le fonti, ci sono con il controller. Ok. Allora parliamo del, del nostro tool. Che sono le 5 che abbiamo l'oretta. Ci sei ancora? Tutto bene? Ci sono, ci sono. Ci sono, che... ci sono che... Devo ragionare su come scrivere il codice. Cosa per... mi sento? Mi sento. Mi sento. Mi Guarda che sei tu il, il designer. Coordina il tutto fa. Ormai sei. Ma per lo script per posso chiedere Valerio. Che punto sei con quella sei parte della parte? Perché forse eh, si può... Eh, 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 No, la colpa è di Marta. <ride> la, la, sono... <ride> Già non ci sento. <ride> la colpa è di Marta, ma se teniamo così. <ride> ecco, così si sente senti meglio. Pronto? Io non sento niente. Ah. Senti niente? No, adesso sento. Adesso sento. Sei collegato. Yeah, adesso si sente bene. Ok. È la colpa mia, allora. Sono i lavori in corso. <ride> Ma... Niente, come, come vogliamo procedere? Ma... Ma io non so. Direi che comanda Giovanni. Giovanni, no, l'unica cosa che volevo dirti, Giovanni, è che forse per lo script si può chiedere anche aiuto a Valerio. Se ci stai lavorando da qualche parte, che gli posso far vedere la roba, eh, se ti può servire aiuto, secondo me la fa sta roba qua. Guarda, io ci sono qua, sì. Una cosa che mi può aiutare per facilitare il lavoro, visto che per adesso lo sto facendo manualmente e non riesco in maniera rapida a farlo, è... Questo magari lo può fare Marta che già conosce come funziona la piattaforma e ottenere mm. la lista degli ID delle, uh, delle risorse che stiamo cercando. Ti ricordi in basso uh, c'era l'ID? Uh, numero. Sì. Il numero. Quello lì. Ecco, mi serve quel valore lì. Eh, se me lo riporti in un, uh, so, anche semplicemente in un file di testo nel, uh, nel documento condiviso sul Drive, in, in modo tale che io... Parto da quel file condiviso per fare l'operazione di ottenimento dei metadati per ogni singolo ID. Così io mi concentro nel, nel, nel file script per ottenere dei metadati e poi ci aggancio il tuo, uh, il, il tuo elenco fondamentalmente. Ma devo fare un elenco dei 2424 23 ID praticamente? No, intanto farli, farli per la, anche solo per la prima pagina per, per testarlo, poi per il resto lo automatizzo io quel processo, è solo che ho bisogno di un, un piccolo dataset di partenza per, eh, per okay. ottenere i dati. Allora, va bene, 
Grazie. Sì. Faccio della prima pagina e poi, e poi procedo a estrapolare i dati del, del sentiero. Delle... Okay. Comunque eh, Marta, voglio... adesso ti verranno dati solo i compiti più di merda. <ride> Giovanni, se ogni tanto puoi passarne uno, anche a me e Vanessa, noi siamo pronte. No? Eh, <ride> Questo... A Vanessa? Eh, allora, io sono la prima pagina, pagina di merda. Di merda. <ride> Vabbè, ma cioè... Vabbè. Un'altra un cosa che potete fare voi uh, potrebbe essere, beh, per quanto riguarda i dati, c'è poco da fare. Mm, ecco, quello che si potrebbe fare è cominciare a pensare allo step successivo, ossia abbiamo, sappiamo quali sono i dataset che abbiamo a disposizione, provare ad immaginarsi quali sono le feature dell'applicazione dell quindi senza, senza ancora progettare esattamente quello che vediamo in pagina però intanto capire quali saranno le caratteristiche eh, del tipo non so, probabilmente ci sarà una mappa uh, questa mappa che cosa deve presentare più precisamente oppure ancora Anesta ci hanno dato il compito della Madonna cioè noi non so. cioè, a Marco eh, non è dato il... vale. noi abbiamo il compito creativo va eh. benissimo cosa eh, non viene in mente nessun'altra eh, saremo puniti in questo dai Marta poi vieni anche tu non ti preoccupare ti facciamo fare ma no, senti no, una cosa comunque quello di Marta ovviamente no, è cioè... perché poi lo faccio in automatico è, è che solo adesso per testarlo bisogna <ride> un, un qualche dato di partenza che che non ho ottenuto, non riesco ad ottenere io manualmente. Va bene. Vado allora. Poi, ovviamente pure io, poi per quanto riguarda il design, pure io cioè voglio, voglio entrare a far parte, però magari nel frattempo potete cominciare a fare qualche ragionamento del tipo, non so, io mi metto nei panni del, della persona numero uno, del viaggiatore con la sua famiglia. Ok, che cosa mi aspetto di trovare dentro a questa piattaforma? Quindi in che maniera uh, avrò, avrò la possibilità di accedere alle informazioni che realmente mi servono per, per me, con la famiglia, con i bambini? Quindi è dato cominciare a fare qualche ragionamento di questo tipo. Magari farlo anche a voce alta, così nel frattempo anche se stiamo facendo qualcos'altro, io e Marta vi, vi ascoltiamo e possiamo intervenire. Mm. Eh, potete eh, utilizzare... È durissima, ma ce la faremo. Sì, cosa dobbiamo usare? Il... No, eh, potete anche utilizzare Figma, se, se vi è più comodo per, non so, per schizzare o anche riportare dei test con le prime idee che vi vengono in mente. Va bene. Con Figma posso aggiungere una pagina? Sì. Allora, pagina 1, sì. allora, aggiungi sì. pagina. Eccola lì. Pagina 2. No, perché non mi fa più? Va bene. Va bene, a dopo. Ciao. A dopo. Allora, Vanessa. Allora, aspetta che... Io però... Rimesso in tenuta. Ecco. Sì, intanto sto copiando e incollando, sto facendo proprio anche quello le cose sui diritti, sulle immagini. E, e le, le immagini che abbiamo sto mettendo a, a, a coda, in coda al nomi, l'autore, la, il fotografo. Ok, però eh, se, se lo sai, eh, adesso se vuoi ti faccio vedere come, come si caricano delle immagini su Wikimedia Commons, che lo riguardi. E, e provi a farne un set quante saranno le immagini? Eh, ne sono un casino non lo so, non so ah, quante... sono e i posti come sono organizzati? cioè per il singolo lago, fiume come sono? no, sono, sono per adesso sono divisi per, per oggetto quindi per specie oh. tipo le rocce sono da una parte la fauna è da un'altra la flora okay. un'altra eh. non sono per aree Ok, e poi all'interno del titolo si capisce che cosa. It's some stuff because I because I realized we would need um quite a lot of details like font and blah blah blah. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to um, to see if there is a template we can see we can use just to, to do it faster. Yeah, sure. Because my next step would be to build kind of the framework, or I would say build the kind of the basic structure of the site. 
Mm -hmm. that, I would like to get in touch with you. Okay. To, yeah, to see what, what your thoughts are about layout. Mm -hmm. How um how exactly you want my input to be in what um so um best would be a sketch. So let's say the really first page, our home page, mm -hmm. the last page, um what would you like how it looks like? Okay. Do we have any idea of the name of the site, something like this? Um, Philip, I think you have called it uh, with a um, mountain search. Yeah, but that was just like, fill in the gap. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's fill in the gap with. Hmm. Battery. Um, also, Philipp, dann kann ich im Moment mit dem Atem ein bisschen arbeiten und je nachdem schon etwas erst hochladen. Genau, einfach aufladen, wie es dir gerade passt. Ähm, ich ergänze noch das hier alles. Einfach so. Ähm, Aber eigentlich muss ich ja nicht einmal aufladen. Ist ja eigentlich nicht einmal unbedingt nötig. Mhm. Also, du kannst auch mit Rechtsklick äh, Show in Browser machen. Ja, du nicht mal noch warten mit Aufladen, ja. Mhm. Also, spielt nicht so eine Rolle. Ähm. Okay, aber ich würde eher nicht die Query kommen, wenn ich es aufladen würde. Nein. Okay, gut. <lacht> um, do we want to make our homepage in English or in German? Das sieht jetzt einfach so aus, oder wenn man da drüber hovert. Oh, what a guy! Cool. Cool. Oh. Ah, oh, das ist halt so klein. Ja, was? Mega schön. Ja, und das zu jedem Kanton. Und dann würde man einfach das so anpassen, dass mit den Städten, wo wir da haben, dann steht da nicht, also nicht Aargau, aber Aargau wird angezeigt. Cool, aber kann ich denn so wie auch das ein vergrößern noch? Also wie meinst du vergrößern? Also ich tue auch kurz sharen, weißt du? Mhm. Und auch ich sagen, dass wir nicht so doppelt Arbeit machen. Ja, voll. Ähm, also hier zum Beispiel, wenn ich über die Schweiz gehe, also man könnte natürlich auch mit Kantonen machen oder so. Man hat es auch so gemacht, dass man, wenn man drüber hovert, dass es ähm, irgendwo da, keine Ahnung, dass es halt grösser wird. Und... Ähm, wenn wir da noch Postleitzahlcode haben, wir noch nicht gemacht, gell? Searchfeld. Searchfeld? Wir ja. können sagen, wir machen ohne Search. So mit den, mit den Buttons einfach zum drüber haben und nachher einen ersten äh, richtigen Ort eigentlich, oder wie? Okay, dann machen wir gar keinen Search. Ich gebe die 20 Orte oben ein und dann kommt einfach pop der richtige Ding auf, oder? Der richtige Kanton. Und dann auf der Seite da kommen die Infos dazu. Okay, ist das für alle gut? Ich will jetzt gerne mal überlegen. Genau, Nein. Aber das ist ja nicht so, ist ja egal, ich kann das nicht verstehen. Ich habe einen Uhr, einen Balken oben dran, weil es sind jetzt. Ich habe es ja geschickt. Gehabt. 
Also da, das sind ja 26 Kantone, oder? Wenn wir nachher nur 20 haben, sind es sogar noch weniger, äh, als das wir vorher gesehen haben. Wir haben jetzt pro Kanton, haben wir jetzt alles aus der Dinge gesagt. Mhm. Pro Kanton haben wir noch. Ähm, jetzt ich das geschickt. Es ist, ähm, ich habe es teilweise... Mail oder Slack, oder was ist das? B, sie hat es da im Chat und ich habe es im Slack. Also ist gerade der unterste Link. Ah, oh, ah, oh, das ist ein, okay. Ja. Ich kann es mal extra lesen. <lacht> Auf ähm, Slack schicken. Die abgeladen ist. Aber er braucht jetzt ja nur die Bereinigung, die wir jetzt haben, weil die andere ist eh unbrauchbar. Eben, das ist die Bereinigung, die habe ich schon abgeladen, zum Wiederbearbeiten. Ah, okay. Das ist also, im Slack. Im Slack, genau. Mhm. Okay. Ähm, ja, da ist schon etwas gelaufen. Weil wir haben ja noch den Rang drin. Die Situation hat in dem Fall auf die Seite geschrieben. Was haben wir? Also ursprünglich habe ich es so verstanden, dass wir uns geeinigt haben, dass oben das Suchfeld ist, ist immer noch. Man gibt die Postleitzahl ein. Oh, nein, stimmt, das kann ja gerne. Man klickt auf den Kanton und dann kommt äh, der Rang, also 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, oben dran. Weil die haben ja immer so Ränge, wie die ist. Um, also wie jetzt mit der Rang? Die, die wir am meisten haben, also, oder? Das kann ja irgendwie ist. einbauen in dem. In dem. Warte mal. Also, dass man da quasi jetzt die Map hat, oder? Also. Ja. Dann hast du, kannst du quasi auf einen Kanton klicken. Dann zeigt es dir einfach den Ort an, wo wir haben, oder? Mhm. Dann hast du hier oben quasi den Rang. Ihr das quasi, wenn du so gerne so du drüber, dann klickst du das an, dann kommt da der Rang, wo du nehmen Eben, das ist die Frage, wenn wir den Rang machen oder wenn wir auch die erste Folge anzeigen. Ich sehe, wir müssen den Rang machen, weil es so viel aufgeht bei der Doppelsendung. Ah, ja. Okay. Aber das ist dann äh, ja noch nicht gesplittet in männlich, weiblich. Es ja. muss immer gesplittet sein, oder? Immer. Also du kannst nur entweder männlich oder weiblich anzeigen. Darum müsste man dann irgendwie fast sagen, dass beim Hoveren eben die Linke zum Beispiel, also man könnte eben so wie links und rechts noch so eine Tabelle machen oder so. Mhm. Und dann halt die Infos drin kommen. Und dann kann man halt irgendwie sagen, die Link-Tabelle heisst irgendwie Female und die rechte heisst irgendwie Mail, oder? Und nachher geht die Auflistung oder so. Mhm. Kann man schon so machen. Ja, das ist halt Aber wo würdest du die Tabelle machen? Also auf der Seite? Ja, auf der Seite. Ich würde jetzt einfach eine grosse Flexbox machen mit dem, mit dem Schweizer Dings da in der Mitte. Um, dann eben halt links und rechts zwei leere Boxen, die gefüllt werden mit der jeweiligen Information. Und, also, ah, sorry, also ich habe drei äh, wie Element halt eben, ich habe zweimal äh, so eine, äh, eine Box, äh, wie heißt ähm, ein, ein Diff. Mhm. Ein Diff um, also um Schweiz, also einmal oberhalb, einmal unterhalb und das kommt nach einem große Diff, der nachher eine Dreifolge so nebeneinander stellt. Wie wenn, wenn nur ein Kanton gerade äh, angewählt hat, oder abschafft, dann ist eigentlich die restliche Karte von der Schweiz irrelevant. Und man muss nicht irgendwie die Kantone, die noch grau sind, sehen. Deswegen kann man dann sozusagen über, das, über die Schweizer Karte dann auch die Tabellen nicht überlappen lassen. Weil dann sind die noch im Fokus plus der Kanton, der markiert ist. Ja. Mhm. Gut. Und also jetzt, äh, dann machen ihr die Webseite mit dem alles HTML CSS Code? Ja. Sind wir es irgendwie merch oder so? Hm? Sind wir es irgendwie zusammenfügen? Ja. Also eben das, was ich bis jetzt gemacht habe, ist eh mal Grundbaustein. Nachher müssen wir halt einfach irgendwie die Daten, die ihr vorbereitet habt, einflüssen. Mhm. 
Okay. Ja, das ist jetzt noch vorbereitet. Also, wenn wir jetzt die Excel-Liste zum Jason machen, mhm. dann, ja. Wenn wir das in Szene geführt haben, sind wir eigentlich so gut wie fertig, oder? Wie nehmen wir noch machen, oder? Wie wir dann eben die Funktion dann eigentlich machen, und mehr nicht. Ne? Mhm. Ja, aber weißt, wenn wir jetzt noch viel Gas geben, dann haben wir noch weniger Stress. Also. Ja, voll. Oh, gut, aber ähm, kann ich in dem Fall ähm, arbeite ich nicht mehr an dem weiter? Um, ist das mit dir Dings gewesen, heute mal mit dem, mit dem A, mit dem Gross Schweizer Kreuz drauf? Ja. Ah, okay. Ja, nein, dem Fall nicht. Okay. Ja, also, sonst also tun ich halt ähm, noch ein bisschen das Teil ähm, anschauen und dann können wir es am Schluss zusammenfügen, oder? Ja, ja ich, ich weiss, es ist sehr mühsam, so fern irgendwie das Zeug zusammen. Echt schwierig. Ich weiss, es wäre scheiße, aber äh, ja, wir müssen wir das so. Gut, ich meine, am Ende kann eh nur eine Person am Code schreiben. Ah, weißt du was, aber du kannst es schon mal anfangen, also wenn du willst, kannst du schon mal anfangen. Ah, Ah oh nein, das geht ja erst, wenn der Jason Datei fertig ist. Dokumentation oder was? If everybody is gonna be logged in, or maybe the, the movie is also one of the projects. Mm -hmm. So to, and we only have half an hour. Mm -hmm. So to keep it short, we thought I will just say one or two sentences to kind of summarize what you've been mm -hmm. doing. And then you can mainly yeah, ask for help or inputs or mm -hmm. add information, whatever you want and then so then people can say okay you can either i don't know maybe they will give you very concrete things and post links uh, in the chat or maybe after the whole presentation session is through you can then get in touch with each other uh, either in your room or through slack um, but during the apero the idea is those of you who want to talk about the projects more with other people And that's the moment to do it also. Yeah. And so during this info session, we'll kind of so everybody knows what the others have been up to. And then after that, you can exchange. Yeah, nice. Okay. okay. I think Ishan, you should, you should, because if we don't, like if we say we have half an hour and like say we, we present 10 projects, it's three minutes per project. So I think if you start out, Valerie, and then Ishan, mm -hmm. since you worked on this really, and I'm more like the data provider and advisor and like we bounce ideas off of each other, but like you are really doing the work. So I think it would be good if you share your screen, you show quickly what it does uh, at the stage uh, that you're at right now. Mm -hmm. okay. and, okay. and then maybe, yeah, before, 6.30, you can shortly discuss what are the, the things you want to ask or say to yeah, the so. whole group. Yeah, yeah we, we'll discuss before Ishan, you and I, um, and whoever else. We'll see if David is in, if Chihau is there. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll uh, talk a bit before so that like it's really concise when we get there. In the... I always feel like I feel a bit of a pressure if it's a group chat with many people that I'm on. Because I feel like, you know, every minute that you take is multiplied by the I minute people know. watching. But like, I know, I know. Yeah. But it's still, I mean, because you have been working all afternoon, all the teams have been working separately. So even if we take more time than half an hour, that's okay. Because I think yeah. it's an important aspect to also exchange. So we won't be telling you, you only have two minutes. You yeah. can just take your time. But if we present shortly the project, that we yeah. can kind of compress it. I have to say, I have been watching the, the YouTube live stream sometimes. Yes. Just to see, and I didn't know this was happening. I'm kind of still figuring out how everything works. Um, it's because I saw the message here that like Regie 2 said, uh, you're live now. And I'm like, what? what? Okay. Oh, okay. And I wasn't aware that this was happening. And so yeah. went there, and it was interesting to sometimes see what people are talking about and also how one group went to the Swiss German, one group went to Italian, like, okay. Depending on the group. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like the Valle Verzasca, a Ticino group is all speaking Italian. Like, yeah. Italian, yeah. 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 <laughs> it's a good idea. Uh, so you can switch from one room to another. Well, I can see what the others are doing. Yeah. 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 Just because you can, you can kind of see 
without being really there, have an idea of what they're talking about and also uh, what's happening. Mm -hmm. That's a good cool. Point. So I'll see you guys at 6.30 at the latest mm -hmm. at the, in the room zero. Room zero, perfect. Okay, thank cool. you. See you, see then. you there, right, bye. Thank you. Hi guys, do you, do you hear me? Uh, yes. Okay. So how is it going? Okay. Is Hast du Italien und die Hüsse machen da jetzt eh noch um den Tüftler und so? Und genau. Lass uns schnell überlegen, wenn haben wir das? Wir haben doch genau das auch schon mal machen im Unterricht, oder? Also, nein, also das Ding ist eben, wir haben eben Daten visualisiert anhand von einer Excel-Liste. Aber mhm. ähm, ich glaube, das andere Mal haben wir einfach Jason direkt, also haben wir schon das Jason direkt bekommen, weiß nicht, aber. aber er hat doch ja, gesehen, ja, aber er hat doch gesehen, es ging auch viel einfacher, aber er hat wollen, dass wir es zuerst von Grund auf selber machen. Aber es gibt, es gibt doch etwas, was es am konventiert, oder? Genau. Und das habe ich nachgefragt jetzt da. Ich habe ein Plugin, wo das irgendwie konvertiert. Ich probiere jetzt das nebenan auch noch zu googeln. Nicht die Seite gesehen. Ich schicke es dir mal schnell, warte mal. Es ist nicht die Seite gesehen. Hm. Probier es mal aus, wie funktioniert es. Der Link, den ich in den Chat geschickt habe. Ich werde es wieder langsamer. Ein Stress, mein Sie <lacht> Sie ist mir bekannt vorgekommen. Oh ja. Ja. Oh. Gell? Ja, das ist nicht. Aber es ist ein PSA, ja genau. Und dann kann ich sagen, dann, wow, du bist super gut. Und dann ist es the first row, nicht mehr, genau. Ähm, er hat gesagt, irgendetwas ist da noch wichtig, dass man darauf schaut, über was wir wollen. Ja, first row ist column name. Und jetzt muss ich aber überlegen, weil es ist fast geklärt. Nein, nein, choose file stimmt. Dann gehen wir auf choose file. Choose file. Und dann ähm, browse. Und dann sollst du die Datei auswählen können. Mhm. Alright. Sometimes it's easier to say like in an hour or in two hours because then we all can talk exactly. about yeah. <laughs> what that means. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so considering it's uh, in, in about an hour and 10 minutes, we got to present. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it would be better if I stick to ear by ear. At least I can try to make it ear by ear. So you can kind of see where the, where the majority of... I mean, the majority is right here. It's, I think I've been through this so many times. I just know it's, it's in this one area right here. Yeah. So this is going to be the reddest area, while the rest are going to be mostly pink, except for a few here and there. Okay. So it's going to go year by year. I have two, two questions. Um, okay. One is you said you're doing some things manually that you're looking to automate. Does that yeah. have to do with the... Um, that you have to set the level of at which point does it become which color or what, what are you doing manually right now? Okay, so what I'm doing manually right now is going through the ears. Everything else is not manual. So the only uh -huh. thing I'm looking to automate is uh, that it should go through ear by ear by itself. And I just have to like press play and then it just goes through by itself. I yeah. see, I see. Well, that, I guess that can be, that can be done. That shouldn't be, yeah. Um, and my other question is, um, if we say, um, if we look at the color from a, a percentage standpoint, like from like zero percent is you don't have a dot at all and hundred percent is you have the reddest red possible. 
um, mm -hmm. how do you define this, that scale? Because there's several ways to define it. You could say, uh, you could say, okay, zero to five exhibitions or like, no, one to five exhibitions is the slightest pink and then everything over 20, like, where do you put the threshold, you know, or that, that, that would be method A or method B would be you take per year the sum of all the exhibitions and you say you have 300 exhibitions per uh, in a given year and then you take the percentages of that, you know, so instead mm -hmm. of an absolute measure, you take a relative measure. And like both kind of can make sense, but the question is, what are you, what are you trying to do? And also like looking at the data, what makes sense with the data? Okay, so, so far the way that I've looked at it, it's uh, based on geographical location. Mm -hmm. So basically if a couple, or I don't know the exact number, but if, if a lot of them mm -hmm. are pretty densely uh, located in the same area or nearby, so like here, this, it will be this area, mm -hmm. it will show up as being more red as compared to other areas, which, are, which, would, which would be more pink as they get further and further away from uh, other exhibitions. So in a way, it's relative to the position of the other exhibitions. Mm -hmm. And it, 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 I mean, it's, it doesn't have to either be absolute or relative because it's, it's, it's just that as long as this one exhibition is near to, mm -hmm. let's say maybe five or like this is quite a lot right here. Yeah. If it's near to this many, it should be the reddest of red. But for example, this one all the way here is pretty, pretty pink. Well, because it's all by itself. Can you zoom so, into uh, the very red area just so that we see it more in detail? Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah, so it. now, so think, yeah, so as, as you well, zoom in, you, you get a better idea of yeah. where exactly the red is. I think that kind of zooming, we should do that at 6.30 when you present, you know? Okay. To show that, like, when you, when you look at it from further away, when you show all of Europe, you, you only see, oh, there's one big red area. And yeah. then you go closer, and then you realize, ah, okay, this is the big cities. Uh, because in a way it yeah. tells you like where is the cultural centers of Switzerland and where is there like some smaller but still activity, you know. Uh, but like how the map transforms when you get closer, I think that's also interesting. Yeah, so like here, here you can see like Bern is one. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it, I think that's a very good way. I mean, that's, that's quite an interesting thing to point out. Like yeah. we're like Zurich, like right there. <laughs> Yeah, you can see that it's red. Uh, it's also interesting because in in this one huge cluster, mm -hmm. only this only this one shows up as being fully red. I guess because it's right. I, I I guess it's uh, the program makes it so that it's only one. Because when you zoom in, you don't want all of this to be red because that doesn't. I mean, yeah. That would be a bit messy. Yeah, I can tell so, you why that is. If you go closer to into Zurich, where like you were just were, yeah. So um, th this is what I meant earlier when I said like we go at it by kind of city or village level. So everything that is in Zurich, which uh, really is several postal codes and a bigger area than this, it all gets grouped together in this one point with as as if they all have these coordinates. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the thing, we have the uh, geo coordinates for the institutions at the city level, but they are not all in this location, like in the street, of course. Um, yeah. If you see a bit further down, there's a place uh, called exactly where you are, Zolikon, it's called. And that is far away from Zurich so that it has its own coordinates, you know? Yeah. And so you have, there's still quite something there. It's not super red, but it's kind of in, in the middle. And then you have the mm -hmm. other ones further down that are like very, like very slight pinkish only. Um, yeah. Um, one thing that would be interesting, which I've seen in some apps that do things like this, is they add a number to the circles. So okay. that, like, for example, if you see Zurich now, because right now there is no way for us to know, okay, we know it's super red, but is it 10 exhibitions or is it 50 exhibitions? We don't know, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think that could be something that we could also, it can certainly be done. Uh, we could talk about it. Uh, maybe that's a question that you could ask at 6.30. 
but also, uh, I mean, it's also a question of like what you're interested in and which way you want to develop it, you know? Right. And um, also it will be interesting to, to have a more precise geolocation at the street level. I don't know if uh, you guys already talked about this. Mm -hmm. um, I see on Wikidata for the main institution, there is um, um, more precise uh, um, coordinates. Mm -hmm. um, maybe we can maybe we can reach uh, the the location data uh, from our data set with um, with um, I don't know uh, more precise uh, location data at the street level. What do you think about this? Because we all have to to have a more complete view when you would zoom in and yeah, you have, yeah. uh, you're in the city level. You can see exactly which which you know which neighborhoods and uh, and where, where exactly the the, the uh, the pattern and the and the, the exhibition are taking place. Yeah. Um, I I know of a way that it could be done, but it's it's kind of work intensive. And like I think the question is always like there's so many things you can do, but like how much work do you put in? How what do you get out of it? Of course. Yeah. And I also think that um, it's actually good to have it like not too detailed because the problem, for example, if you have a small gallery, it moves around throughout the city, you know, and you would even need to have this data when it is where, and we usually, we don't have this data. And also for many of the small galleries, you don't have the address. You only have the village or, or like at, at the city level, you know? Um, and the only way to do it would be to, you take the institution, and then the institution has this thing called uh, an authority file. Yeah. Um, and then for the authority file, you go to a database that has the institution with mm. the address. And then from the address, you will find another authority file that gives you the coordinates for that street. But like you have to go through at least two other databases to get to this like street level accuracy. Yeah. Of course, yeah. Yeah, no, no, it's a um, um, yeah. very time consuming operation. <laughs> No, because of course, like if you look at like like this now, you would think that it is happening in this street, which it is not. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So uh -huh. this is also th something we could talk about, like th like what are the limitations of the way that we're doing it right now? We're doing it at the village or city level. So if you zoom in further, you you think you see something, but you're seeing something that is actually not true, um, because like maybe like, so maybe you, we want the dot. Yeah. But you want the dot to be bigger in the on the city level, so they 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 really uh, match with um, a exactly. large a larger uh, area, and not yeah, with the, yeah. Exactly, that would be another thing that could solve that kind of because like to show how your data is kind of blurry, that like if you go closer into this place called Cologne, the dot gets bigger because. Slack. Ich habe einfach alle abgeklappt, die ich markiert habe, als CSV. Ich weiß auch nicht, welches hast du genug? Ähm, das im Google Drive. Das ist schon da, aber nicht. Wenn es mal downloadet, ich kann es nicht öffnen. Wie läuft es bei euch so? Ähm, ja, ist mega cool, intensiv. <lacht> ja. Ihr seid jetzt die Vierten am Arbeiten an eurem Projekt. Genau. Cool. Und ihr habt es jetzt angepasst, habe ich gesehen. Ihr, habt jetzt, ihr nehmt die fünf grössten Städte und schaut, was die häufigsten Namen sind. Ist das korrekt? Oder? Nein, also wir haben es jetzt im Moment so, es hat sich stetig immer geändert. Mhm. Und der, vom Datensatz, den wir haben, haben wir gesehen, okay, wir nehmen einfach von jedem Kanton eine Postleitzahl raus und dort sind die Top 5 also Nachnehmer bei den Männern und Top 5 Nachnehmer bei den Frauen. Pro Kanton? Pro Kanton, ja, ja eine Postleitzahl, Area sozusagen. Okay. Ja, okay. Und wir machen eben um halb sieben wieder, kommen alle zusammen 
Ah, ist das ähm, nicht ein Trick? Also am, am 6. Uhr kommt die erste Input-Präsentation von Udo Birk über Face Recognition. Da könnt ihr gerne mithören, aber wenn ihr findet, ui, wir wollen lieber weiter schaffen, könnt ihr auch weiter schaffen. Und um halb sieben Uhr geben wir eher so eine kleine Übersicht, äh, wie viele Projekte es gibt, an was schaffen die anderen. Und die Idee ist, ich würde einfach so ein, zwei Sätze sagen, was er macht. Und ich habe nachher nicht die Gelegenheit, zu sagen, wo er Probleme gehabt hat oder wo er vielleicht Hilfe bräuchte, damit nach der Session, Session ähm, ihr euch mit Leuten aus anderen Teams allenfalls könntet in Verbindung setzen könnt. Falls ihr jetzt eben konkrete Probleme habt, sagt ihr, oh, wir haben es nicht geschafft, das und das zu machen. Vielleicht ist im Raum jemand, der das mega gut kann. Und dann könnt ihr nach der Session schnell zusammen schauen, äh, die Person zu im Raum einladen und dann kann er oder sie per Bildschirm teilen, irgendwie etwas zeigen, wo euch vorantreibt. Ich finde es noch ehrlich gesagt mega schwierig, weil also ich das Gefühl, wir sind so in der Kinderschuhe noch weg und mhm. das heisst, es halt schon eher professionelle Leute hier an Bord. Ja. Ich glaube, theoretisch man könnte man wahrscheinlich alle fragen und die alle wissen die Antwort darauf. Aber man traut dann fast nicht, wie so hergehen wegen diesem kleinen Scheiß die Frage, ehrlich gesagt. Nein, also ich, ich finde, das ist eben die, die, die Idee vom Hackathon, dass äh, die Leute voneinander profitieren. Und ich finde das mega toll, weil ihr sind jetzt alles Newbies, oder? Ihr sind zum ersten Mal an einem Hackathon. Und ich habe mega viel Respekt vor dem. Und ich finde das mega toll. Und darum, ihr müsst jetzt nicht euch schämen oder so oder nicht getrauen. Weißt, also schlimmstenfalls finden die Leute, nein, ich habe keine Zeit für so etwas. Aber ähm, fragen und sagen, was man braucht und was man, wo man Mühe hat, das kann man immer. Und das tue ich. Ja, ich empfehle das auch. Und dann eben würde ich kurz sagen, an was das er schafft Und dann könnt ihr vielleicht unter euch vorher besprechen, okay, was sind jetzt konkrete Probleme, wo wir das Gefühl haben, das könnt man fragen und dann lasse ich euch, überlasse ich euch das Wort und dann könnt ihr schnell mitteilen, ihr könnt auch Bildchen teilen und vielleicht sagt dann gerade jemand, hey, aber das kannst du so und so machen, könnt ihr euch Notizen machen oder vielleicht eben nach der Session könnt ihr nochmal eine Viertelstunde mit jemandem hinschauen, der euch dann weiterhilft. Mhm. Ja, das ist schon super. Um, ich habe noch so eine Frage, der mhm. hat er noch geschrieben. Wer hat geschrieben? Der Oleg? Ja. Ähm, dass ja. Wir, genau, dass wir unsere ähm, Challenge veröffentlichen täten. Ja. Ich bin jetzt gerade dran. Ne? Ah, bist du dran? Okay, dann ist gut. Auf Drip That. Auf der Challenge Page. Genau. Bin ich. Okay. Ja, das ist ja, das ist cool. Dann haben wir dort auch so eine Übersicht. Also, ähm, da eben... Das ist halt opendata.ch, Event, Eisprojekt. Ja, das ist das mit ja. den Formen, oder? Ah ja, voll Drip ja. Dad. Ich kann das nie ja. gesehen. Also. Ja, ah, das ist cool, wenn ihr das noch macht. Und dann eben nutzt die Gelegenheit nachher, zum mit, weil normalerweise ist das genau da. Also die Leute an der wenn wir zusammenkommen, sagen wir jetzt nicht, oh, es ist alles super gut gegangen, man sagt, was nicht gegangen ist. Und dann bekommt man Hilfe und dann kommt man weiter. Okay. Cool. Ja, dann sehen wir uns spätestens um halb bis sieben wieder im Raum Null. Mhm. Und ich freue mich und gut schaffen weiterhin. Danke, ich ich <lacht> Tschüss. Tschüss. Ähm, Ryan, hast du das vor Geräuschen gesehen? Kann man nicht einfach rausnehmen? Ja, ich hätte es erinnern. Hey, im Fall weißt du was? Du doch einfach das, eben mein Dokument abladen, ja. den Code kopieren in ein Dokument im Atom und nachher das als JSON ab, also abspeichern? Ja, ich kann ja da was zeigen. Ja. Also wie? Ah, okay. Aber ich frage mich, ob es halt korrekt ist, weil es steht ja eigentlich auch nicht. Nein, nein, es kommt nicht. Also, ich muss nicht überall anrufen, ich muss nicht überall anrufen, ich muss nicht überall anrufen, ich muss jedem in einem JSON, jedem Ding, ein Keyword geben, oder? Das ist, das ist wie eine Challenge. Ich meine, da sind jetzt Keywords halt drin. Also 
Also ich habe ihn nicht verstanden, so wirklich. Also in dem, wenn ich wenn ich bei dir so in das Ding ablade, wie los ist das? Ist ja eigentlich scheiße für mich. Ähm, ich finde, dass in einer hier ist, und ich habe ah, okay, ja. weiß, dass das Keyword Postleitzahl hat. Ja, also stimmt eigentlich auch nicht etwas. Okay. Ähm. Das muss doch irgendwie anders gehen. Ja. Mhm. Du kannst das Feld ein paar größer machen. Ja. Robi. Ich hätte so gerne einfach gerade den Workshop vorher da reingeholt, wo wir das ja am Liebe gemacht haben. Wieso weiß ich nicht wie? <lacht> ja, ich denke es gerade auch. Es ist so eine intensive Aufmerksamkeit, wo man denkt, wow, ich habe das Leben nicht so. Ich Ich mache mal die Folie neben drauf, vielleicht check ich es dann eher. Ich mache nicht mit Ja. Ach, cheat, cheat, vielleicht. Okay, ich sage jetzt als Description. Um, as we work only for two days on this challenge, we've decided to determine, thanks to an open data set, the five most popular family names for the female and male population in 20 most populated cities in Switzerland. Which text it, Jacob? The acoustic is not good. Ah, also, the wind is not Also ich habe auch geschrieben, dass wir, dass wir nur zwei Tage Zeit haben und das, äh, was wollte ich noch kurz sharen? Uh, I mean, considering that we started with a very ugly spreadsheet, this is super nice. Is it really nice? Yeah, exactly, successfully. Yeah, it was very nice. Uh, one yeah, more so. thing. Since you go through the years manually now, um, mm -hmm. you leave the start date at 1945, right? And then you yes. just keep extending the timeline to uh, further the end date, right? Yeah. But that means it's also accumulative. Yeah. You can't yeah, so, move them at the same time. Uh, so if I'm just if I'm just uh, keeping the start date here and just moving mm -hmm. the end date, all that's doing really is just showing you basically all the all the uh, art exhibitions that took place from 1945. Mm -hmm. All the way to 2022. Like it accumulates, right? Like the earlier yeah. ones, they don't go away. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So like, uh, I'm sure I can. I'm sure there must be some here that's from 1945. Mm. So like, like right here, this is 2003. Yeah. Uh, there, 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 there was. Uh, I saw, I saw one. 1985. Also. Yeah. And it's basically, oh yeah, it's basically accumulating. I guess this is uh, another way to visualize this data mm -hmm. to see how it grew mm -hmm. but this is 1958 here that will be that will be interesting too i guess mm -hmm. yeah because like it's a the question is always as soon as you have more data it's sometimes difficult to put it into a nice consumable shape for people to look yeah. at right because right now we have one dot that has maybe 300 exhibitions because some are from 1945, some are from 1980s, and some are from like 2010. Yeah. Uh, so also this thing of like hovering over it and then you would get, you can't even make it explode anymore because like if you make it explode, you would have 300. There's no, no space on the screen even. Yeah. Uh, and, and it would just be up like, Yeah. So if, if, if you were to like, 
so like if it's if it's uh, if I'm hovering over it like this, mm -hmm. it, it we would also need to kind of define how many because mm -hmm. if I'm hovering just over this one point, it's there's so many right here. Yeah, it could be it could be accumulating like uh, yeah, as you said, like three hundred plus. And exactly having that all over the screen would just be <laughs> ridiculous. So uh, maybe there should be like a cap. Maybe uh -huh. like at best ten to show. So this is a ten. And then as you as you zoom in more, you get to like you get a better picture. That's that's always there. Yeah, I I've seen that sometimes that um in an app that also has a kind of zooming feature on a on a map like this, they would say um if if you zoom down to the level like this, they tell you one, three, seven exhibitions, but if you zoom out, it groups it together and says a hundred plus, two hundred plus, five hundred plus, a thousand plus, you know? It gives mm -hmm. you numbers that are like more or less estimated and it won't give you the detail on that. If you want to know the detail, you have to zoom in further. Yeah, that could be, that could be one. Yeah, that, that could be, be a nice. solution, for example. Um, yeah. So if I like, hover over this, it should just tell me like, like 600, 700 plus. Exactly, exactly. And if you go exactly. in, then you see, oh, out of these 600, 50 happen there, 10 happen there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah it would yeah, be that nice. Could definitely work. Look at the, the Europe uh, as, a, as a whole. You have like a, a bubble for uh, Switzerland, a bubble mm -hmm. for France with uh, the number exhibition. And then when you get on the, on the national level, you have maybe... Uh, um, that's uh, that the unite uh, unite that, that covers uh, cities at the city level and with, with the number of uh, exhibition there and then when you get the, the zoom uh, um, uh, down down at the, at the city level you have for networks and that would be nice yeah yeah it's nice, nice. okay Anyway, that's that's a great job. Huh? No, really, yeah, really, yeah. No, no, that's uh, that's uh, very impressive. Thank you. Very cool. <laughs> Thank um, you. It's it's really it's really humbling. <laughs> this this is cool. basically my it's basically my first time ever doing this. So I was going to say you started working with Tableau this afternoon, right? Yeah, it's literally I I just I googled data visualization apps and it was the first one that came up, and then I just went with it. Perfect. <laughs> so. It's, it's, uh, yeah, considering the considering it's pretty relatively new to this, so it's, at least we have something, right? Nice. Yeah. Um, I asked to say goodbye. Okay. Here are the post lights on. just go right above my head and I wouldn't oh, understand them at all. Are, many things are complicated and many things are like projects from people who have been doing this for 20 years, you know? And yeah, so... Like they're doing this to play around, you know? And like, this is fun for them. And it's it's fun because they, oh yeah, we can, we can play around with this and see what happens. But uh, it's a different uh, kind of thing for them. Yeah. Yeah, I mean... Do, do you know if Chiago uh, was was actively... Uh, trying also something, or was he more listening? Or um, I'm not sure. I he's been kind of he's been he's been a bit missing for yeah. some time now. I'm actually listening. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, you. <laughs> Why did you, you say you talk about people politely? Because you don't know. <laughs> yeah. So sorry. It's okay. I have no idea what, what to say, so I'll just listen. <laughs> no, of course, of course. All right. Yeah, so for now, I just have to make it so that it, 
it automatically goes through the ears and yeah we, and obviously i think for the zooming in i'll need to do that one manually i'm not so sure how i'm gonna how it will play out but yeah I no think, no that's that's okay um yeah uh, i just it, hope it, that maybe i maybe i leave you to work on it even now because um with the going through the years it, it would be nice to have that but also i don't know how complicated or easy that is because i'm not familiar with us <laughs> uh, so you, you're the expert for, that's the thing <laughs> for now I, I feel like it's it's been a bit difficult to understand because the the thing with the starting and end date is that uh this this app at least it doesn't really consider the like the between dates between start and end uh, okay it just yeah. It's just concentrating on starting and ending. It doesn't really, at least I don't know if there is. Maybe yeah. there is, but I still haven't figured that out. So maybe, maybe uh, that's also, who knows? Maybe that's one of the stipulations of using this app, right? Because it's a yeah. level, different level of complexity. If you say like, hey, I have a time point in exactly mm -hmm. like basically a second, you know, yeah. uh, or like a split second. And you look at these points versus having a time span um and so right. maybe, maybe this is something that like uh you say okay in tableau i can't really deal with time spans so i'm always taking for example the opening time uh of the exhibition you know and no matter right. when it went uh, to open for like three months or a year because like honestly i think from my experience most of the exhibitions are three four months so like you don't win a lot by using the um by using the time span, if you look at it from a year level, you know? Yeah. Uh, I just thought we should mention it because uh, once you get down to a month level, it's, you would miss things. I feel like this, this, this is, if, I mean, this right here is, oh wait, let's stop, hold on. Yeah, yeah this right here would be it going through the years. Uh-huh. Uh, oh yeah, this is, this is it going through the years. And that's nice. <laughs> So wait, yeah. So this you're, this you're is starting the you're taking the ending date now. Yeah. So I mean, for now, because mm -hmm. because it's in about so it's, it's in about forty minutes. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure if I can do it in forty minutes. No, no. no I, this, I this is to, perfect. I have to Google quite a bit, but if it's if it's just like this, it will be showing you ear by ear. Yeah. But if if I were to do it cumulated. Because since we're we're concentrating on density, right? So mm -hmm. I guess it it would also make sense to do it cumulatively, like how it grew through the years. So we're we're including all that would also work because it's because um, our whole what, I mean our whole data right here is showing you how dense one place is, mm. even though it's not at one point in time. It's just like just through the entire data how dense that place was. Mm -hmm. I like mean, how, the, the, the yeah. question is also, I think what could be interesting is like how many years you want to, uh, to deal uh, in a cumulative way, you know, because mm -hmm. either you can say you take from the beginning from 1945 and then everything gets added on top. Mm -hmm. Or you say you're always looking at a five year time span, which I think could be more interesting, you know, okay. that you say, uh, so when we get to the year 1951, the one from 1945 drops out. And then you're right. looking at this because then you're looking at things uh, where maybe there was a big activity for five years. But uh, if you look at it um, on a level of um, just year by year, you always have it pink, you know, or maybe one year nothing happened. Um, mm -hmm. But I think to show it like this, that's perfect, you know. We can yeah, I'll, thirty. Yeah, yeah. So for now, I'll, I'll keep it like this. I'll try to think around a bit more, just yeah. to see if I if I can, because I I know that the five year gap, like going like going uh, chunks of five. So like mm -hmm. yeah, as you said, five and five and five. That would be interesting too. That would be like a bit more um, focused in those five years. I think mm -hmm. it, I think that is better. It's just that I'm not so sure how to go about doing it exactly. Uh, the thing is, I also don't know. I'm just like, the, this, this thing where, and I mean, this is this is the funny thing because also this is my experience in, so what I do in my team, I'm not a front-end mm -hmm. guy. So all I do is I talk to my front-end guy and I tell him what I wanted to do, you know? 
Right. And then like, he's like, huh, okay, let me think. Yeah. Okay. I think that's possible. And then he has to figure out a way. So this is the same yeah. thing that we're also doing right now. And this is also what I think is interesting about working in teams. Not everyone knows how to do everything technically, but yeah. you think about the problem together. And then one person is more like about writing the specifics and the other one writes the code and then everyone can give feedback because everyone is often a good test user. Or sometimes you have an extra group for test users who just try to see like, oh, I want to use it in this way. Um, right. So, yeah. Yeah, um, um, that that would that does make sense. So, okay. shall we? Um, I think I'll check back in here at maybe twenty past six. All right, and then we we talk uh, just quickly. But I mean, you can show it like this. That's super nice. Um, okay. And then at at six thirty, it's in the big room. It's in the room zero. Um, Rooms. Okay. I'll, I'll post the link. Wait. Yeah. I have it. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah. Wait. Uh, what time is it in uh, in Malaysia? In about half an hour. Uh, it in, it's gonna. It's in about half an hour. It's gonna be uh, uh, twenty minutes past midnight. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I'm gonna. Be, <laughs> I'm starting to become super sleepy at this point. <laughs> no, it's 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 crazy. I mean, it's lovely to do this internationally, but it's also crazy because yeah, we have people in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we start with the still remember. What? Sorry. I don't know where the phone is. But is that because of the Abstand Zeit had in? Aha. Also, es ist noch nicht ganz sauber bei euch. Nein, wir, wir haben jetzt äh, das Chess noch jetzt haben wir jetzt. Juhu! Jetzt, aber okay. jetzt müssen wir noch das JavaScript in äh, mischen. Aha, dann musst du euch im JavaScript. Aber im Moment müssen wir das machen, weil es muss ja noch eigentlich der Danilo bei ihm machen. Wir müssten jetzt ja eigentlich noch die Funktion schreiben, oder? Ah, oh, okay, er bittet sie. Wir können mir ja die Codes machen, vorbereiten. Ich würde auf den äh, In-Code würde ich schreiben, quasi als Kommentar einbetten. Ja, voll. Weil es macht ja keinen Sinn, wenn wir es jetzt mit einem Dings verknüpfen, oder? Das ist so doof. Das ist echt doof so. Also, ich meine, ja, ich finde es mal spannend, aber. Es wäre schon cool, wenn wir alle am Raum wären. Aber vielleicht machen wir es auch alles falsch. Ich meine, es ist ja auch wichtig, dass wir alle zusammen sind. Wir haben das, das Video schon gemacht. Ja, ja. schon hochgeladen. Hey. Wo, wo hochgeladen? Ähm, nein, nicht bin ich nicht. Nein, ich bin das After Movie. True. Ah, super. Oh, ein Freibot ist natürlich nicht drin. Ah! Ja. Ähm. Hast du ein Querformat? Geruschen. Ja. <lacht> Und ich habe einfach ein, ein Try gemacht. Scheiße. Wird nicht gut. Wie zu wenig darum gehört man. Das ist wichtig. Du hast den Bildschirm extra nicht mehr geteilt. Ja, es ist doch dann noch mega von mir. Aha, okay, ja. Das ist gut. Also. Oh, jetzt müssen wir wieder weiter überlegen. Also wenn wir dem Sembender, das sind sich der Hüsser und der Vanille darum kümmern. Was? Du musst langsam reden, aber das Internet ist nicht so schnell. Äh, wie, wie ist es embedded? Also, äh, I embedded is, is Chase. Ich weiß nicht. Ich kann es 
mal nicht Angst drüber gemacht. Ähm, <lacht> <lacht> aber können wir sich überwinden an dem Fall. Aber was wir mir jetzt überlegen, ich meine, wir müssen jetzt sehen, wie die Funktionen Funktion aufrufen. What's to do next? Wenn wir die Häuser hinten zu holen? Ja, ich habe gerade geschrieben. Es ist doch sehr cool, wie wir die Schäden sind. Ich habe es nicht Überlegen wir mal, also was wir jetzt machen. Sie haben jetzt ja ist so vorbereitet, dass wenn man drüber hovert, das Zeug rauskommt. Ja. Wir müssten jetzt quasi so eine Funktion machen, dass wenn man draufklickt, nur die Dings rauskommt, wo gerade geklickt worden ist, wie machen wir das da? Also man muss es wie zuteilen an Art. Haben ihr eine Idee? Also ich... Ähm... Ich weiß jetzt ja gar nicht, wie das mit dem Ähm, ja, wir müssen eine Funktion eigentlich machen, oder? Das ist, wir müssen auch hier sagen, wenn, also das ist, oder, oder das ist eine Funktion. Das heisst, wann. Also, if else bedingt manch. Nein, nicht if else. Also, ich sage, wenn, wenn du den Kanton anklickst, ähm, spuck euch, also dann, dann alert, oder so, oder prompt, ähm, von dieser Postleitzahl, DLZ. Äh, ja, ich weiß, er muss doch durch Code Tori. Oder nicht? Er muss doch durch all die Dinge Tori. Genau. Aber, Aber dann ist doch die IFS bedingung Also, if zum Beispiel ähm, der Kanton ausgewählt wird und auch and oder so, ähm, Mail zum Beispiel, dann die ja. Zahl anzeigen und else. Female-Zahl anzeigen. Mhm. Okay. Das könnte man schon machen. Aber ich denke, wir müssen zum Beispiel die Tische männliche ähm, Code für den Button männlich und den weiblichen Code für den Button weiblich. Das wäre ein einfacher. Das wäre einfacher, glaube ich. Also sauberer. Wie sonst, sonst zeigt es dir einfach automatisch weiblich an, wenn du nicht männlich anzeigst. Aber dann hast du ja noch nicht mehr. Ja. Und die ist halt, also ich jetzt schon gesagt, je, je, jeweils für den Kanton ein Team machen, wo du zum Beispiel sagst, die ähm, Postleitzahl, bla bla bla, oder die Lugano, und dann der mir sozusagen sagen, für den Lugano, also für den Kanton, zeig uns, wie er handelt, also für jeden für jede, ähm, Kanton können wir einen Code machen, wo wir dann jede Kopierung nach dem Nutzen ausleiten. Eventuell muss ich es kurz schreiben, stichwortartig, weil... Oh, schau kannst du! Hä? Ich habe... Ich habe... Ähm, ich habe eine Mist. Ich habe mir mein Video aufladen, aber es ist so ein schlimmes Anfangsbild. <lacht> oh mein Hello everybody and welcome to our evening input presentation by Udo Birk. 
thank you very much, Udo Birk, uh, to be here with us tonight to tell us something about face recognition. I will shortly introduce our panelist. Udo Birk is a physicist and he has been teaching image and signal processing at the University of Applied Science for two and a half years. He focuses on image process and analysis in the biomedical and the industrial fields. And Udo Birk has also one little connection to OpenGLAM to, through a project which he has started recently. He is in fact um, working on image analysis, um, um, children's drawings, actually the children's drawings which were presented this morning, the ones of the Pestalozzi Foundation. So now Bruno, uh, uh, sorry Udo, <laughs> uh, I will um, give you the word, the word. Uh, you can share your screen. Thank you, Valerie. Thank you very much. And thanks, everyone, for joining in. Um, it's very interesting to me, for me to give this presentation today on uh, face recognition to you all. So I will be sharing a screen so you can see the presentation on face recognition. And here it is. Here it comes. Now, what I'm going to tell you today is... Um, a little well more related to the field of industrial processing when uh, we see recent developments of um, computer recognizing people automatically and nowadays some uh, applications are of course in the field of consumer electronics and you can find that smartphones and other devices are becoming more and more keen on in evaluating all the data that it can have access to. And the one possibility, of course, is um, access to the photos that you're taking with your smartphone camera. And the smartphone will then analyze what is seen in the photograph and uh, possibly also recognize the people in the photograph and sort the photos and use that information, of course, also to potentially recognize the use of the phone to unlock it. So the process of face recognition essentially goes in uh, two parts. Um, we have, of course, first to detect whether there is a face, and then we will later on identify the face that is being presented. Um, this presently works, of course, on two-dimensional image data, uh, but more and more people are interested in augmenting that with the third dimension. So there is depth cameras available now in smartphones as well. And um, this information is more robust potentially and more prone to detect frauds uh, when people are trying to unlock a cell phone by just showing it a photograph. Um, so what we have in terms of aims of, re uh, of face recognition um, is that there should be a process. And the process we, I'm trying to hopefully um, tell you today about how this process works. And uh, later on, we will see how the process can be used to recognize faces either from a live camera or from photos um, and potentially also from drawings. So this I will illustrate in the following. The first question that we ask when we do face recognition is, um, is there a face in the image? So is that a landscape photograph? Is it just a blurry image of something that you have shot in your bag? Or is it a real picture of a person? And if there is a face in the image, then we should also know where is the face in the image. And of course, for us humans, this is very easy. We immediately spot um, the face in this image, we see that there is a person in each of the images, but we have to teach the computer how to do that uh, in order to be able to analyze later on the faces that are being presented. And this is not so easy, easily done. There's a number of algorithms available, some of which are quite old today. They are somehow maybe 20 years of age, and therefore um, in the very beginnings of uh, automated image analysis, and uh, they've been operating for quite some time with, let's say, 
reasonable success. In the last two, three years, we have seen tremendous increase in computation powers also on uh, low budget um, consumer electronics. And we have therefore also seen tremendous increase in um, computational powers being able to implement more and more robust and uh, specialized software that allows us to detect phases. The aims of face recognition, um, they are in the end, when we have uh, found that there is a face in the image, um, dealing with, with the question, which person does this face belong to? Um, so there's a number of decision makings in the process of face recognition. And essentially, you're following a pipeline here. Um, and this is, let's say, some sort of computer approach that has also been around for some time now. Usually, we follow this pipeline where we first have some let's say, improvement of the photographs. You might do that as well in, in Photoshop or other programs where you have some pre-processing. You make the image look, look nicer. You increase the contrast. You reduce noise. Um, and maybe you crop away some parts that are not interested, interesting. And then you find the face with some suitable algorithms. Potentially, you would then try and track the face if you want to analyze data from multiple images. Uh, that is not always necessary, but sometimes it can help to make your algorithm more robust. And then you would want to have an ID on the face. And for that, well, I'm going to show you how it works. Um, essentially, what you want to do is, first of all, you crop a reasonable small area. A small area is important because that way you reduce the data and your algorithms become much more efficient. And then from the cropped region of the face, you would extract something that is called features. Very much like humans, where um, the human typically tends to analyze the face and then try and uh, find hints whether I know the person that I'm seeing or not. Um, the computer goes the same direction. He, of course, or she, well, the computer needs to extract features in, a, in terms of numbers. That's the only thing that the computer understands. So we help the computer extract these features uh, by giving some numbers, putting them numbers, these numbers in a row, um, and then analyze these numbers, whether something similar has been presented previously. And if so, the computer should then find a similarity between these the sequences of numbers compare it to essentially to a database where uh, a reasonable amount of photographs have been analyzed first and then stored with all these sequences of numbers. This is the idea. The face detection works. Um, I want to just show you with the four examples that I am presenting here with four different algorithms. We have a standardized input photograph maybe um, taken from a driver's license. And this is, of course, a standardized photo. So typically, in these images, we do have good contrast. We have only one person. Uh, moreover, we essentially know where the photograph is located. And therefore, we also can have additional benefits to help our algorithm understand what is being presented. But um, either way, when I present this driver's license to four different algorithms, um, they are called half features, and then there's uh, some um, neural networks and uh, some, some other methods. Um, I should not go into detail of these, but all these algorithms, they are able to detect the face faithfully. So here we have a high detection rate with a standardized input image. If we go further and look at an ordinary photograph, so this was the Fachhochschule um, Graubünden uh, board in last year, uh, 2000, till last year, um, 2019, we find that um, our algorithm here detects only three out of six phases. Although we, as humans, we have no problem in distinguishing, well, essentially seeing that there's six people here in the photograph, and we should be able to recognize all of these six people as members of the board. Um, this was 
an early version of a computer algorithm trained to recognize faces. Uh, the algorithm itself was presented by two persons, by uh, Viola and Jones, and they, t they termed the algorithm half features extraction. And uh, essentially, the half features extraction algorithm, it's pretty simple. Uh, the half feature extraction algorithm looks for some patterns. And typically, we find that there is a pattern here, which is correlated to the eyebrows, and then some lighter area below the eyebrows. And this is a feature that is predominantly found in all the faces. Um, well, presumably all the faces. We will see later on that it's not the case. But when it, the algorithm first came about, it was able to faithfully detect um, faces. Another feature that we find commonly is two dark spots for the eyes and the ridge of the nose as being a, a bright area. So these two together, um, together with a number of additional features, they would be they would essentially allow us to recognize faces. Um, we see that it's not easily done because even though the photograph looks quite nice, uh, only three faces have been recognized in this in this instance here. And it becomes more difficult if we add some challenges, like we have different lighting, different viewing directions, and we find that the algorithms they perform quite quite different. And what you're seeing here is only the result in terms of reliability. What I'm not showing you is how long it takes um, for these algorithms to come to a conclusion to find or not find a face. You see all the faces that have been recognized, they are in these green rectangles or squares. And we find that there's a reasonable number of faces recognized up here. There's essentially no face recognized at all with a very sophisticated algorithm. Um, so this algorithm takes a very long time um, to analyze faces, to analyze photographs. Still didn't come up with any, um, with any result that we could possibly use. So we have to make a choice when it comes to face recognition, automated face recognition. We need to define some parameters, whether we want to be fast, whether we want to be very reliable, whether we want to also possibly um, be able to detect faces when it's rather dark, as we are seeing down here, um, and such things. They all have to, take in, to be taken into account. And additional problems might occur, challenges might occur, when we have, for instance, occluded faces, um, as shown here with the hand in front of the, of the mouth, or here with some obstacle in the, in the path where the camera only sees half of the face. And still some algorithms are pretty good. And these are, let's say, what, we, what I'm showing to you here are not the, the most sophisticated algorithms. That's, a, that's nothing that is used by, let's say, the police when they do surveillance. Uh, but it's something that is freely available. Um, you can download libraries that can do that for you. For instance, this OpenCV library that you find here, that is a, a library which is open, available for everyone that wants to do computer vision. Um, and you see that the, the algorithms are rather good and uh, they come up with solutions that could potentially be used to detect these faces. Later on, when we have found the face, then we need to um, compare it, let's say, to a database. And in order to do that, as I said, as I mentioned before, we extract from the face um, a series of numbers. So what we do when we found the face, we first, of course, detect the face, and then we do some sort of transformation when we say we want to extract and cut out some part. We want to possibly highlight some features and improve the contrast, and then we cut out the interesting region. You see that the hairs are completely missing. They are not important for face recognition, um, which for me is good because I don't have any. Um, and then from this face, a number of of, uh, let's say, specialized, uh, special, very special parameters are extracted. Um, we find the, kin, the chin region down here, we find the mouth, we find the nose, we find the eyes, the eyebrows. And then all these numbers, they go into um, some sort of n numerical representation. For instance, you can think of, we measure 
possibly the distance between the eyes. We measure the length of the nose. We measure the distance from the, the corner of the mouth to the eyes and similar things. Of course, that's not really how it is done, but there's something that could be done in an easy approach. And some, you know, some marks, some numbers are more reliable for face recognition than others. So the computer has been trained to extract from, let's say, these characteristic points in the face to extract some numbers, some distances, some relations, uh, length ratios, and so on. And essentially comes up with a representation. In this case, we have a representation. The face is represented by 128 numbers. And these 128 numbers, they are pretty unique for the face. Um, as long as you're not trying to recognize too many different people. So we have found that this, uh, this 128 numbers is good for recognizing uh, around 100 people easily. No problem there. Uh, I don't know how the algorithm would behave if we would put in more faces as a database. Um, this I have never tried. But with 100 faces, it works, it works quite reliable. It doesn't recognize everyone, but most of the people have been recognized in a, in a test scenario. So I wanted to show you this in an example over here. We have the Swiss Institute for Information Science, a group photograph taken in 2019, I believe. And then I've um, just compared that to the photographs that I found on the homepage of the University of Applied Sciences of the Grisons. Um, and then the result that I'm getting is I have recognized, shown in green, the majority of people, um, of course, I couldn't possibly recognize with this algorithm, the people standing in the back and barely being visible. Uh, but I have also found that the algorithm um, tackles some challenging people like Michel here with, uh, with the sunglasses. Um, it failed, of course, on Two, piece, two persons over here. Later on, I have learned that these, these two persons, by the time I did the analysis, they weren't even with uh, the, the university anymore. So their photos had been removed from the database. Then, hence, I couldn't possibly uh, teach the algorithm to recognize these people. Nonetheless, I wanted to make it some sort of um, approach where I could say, say how reliable is the algorithm. So I compared, let's say, the distance between the faces. As I said, one face is represented by 128 numbers. You can subtract these numbers and just add the difference, essentially. And this is what is shown here. Um, I'm showing you this graph only so you can find that there is a reasonable number of persons that have been recognized quite nicely. The distances that you would expect if the algorithm recognizes a person should be zero, right? You would want to have the, the face in the image that is presently being analyzed being exactly the same as the face in the database. And then you would essentially say there is a zero difference between the two faces. We find that the difference between the two faces, let's say the database and the presently analyzed faces is not zero. But nonetheless, we find that it's reasonably good for many faces. Here we find that the difference between other faces and the ones that we want to recognize is not as small. And that means that the algorithm is not so reliable in terms of um, being sure that if you have a face that it's 100% you know, sure that this face belongs to this person. But we find other faces that have similar features. Their distances is not too large. So essentially, we have then a number of challenges that we are tackling. As I said, we might have some hardware requirements. We want to know how fast do we need to go, how much energy do we have available. Um, and then there's recognition, recognition challenges. Do we need to be sure that there is no person entering, for instance, that is not allowed to enter? Or do we need to make it comfortable to the people? Let's say you want to unlock your phone. You don't want to try 100 times before the phone finally unlocks. So there you would be uh, more inclined to unlock as opposed to keep it locked. And that means that you're less secure 
of course. These are things that we need to consider. And then there is other approaches, as I said, there might be the possibility to do a 3D analysis. And you, for that, you could use 3D data, uh, as shown here. The points that are near to the camera are green. The, the points that are far from the camera, they are blue or even black. And this is additional information that you could use to detect fraud, possible, possible um, approaches where people want to use photographs to unlock the phone. Um, and of course, from such 3D data, you can generate a 3D map and use that as your face for the database. So one more thing that I wanted to give you away before um, going into the discussion is um, we have seen a tremendous rise in computation powers, um, being able to detect more and more things with what is called deep neural networks, and you're probably working with these, all right. Um, what we find is that uh, very often these networks, they have a bias. It was found that many, many faces in, um, in the you know, and the approach that I've presented to you are not being recognized because they are not white males. Because, you know, the neural networks that are being used here, they are mostly trained on faces that have been downloaded from the internet and the majority of faces that you find there are white male persons. Hence, if you are, un if you are not a white male, the algorithm might not be able to detect your face at all. If, on the other side, the algorithm is able to detect your face, then, of course, it can be easily combined with additional data, finding user, your user profile, analyzing your gait, analyzing what you're shopping, what you're carrying around, whom you're meeting, and so on. So people are trying to evade surveillance, find measures, find means to counter this face identification that is becoming more and pop more popular. So in the end, I wanted to show you another example of what can be done with face recognition. And for that, I've recorded a little video for you here. And with this, I'm at the end of the talk. I thank you very much for listening in, and I'm open. I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you very much, Udo Birk, for this interesting presentation. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? No questions so far. I find, because when you showed the first picture with the face recognition and you said actually for humans it's easy to recognize if whether there is a face or not, um, and the machine it's more difficult, usually some, uh, when you have to, if the internet website, for example, wants to know if you're a robot or not, now often you have to, you get a selection of photos and you have to say, which photos shows a certain object. Yes. So now with this type of algorithm, maybe is there, will there be a day when the, a robot will actually be able to answer these type of questions as a human oh, does? Of course. So the, uh, the reason you are presented with these questions is twofold. Uh, the one reason you have already mentioned is the computer wants to make sure that they, that you are not a robot. Uh, and the other reason is that the computer itself wants to be trained to learn more. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you get the feeling that you have answered correctly and the computer decides to ans ask you again another question. It becomes quite annoying, but this happens. Uh, because then uh, you probably have been shown an image that the computer didn't know what is being present, presented to you. And so you have been used to teach the computer in that instance. Yes, but of course, uh, like these robots, they are, let's, let's say, not easily fooled. But it's more easy to fool these robots as it is to set up something that tries to avoid a robot accessing a web page. 
So most people that set up some something like this, they don't know what presently image processing is able to do. And they are sort of five or 10 years behind. So usually if a, a website is looking for this kind of security, they ask a, a company and the company is actually using them to improve their software. Yes, yes. Okay. And then there's, then there's a third reason why companies try to set up these, um, uh, these hurdles. They want to appear to the consumer that they care. So essentially, what you feel is being, you being, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling annoyed with these things. Um, but most people, they feel more secure if these things pop up on the web page. They do trust a retail shop that makes use of something that is apparently to, to them appears as being a secure shop. So they, they want to have it. Okay. Um, Udo, we have a question in the chat. It says, what about deep fakes? Can a computer know, learn the difference? Yes. The way deep fakes are produced is essentially taking this approach. There is, um, let's say there's two algorithms at work when deep fakes, deep fakes are being produced. One, the one algorithm is constantly trying to make the data more appearing more like a real, real scenario. So the one algorithm, essentially the one that I've been showing to you when I showed this image of uh, this painting, that in the end they try and, and, and articulate and move the face. This is the algorithm that I'm t uh, talking about. It makes the face look real. And then there is another algorithm which tries to detect whether this face that is being presented is real or not. And both algorithms, they learn from each other. So as long, you know, the longer you like let these algorithms run, the more reliable they will be. And they, in the end, they will be more reliable than the humans. So th then you would have a hard time telling the difference and the computer would be better than, than us. This is what I'm seeing here. Yes, Florence, who asked the question, says, cool, thank you. Are there any other questions from the audience? Because we've seen now in the Open Glam, um, more and more people are working with uh, deep learning or machine learning to do image uh, recognition to recognize certain objects. For example, on Wikimedia Commons, there are a lot of photos, but you cannot search um, if you're looking for a picture of a tree and the title doesn't have the, the word tree in it, then you will not be able to find this image. But now they're starting to work with tags. So you can say this picture depicts a house, a tree, a car. And so they're trying to work more and more with computers to automatically or semi-automatically annotate these images. But I don't know, maybe there are other questions from the audience? Maybe I have one question with open data. We are also thinking a lot about privacy and protection of, um, of personal data. Uh, you, as, a, as an expert, what, what is your feeling about the evolution, how technologies are evolving now? Um, I'm, I'm, of course, very concerned about the evolution of data privacy. I see the need for governments to take responsibility and make sure the data is available. Um, I see really the, the need that we should ask the governments that companies cannot keep this data to themselves. It must be made available. Because only then, uh, you know, has, everyone has the same chance uh, and everyone is on, on the same standing here. Mm -hmm. And would you personally use face recognition to unlock your phone if you... 
I, I don't use I don't use face <laughs> recognition. No, I'm trying to avoid this. Uh, I'm sticking to the old-fashioned pin. Mm, yes. Thank you very much, Udo Birk. Um, if there are no other questions, then we'll uh, go on with the next uh, have, point in our program. I have one question to Udo. Yes. 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 Um, I, I followed a bit on the live stream where I saw the facial recognition in the group photo and everything. And I was just kind of wondering, I had once seen a presentation where it was people who work in biology. Uh, and there is something called uh, that they call secondary use, which means if you make an in invention that could be great for like the, the biggest thing is like the atomic bomb or like maybe like nuclear developments that like you have to consider how could this be used for good, but also how could this be used for bad? Um, and I was wondering if uh, how you see that in like software development or. It's, you yeah, that you don't want to use this yourself, but you're working on it. And like, I think some people drop out of projects like this because they see this kind of potential of the harm in their use. Yes. Yeah. Of course, everything that is technically related, not only technically related, but everything that I came across is potentially dangerous. And of course, there's a lot of responsibility involved in the developments here. And yes, I have not taken on some projects because of issues that I had with security here. Um, when I said before that I want the governments to take also responsibility um, when it comes to data handling, I have also my greatest suspicions when it comes to the governments because they are the first ones that could potentially use it in an advertive way. They could make use of, you know, track people uh, and follow you everywhere where you want to go. Uh, because already this is available, this data. Uh, everyone is mm -hmm. having a smartphone and carrying it around. So potentially you have all this information already. And of course, governments are using it. Yeah. So um, what can we do? I don't know. I mean, you know, I work on face recognition. I don't work with Google. Um, um, and I, I fear that, you know, there is a lot of power um, with these companies, and uh, I don't know how it's going to be how it's going to be used. It depends very much whether you have a stable um, political environment or not. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Paul, for the question and Udo for the answer. Are there any? Other questions about face recognition from the audience? I have a fun fact, not a question. <laughs> Oleg, yeah. You know, I was, I was uh, doing some live streaming earlier and I literally started, uh, I started recording myself via YouTube and uh, 20 seconds later, YouTube decided that uh, I was doing something illegal, you know, um, imitating a song that's a copyright and kick me out just you know this was happening like an hour ago and ai decided that it didn't like me so i think we should we should get used to uh having to confront and complain about ai decisions uh more and more as time goes on oh, mm -hmm. oh, most definitely i completely agree i think uh, it's it's about time we should be really every one of us should be aware that when we use these big tools, that they have a tremendous power and they have a tremendous uh, responsibility, which they're not um, taken on, really. I'll, um, I'll post a link. Uh, something maybe a lot of people have missed is that at Open Knowledge, you know, the parent organization for Open Glam, they very recently started an initiative to help um, people connect to legal advice about algorithms, like so actually to, tr to help lawyers understand algorithms and to help us find lawyers uh, in case of legal issues and that kind of thing. I'll post that link uh, in the chat. Thank you very much, Udo, for a really great introduction, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. So if there are no other questions, then we can uh, continue with today's program.
Um, so now we hope that most of the participants uh, have come together. And the idea, as you have all been working hard this afternoon, some of you were isolated, some of you also used the live stream to check out what the others have been working on. But Andrea, Lothar and I uh, will um, shortly go through all the projects and give you the opportunity uh, to say something, to ask for inputs, ask questions, um, so that the teams can interact uh, with each other. So first, as a small uh, summary, this morning we had 20 pitches, 20 persons who presented an idea or a data set. And now we've lost track of some of the teams, so we'll see if they're here tonight. But uh, we have about 15 projects which people are working on currently. And we think that the number of participants is about 40. But there again, um, we're not sure uh, about that. So tonight, uh, we'll be happy to hear from you and see what you've been up to. So Andrea, do you want to say something about the mountain match? Introduce the mountain match team. Watch match with the mountain. Yes, I'm not sure if the mountain match or match with the mountains team is here. Is anyone from the team here? They were working on generating an interactive map which shows an overview of the mountains and their environment inside Graubünden. But apparently they are busy working. Okay, so we'll see if they join us after. Maybe we can ask again. Uh, I see Paul, Brunner and Ishan Mishra are here. Uh, you guys have been working with the list of exhibitions of the SIC ISEA and you have been working on data visualization to show uh, on a map uh, the concentration of exhibitions which have been showed, uh, have been organized. So now if you, Ishan or Paul, want to show us what you've been up to and maybe you have questions. Yeah, hello. Hello, everyone. I hope hello. you can hear me just fine. Hi. Uh, okay, so I guess it would be best if I share my screen, show you guys what we have been doing. Uh, I hope everyone can see. All right. Uh, so basically, uh, as as Miss Valerie said, that this uh, this is uh, a map that uh, shows you all the art exhibitions from 1945 till uh, 2020 and and projected for 2022 as well. It's um, it has this uh, it's shown in these uh, red dots, where the redder they become. Uh, the greater the density of art exhibitions there are. And it's been, uh, I, uh, I filtered it so that it goes ear by ear. So here's a uh, look. So it will go from all the way from 1945 to 2022. And uh, as, you can, as you can see, and uh, you'll see more clearly later that in this uh, area of Switzerland, uh, the art exhibitions will tend to be uh, closer and to, uh, they will get more dense as time goes by. So I'll let this play on for a bit and uh, talk about some improvements that we can make. Um, so uh, as you can see now from uh, the map, it's starting to get a bit more red around this area. But the thing that I feel like we can improve on is to maybe show some uh, you know, some numbers so that people can better understand what it what what this is what this uh, exactly means and how 
uh, big in magnitude it actually is and how many exhibitions there are because for now it's, it's just it's, it's kind of just based upon uh, the redness so that's one uh, another thing is that although we have used geolocation uh, the coordinates haven't uh, aren't exactly uh, accurate down to the street so if uh, I'll let this play out all the way first before I show you what I mean. All right, so here after 2020, it goes to the projected, but I'll, I'll go about here. So if I zoom in, uh, as you can see, the big red uh, lump here kind of spreads out so that you can clearly see where it is exactly. Uh, but the thing is that when you do zoom into one particular point, uh, it isn't actually uh, located exactly at this one point. Instead, it could be anywhere near this area. So uh, another possible improvement that uh, we'll be making would be to perhaps uh, make this one dot as we zoom into it a bit bigger. So that would kind of show the uncertainty of where it where this art exhibition actually is. Um, so uh, that's about what we have done for now. And what I'm looking forward to doing tomorrow is to maybe make it so that it's filterable by uh, artist and institution. It's uh, the things that I haven't exactly gone much into, and I would like to uh, make it so that those uh, that data is accounted for as well. So, if uh, anyone has any possible suggestions or any questions, you can uh, feel free to ask me and suggest some uh, ways I can make it better. Thank you, Ishan. Yeah, I personally think uh, the filter by artists is a very interesting because it reflects also the career of, of the artist. Probably he starts locally and then you can see if he gets to go to the big cities like Paris or, or yeah, yeah, yeah. London. It, it would kind of be able to uh, you be able to see the popularity of the artist at the same time, and I feel like that could be uh, quite an important uh, inference from the data. And I'll be ma I'll make sure that I'll work on that. And do you need any? Do you have any special or concrete program pro uh, problem? Sorry, where you would need the help of somebody? Uh, or well, think? if anyone would be willing to. Uh, I did uh, make plans for it to be interactive and be on a website. So if anyone is willing to maybe, uh, who's, who's, who's worked with JavaScript especially, if anyone would be willing, uh, I'll be very happy to work with them to maybe uh, transition this into a website and it's all interactive and nice to look at. You're getting compliments in the chat. Uh, oh, I just, I, sorry, I didn't see. Yeah, uh, they say. Thank you, thank you, guys. Yeah. Uh, maybe also change map with ear as some borders have changes during the years. I'm not sure I understand this one. Uh, ah, so so as as uh, over the years the the borders and all have changed, and that that is something. Yeah, that is something that I could consider as well. Okay. Uh, thank, uh, thank to you. reflect, thank yeah, you. to adapt to my... Thank okay. you, Miss Florence. Uh, can we post on Wiki? I think, yeah, they want to share your project on Wiki. Oh. Is that the question? You can, people can also talk. You don't have to. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so we can talk. Hi, this is Carrie. <laughs> 
Cute, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I was just thinking because you were asking, you you wanted to post, uh, you want to have a browser, you want to post it, uh, um, yes. host it somewhere. So yes. since uh, I was just wondering if we can post it like on some free portals already available, mm. that you can then you don't need to have too much headache, you know, looking for a Java expert and all. Yeah, that'd be nice. That'd be nice too. Just an idea. <laughs> no, I think from the also from the data. So this is the data set that is freely. Um, we we gave this data set a set of fifty thousand exhibition to be used, so the data can be used, and it can also be on a wiki and like be accessible. Uh, maybe we should say one thing about where we would need the help uh, more specifically with the uh, JavaScript uh, and the API. Um, because we're coming from this 50,000 line CSV, which then Ishan worked in Tableau to make this visualization. And they say, basically, if you want to uh, implement it somewhere else, you have to get, go through the, J J the JavaScript API. But this is the point where we're both not uh, knowledgeable about these kind of things. So if somebody would be willing to help there, also to then maybe host it on the wiki, that would be a great help. Um, but I also want to see like how delighted I am to see the data like this because the way that I know it is in tables, like from the relational uh, database. And so to see it on the map like this was super nice also for us and David and my colleague also. We liked it a lot. Yeah, that was great. Um, work, yeah. again, Ishan, like... <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, then we will move to the next project, which is Extra Munya. Andrea, do you want to say something? Yeah, so the team from Extra Munya was trying to create a web tool that maps and visualizes the connection between museums and the outdoors. And I know they've been very busy today. So how far have you gotten? Um, Hello, everybody. Uh, so we started uh, um, working on the data of teaching that we had. So uh, working on uh, some script to uh, extract the data from one of the website and uh, uh, the catalog of uh, heritage and uh, updating uh, some of the data on, uh, um, well, asking for the authorization to the Wikimedia projects so that we can actually use them also also there. And, um, and also editing, so working, um, a lot on the data to make them uh, more available and accessible on uh, shared uh, open projects. And uh, on the other hand, uh, we started brainstorming and uh, designing uh, uh, an app. Maybe, uh, Giovanni, do you want to maybe continue it on, uh, on the structure of uh, the app? And maybe we can visual uh, show uh, a couple of slides. Uh, but basically, brainstorming on uh, the users, uh, defining uh, uh, the structure and uh, the feature that uh, um, this uh, website will have, uh, focusing on itineraries uh, outdoors of museums, uh, but uh, selected by museum or suggested by museums. Hi, everyone. Uh, maybe I can uh, share with you my screen uh, so you, you can see uh, what's, uh, uh, what, what, what we did uh, right now. Um, OK, can you see my screen? OK, now I think yes. Yes. Uh, so, so we basically worked on uh, several ladies. Then we came up with uh, this one. That is uh, what we call the sort of a Tinder of of cultural uh, uh, itineraries or cultural Tinder. Um, uh, it's a way to uh, to set up uh, uh, an account as a as a user that would like to to visit some places related to uh, cultural institutions. And then you can uh, set uh, your own, uh, uh, like your own properties. Uh, uh, you can uh, select uh, what the, the topic of your visit, uh, uh, which kind of activities you want to do, like uh, just uh, walking or running or eating, maybe uh, the, the time you have at the disposal and then, uh, the distance and uh, what we call the sense activation, uh, meaning uh, what's of of your sense uh, will be uh, involved in uh, this experience uh, you are having. Uh, then you will get uh, um, a 
your itinerary so or, or a set of itineraries that could could fit uh, that kind of um, uh, of um, characteristics uh, you uh, inserted uh, every itinerary will have uh, some uh, um, some metadata uh, the number of uh, kilometers uh, you have to uh, to run or uh, uh, if uh, you have to uh, to climb a mountain or you just have to go to the lake and so on uh, the map and then there is something that comes actually from tinder you can like it or don't like it so uh, according to uh, your uh, suggestions your to your feedback uh, uh, at the end uh, we will get uh, a sort of a top charts of what what are the the favorite uh, uh, itineraries by the community and uh, the list of uh, your own itineraries that is something that then, then you can uh, further explore in uh, some uh, other page. Uh, thank you. If you have uh, any question or any feedback, we are absolutely open uh, to uh, add from you. Yeah, I do have a question. Thanks a lot for the for the presentation. Um, I was wondering whether you like it before actually taking the hike or after it. You you like it, uh, yeah, uh, b before. <laughs> it, it, it's uh, it, it's um, it's like when you have to meet some uh, some girls, and then uh, according to what you see in the screen, uh, the metadata. Sorry, it's you know, before the date and not after it, the date. Okay. It's before, exactly. Thank you. <laughs> or at least in, in our, our ideas right now, it's uh, before. You're welcome. Thank you, Giovanni. Are there any other questions? Um, if no, I, I, I stop uh, the, the sharing. Uh, so then... Yes, yeah, so please stop the sharing and we can go on to the next project, which, which is Cap Pauliana. Um, they wanted to create a website using the Cap Pauliana pictures uh, database where people can upload their own version, their own modern version of the images. And Philip is already sharing his screen and showing us what they did. Flip you're muted. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yes, now we can hear you. Okay, sorry. Um, so the whole data set consists of 179 pictures like this. They are sometimes quite easy to recognize and well uh, described, like this one. Others have no description at all or are even drawn. And so we thought it would be cool to have a website in which you can like access the old pictures, look at them, uh, and go for search like in the real world. Go have a look where this picture could have been taken and upload your own version of a 200-year-old um, picture. And that's how we came up with, can you see now, second? Okay, um, that's how we came up with uh, our mountain hunt. Um, we would like to provide the old pictures and uh, give the possibility to upload your own version of it. There should be a voting system on which one is the best match for the old picture. And... Um, like the normal features, you know, I want to challenge that are those pictures we haven't found out yet where they come from. Uh, most popular, yeah, like, uh, so that was the idea to make the old pictures accessible. And the use of this would be that you get a challenge that brings people out of their houses and you get the geolocation for old pictures, which are not that well described because people go on search for the picture. And whilst you have that, you also get the um, climate information because you can, for example, see how the glaciers went back because on old drawings from the 1800, um, there will be glaciers way more down the valley than there are today. And so you have the direct comparison and you also can raise awareness of uh, climate change with that project. 
Uh, thank you, Philip. I think Dina shared a picture with you on Slack that she might want you to share. I'm not 100% certain. Oh, okay. There's a second one. Wait, I have to download that one quick. One second. Okay, we have a next page. Um, why is it not downloaded? So, yes. Okay, can you see it? Okay, that's page two. Um, and like I said, the idea is to have like all the old pictures and then some we find are the most compelling shots of the day. And then you can scroll through. It should be also something that's pleasing. Look at old pictures, look at new pictures and just see how mountains changed over the years. Uh, thank you, Philip. Do you have anything you have, you're having trouble with? Do you need any help? Um, I think at the moment we just need time. <laughs> like always, if you start a website, uh, you don't know where what goes and what's next to do. So I think at the moment what we need most is time and just dive deep to make it work. <laughs> Thank you very much. Are there any questions for Philip? I have a suggestion, yeah. Uh, Nicole Graf on last Tuesday night, she presented uh, the crowdsourcing projects used by uh, ETH library. And there's a crowdsourcing uh, platform. I think it's run by one of the universities of applied sciences in, in Lausanne. And this allows you to actually place images in a, in a model uh, of in in a, in a geo model, so that for these uh, panoramic images that would be perfect. So you you just have to find five spots that you can map on on this panoramic image, and then you get back the the, the geo location information. So mm -hmm. you may as well look into that and see whether you can maybe use part of that information or that that, that infrastructure to to feed your project. Okay. That's interesting. We have seen that there are other projects that also do the same with aerial photography, which they map on a 3D model. Is yeah. It that? Is it yeah, they use it a lot for their aerial photographs. So it, it's useful for anything that has like these panoramic views. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't uh, know how, how, your, how your collection is made up uh, or uh, yeah, whether it, can, they're all similar it. pictures. Yeah. Like many pictures consists of like drawings like this mm -hmm. one and then it gets much harder to do that drawing on. is hard because you have no control over the whether they actually got the angles right or not mm -hmm. yeah. exactly and that's why we thought it's um it's quite uh, nice to get it as a eye review like have mm -hmm. real humans checking it We That's also thought that possible. people might find it engaging to try to replicate exactly the picture, like if there are people pres present on the picture, on the photo, on the picture, on the drawing. Um, you can go with your friends, and it actually, such a, such, an, uh, such an application has been around. Had been around. I had seen that um, five years back or before, mm -hmm. with a slider, all the new. Okay. If you search for that, you might find it, but you, sometimes these things also disappear again from the web. For you More guys... How to find it? Oh, sorry. Right. Uh, no, I wanted to ask because sometimes people can also match an old and a new picture, but it doesn't have to be the same place. Is, or, or are they supposed to be in the actual place? Or could they match uh, two different mountains if they go well together? Like for, as an artistic, um, no, it shouldn't be artistic. Like that's not the main purpose. Main purpose is to provide geodata on those old pictures. I would say, okay. but we haven't okay. uh, spoken about uh, an artistic abuse. I would say of our platform. It's possible though. It's the internet. People do whatever they want. But I, I like the idea of using this. Uh playful approach to actually after it's gather geo geolocation information. 
Mm -hmm. I actually did that once with uh, pictures who are from 19, uh, I don't know exactly, 100 years ago. And it was quite fun to really try to catch the right spot and the right angle. So I think it's a catch idea, maybe. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any other questions? Not. We move on to the next um, project, which would be the PTT georeferencing project. But we are not one hundred percent sure that anyone is still working on it. Is anyone from that team here and still working on that project? Sarah, we are yeah. still working. Can you hear me? Yes. Now we can hear you. Okay, yes, we're still working on it, um, but we're not ready to show something right now <laughs> because we had some problems at the beginning and not everyone was um, ready in the afternoon, so we need time. <laughs> That's good, so you take your time and we move on to the next project, which is, or, no, or if you need any help, Sarah, if you yeah. want to know. Maybe you can say what type of help you need and someone can help you? Um, we might use some help, but right now I think we figured the problem out. So maybe tomorrow. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So we're moving on to the Looted Art project. Uh, they wanted to create a text analysis, analysis tool that scans prominence text and flags them for Looted Art. Um, I think, Laurel, you wanted to present. Yeah, I'll, I'll talk about it. Although I have to say the, the team is really working very hard on all of this. I'm going to share the screen, um, screen broadcast. The, the idea is to make a list of the most likely items. Um, and let's see, here we go. And we took an approach of splitting up the work. Can everybody see the screen? Not yet, not yet. Oh, you don't see it yet? Um, no. Wait a second. Start broadcast, sorry, there we go. Okay, so- um, no, Still not. Still not. Oh, no, yeah, yeah, now it's okay. good. So we, we split up the work um, and uh, we took two approaches. One is to count a number of things to, that we're measuring inside the text. Uh, we're counting the number of red flags we're, uh, of different types. We're counting the length of, of the sentences. We're, we're counting a, a number of things. Um, and the other is to parse the text uh, and to try to find in the text by extracting the dates and the names, things that are, that are interesting, potentially flags. And then in the end, the idea is to bring that all together with a unique identifier, which is the URL, and to weigh that and come up with a kind of score so that we can uh, locate the, uh, let's say the most problematic text. Um, the other challenge is to do it in a way that's reusable by other people. It's not just for this one data set of 70,000 items. The idea is to have a methodology and scripts that anybody can use on the texts um, that they want to test. So what you see here is um, just a first result where the text length was calculated. And so that's calculated for all the items. What you see in the next slide is um, another result, always on the same data set, where the, based on a number of rules that were discussed uh, uh, amongst ourselves and developed, um, the text which are interesting because of something uh, connected to the dates, like when the first date is or the interval between dates, they're flagged as true. Or if they're considered not interesting, they're flagged as false. We need to go through and make sure that um, this is giving us results that are really <coughs> relevant, but it's a extremely interesting approach. And then for the years, we also see all of the people who are in the text. And the next step there that we're working on is to then um, connect those people to their Wikidata entities, 
when they are red flags so that then we can pull in all of the all of the other data so um, to coordinate all of this we just have a little um, github uh, where we share code and um, and all of that so um, it's advancing very well I would say and um, uh, I guess that's about all I have to say about it right now um, we're just we're just advancing. Would, would somebody else from the team maybe like to speak about it, uh, about any of the programming challenges? It all has to do with uh, uh, analyzing these texts. No, thank you. No, I think fine. <laughs> Things fine. What you said. I don't. If if there's anyone who knows anything about, I don't know, clustering or so, might be good of text. But otherwise, we we are doing name recognition. We are trying to find stuff with regular expressions or different things. So if you're interested in that, you can still join. Another thing that could possibly be interesting would be um, to have a user interface when the scripts are finished and we have a finished product to have something that's easy for somebody to interact with. So it, they're, they're writing it, it's um, um, Burke and, and Julia and Florence, they're writing it in such a way that someone just drops in um, the name of a file and there's an output file. And so anything we can do to make that super simple for people who aren't programmers um, with a web interface, of course, would be very, very nice. Okay, what's that? Airtable. Uh, Airtable, I think that's an input for you. Um, so the next project is the Swiss Glam Inventory. Uh, Lauren, I think you have to mute yourself again, otherwise oh, there's an echo. Don't worry. Lothar also should mute himself. Oh, sorry. Uh, um, and so the Swiss Climb Inventory team have been working with two data sets, the ES Plus from the National Library with all the libraries in Switzerland and the data set of the Swiss Association of Archives with all the archives in Switzerland. And today they have mainly been working on comparing these two data sets uh, with OpenRefine. And I think they have been struggling a bit with Python. So uh, Daniel Bocart, is here, I think, to tell us more. Uh, yeah, still here. Can you hear me? Ex yes. Still experiencing some connection problems right now, <laughs> but I uh, hope this will hold up till the end. Um, yes, indeed, we have some decoding problems with the one data set from the archives. There we also with the uh, open refine, not just with uh, the Python approach, we have to compare these both to data sets, but uh, we hope to find a way around that. We have now uh, got an open refine environment we can share with each other from uh, Oleg. So tomorrow we will pick up there again and hopefully solve these problems with uh, from the decoding part. Okay, so it looks so, like you're yeah, hopefully. We, yes, exactly. We're uh, working on this and try to find a way to compare these both two data sets and then try to uh, compare them also with the um, entries that are in Wikidata and maybe to enrich them when we can. This would be the final scope. Did you finally get a new file from the uh, Archives Association or did you manage to kind of modify the file you had to work with it? I think one of our group members have found a way to modify this. There have been some uh, answers right now that it is not that output that should be. So we will look into this again tomorrow morning. 
what we can do or uh, if you have to address the association of archives again. Okay. Data set. Okay. Yeah, the next project is uh, an art project that is called uh, Europa Meets Europe. And the project uh, is uh, maintained by Martin Vollenweider, who I saw that today, who helped uh, a lot of other projects. Uh, so he hadn't much time to work on his own project. But uh, I suppose it's interesting to hear what he's uh, trying to do. Uh, as far as I understood it, uh, he has already a standalone solution and is now trying to, to develop a web application for his uh, project. So, uh, Martin, maybe you can uh, tell us more about that, uh, what you are doing and what you are planning to do. Hello, everybody. I'm glad I could help the multimedia production students in their project. And I am very, very keen at what they have done. I have seen really good things. Besides, I made my other project, my art project. You see here the data from, from the NASA webpage that are publicly available. And what I did was, and you see it here, and I do a refresh that you can understand what's going on. <clears throat> you see here a picture of Zurich. Later on, I will take a live image from a webcam. And then I take a picture from the NASA library and have placed it here on the left side, divided into the different pixels. And during the time running, I will present those pixels. I will overlay those pixels over the image. And you see it matches actually the, the image from, from NASA. Each time I am loading the page, a new image will be loaded, and I also would like to have then a new, a new uh, webcam image in, in, my, in my project. So that's actually what I have done so far, and I hope I can finish it uh, till tomorrow. And would you be interested to, to have some help from other people? Did you meet some issues that are a problem for you and or are you just working on it and, and would like to show it tomorrow? Yeah. Okay, fine. Yep. Thank you very much. Are there questions from, from the audience? That's, that's an important thing. No. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I don't know if Sylvia is here. Yes, I am. <laughs> you are, because I didn't find you anymore to this afternoon. Uh, you're working with the Pestalozzi children's drawing and have turned it in a citizen yes. science uh, project. Uh, I'm curious to hear more and maybe, yeah. Okay, the, um, uh, the interesting thing is that what, what made it interesting for me is like, what can you do with children's drawing? So it was a totally new field for me because I'm working a lot with uh, other cultural institutions and collections, but children's drawing. So this what triggered me. And so I'm the only one working with the two of the collection. And uh, one thing is that they thought they do not have to be present all the time. So they have just some, some time slots and they will be available only for one hour tomorrow and that's it. So it will be just a kind of concept because we're not technical and there is no time to work on it. But uh, I think it's quite funny because um, the title is now Interaction Go School. We have, um, we had a quite, um, let's say, um, we thought about what's, as they told me, what's really in their collection, collection, what is the problem of it. So, and we tried to find the question what they really need. Huh? And um, they thought, they said like, okay, we want to have a citizen science project. We want to have the knowledge of the people that draw these pictures. 
So let's say in 1936, the guy was eight year old and draw a picture uh, connected, always in the context of school. So it's not at home, at school, or it's connected to a competition of drawings or so on. But, uh, and they wanted to start a citizen science project to get more context of why and what and whatever, yeah, the W questions. But I thought like, how do you reach the people? I don't know how we can do that. And then um, we found out maybe it's more interesting to give these pictures to the children. They are now eight years old and we'll see what's happening. So a kind of storytelling. So maybe we give them three pictures and let them find their own story within this. So, and the three pictures are in that. So they can enhance and enrich this collection with their pictures probably, or their curators or whatever. And the other thing is that we thought it would be also nice because then man, you can use it in a school also for creative, um, we call it Bildnerische Erziehung, I don't know. So when you have a drawing in school and so on, the, the teacher can use these um, paintings of the collection to do some digital teaching because you know the coronavirus, it was difficult for them to teach children something, and we thought, okay, then they can use it also for the German, for the for to write some texts or to get in their imagination and do some story story storytelling, and uh, they also can get connected to the older generation. So the question to the students from today can be like, um, you, what do you see here? And this picture is from 1928. So go to someone who maybe can tell you something about this. So the generations can talk to each other and they have some reason for it. Uh, and uh, there must be a kind of figure because the interesting thing is, Pestalozzi was a teacher. I didn't know that. It was interesting for me. He was a teacher in Switzerland who wanted to bring new ideas for teaching. So this is actually what we found out first. And then we also we followed, we found out that we followed the spirit of Pestalozzi anyway. No. So it was by chance happening. And this we found it very funny. Uh, okay, so then there will not be any prototype, we think. And also, ah, yes, that's another thing, because some schools use Scratch. You know Scratch? This is a kind of programming for beginners. And uh, we thought it would be quite funny to use the, the paintings of this collection and maybe to... Um, to put them out of the painting, so make them standing alone, uh, singular, and put them into Scratch and Scratch with it. So then you can uh, develop a game or whatever is needed from school, whatever is your uh, homework. And But you use these drawings, the old drawings from 1936 or something. Yeah, yeah so that was quite the idea until now, but um, the ladies had to leave at four. So we already filled in the, your prepared um, structures or your um, Google Doc. And we'll meet tomorrow for doing a kind of concept um, just to see what is our concept. And it would be funny to, uh, to cooperate in the future, but let's see. Any questions? I think, yeah. So you, your project to do the, is to develop a concept and I've seen the drawings, I think they're really nice and I think it would be really cool if in your concept you would use like these images to have concrete examples. Yes, I we already found nice. some examples and uh, yeah, we'll do a, we, we try to do a kind of, let's say, a poster or something huh? with some uh, examples. Mm. Thank you, Silvia. I see that there are quite a few images on the Christmas 
like the Christmas trees and people preparing the Christmas. Maybe there is something about comparing how how the Christmas is now, how kids draw the Christmas, or showing the kids how the Christmas was before. Because maybe um, you don't have to use all the images uh, in, data, in the data set. Work with some of them. You know, just throwing out an idea. Mm -hmm. I see that there are quite a few nice pictures of Christmas. Didn't see the pictures of Christmas. But maybe that's on their web. Is it on their website, or is it in the data set? I'm scrolling through the data set. Yeah. Okay. I missed the Christmas pictures. Okay, uh, Sylvia, you're not muted. We can hear you type. Ah, thank you. <laughs> Sorry. But we can go to the next uh, team. Yeah. So the next. Uh, team is the cultural event calendar data entry wizard. Um, they wanted to use linked open data to create a public cultural calendar. How far have you gotten? Hello, this is Gregory. Can you hear me? Okay, so um, I would I could share my screen. I think we've advanced uh, in several areas. So I'm going to share my screen. My interface of WebEx is still in German, so I'm having a bit of uh, trouble finding the buttons, but hopefully this will work. Um, let's see, there we go. Arrow showing upwards. And then you can choose the window, yeah. Okay, so um, I'll just open this little presentation we put together. So we thought it would be neat to um, explore linked open data um, in the form of a calendar um, and be able to go back and forth in time. So uh, the idea of how, it, how a cultural calendar would look you know, a decade ago, two decades ago, or even today or next year. So, uh, and present it in a way that um, the public could view uh, the events as if they were, you know, planning to attend something in the upcoming uh, days or weeks. So let me just enlarge the screen here. Use presentation mode. Yeah. Just present on the top right mode. corner. Top right. This one, no. No, further to the right. Ah. The little one? play button. No. Ah. Ah, <laughs> Next yeah. to the share, yeah. It present, yeah. Okay. First time I'm using this one. Um, so <clears throat> the challenge was to use existing data sets. So we wanted to really uh, find events that existed already on Wikidata. And we have this uh, Schauspielhaus collection of the Zurich events that uh, Bayat could perhaps talk about. But here, the challenge uh, was to also use um, a diverse set of events. So we're also going to use events from the arts data uh, knowledge graph. And the challenge uh, that we came across is that data is modeled uh, differently in the different uh, data sets. Although it is RDF, there are different data models. And we need to adjust the Sparkle queries to be able to extract the data. And the second big challenge is that there's very few images and we wanted to create a website, a calendar, a cultural calendar that had images as a way of conveying some of the, the mood of the times and uh, create a visual uh, interaction. Uh, so I mentioned the Schauspielen House um, and this is a great collection of events. And Bayad is working with us to create the Sparkle queries to extract the information for the calendar. Um, we're also using some structured data on arts data, which is a Canadian uh, knowledge graph of events, but primarily mainly um, present. So either the last year or the upcoming year. And uh, Wikidata, of course, so using the, the, the project is to build a front end that would dynamically connect using Sparkle to these various uh, data sources. 
And the main feature of the interface uh, of the calendar would be to search for events um, with dates. So you could go back in time or forward in time uh, by city, uh, by type of production, and also a free text search on the title. Um, an idea was brought up by the group that it would be really interesting to take an image and to use that as the search input. So you could, you could take the image of um, a particular event or a venue uh, 30 years ago and use the metadata to search uh, for that time period uh, and that city to see the events that would be on the cultural calendar if you lived at that, at that time. And so we built a, a mock-up of the user interface um, so basically, we have a search screen, uh, and then on the right, you can you can drill down into specific productions and see uh, images and descriptions um, and performers of those productions. Um, and we really need help with uh, the sparkle work, which is um, proving to be difficult, but possible. And when we have completed the first version, we would like to look at the missing data and possibly ask for help in filling in uh, some missing data to make the calendar more attractive. Um, yeah, so uh, this project has a link. Uh, it's a running application. As we build, we're pushing to this address and we're also pushing to GitHub to share with everyone. Thank you, Gregory. Does anyone have any questions? I just wanted to say. No, go ahead. No, uh, I just want to say it looks very nice. Uh, and if you say you want more data in there to make it look fuller or uh, as a real calendar uh, would be, uh, we could provide you, uh, for example, with the uh, um, exhibition data that we have. I could give that to you um, um, as RDF if you want to use. Is it that. available somewhere? Because one of our goals is to connect um, with uh, existing Sparkle endpoints. Yeah, that's the whole thing. We don't have a Sparkle endpoint yet, so uh, I would like to give it to you, but we don't have it yet. I could only give it to you as an export, and then. Uh, you could implement it, but you yeah. could try loading it into a into a graph. Yeah. yeah, I just thought it would be a nice usage of the data that we want to be used, and also I think uh, an application like this it, it lives from having a lot of data to play yes. with. So our, our goal is that the application can continue to to uh, live because as data is added to Wikidata to Arts Data, mm -hmm. then the the application will grow in 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 depth and content. Yeah. So yes, but please send it to us and we can try and load it. Yeah, I'll, I'll send you an example. Then you tell me uh, if you think this could be, this could work out. Okay. Great. Perfect, cool. All right. Are there any other questions for Gregory? If not, we're moving on to Lothar and the next project. Yeah, the next project uh, has a title that would be perfect for a Hollywood movie. That is uh, Newspapers at War. And it uh, focuses on the year 1914. And the idea is to uh, uh, take two uh, French uh, journals from Switzerland and translate the articles into, uh, into German. And this isn't done uh, manually, but uh, the idea is to use uh, Google Translate or DeepL, uh, the APIs, to, uh, to let them do the translation. And another idea is to uh, develop a web uh, surrounding um, that uh, combines the old uh, newspaper articles with contemporary newspaper articles. But uh, I suppose that there, there is uh, Bernhard Eversold who can uh, talk about what they're doing, if there are any issues with the project. And I would like to ask you to just uh, tell us about your project. Uh, yes, thank you, Lothar. Um, as you already uh, mentioned, we um, really tried, um, first of all, to um, translate all the articles with uh, one of the APIs, with Google Translate or Deeple. 
So that's, that was actually one of the first steps uh, we made this um, afternoon. We went on Google, we went um, on the Deepol websites, and we checked if these um, APIs are available for free. And we saw that you can, on Deepol, like 1 million um, characters is for free, and on Google, like 5 million characters. So I guess that would, would have been enough for our project uh, during this glam hack. But um, when the conception work uh, went on, we realized we actually don't need all this data. I mean, we just want actually to focus on the main events of the year 1914 and present to the public the, really the main events of this year. So not every article is really important, um, which was written in 1914. So we really want to focus and be relevant and not um, just publish irrelevant stuff. No one's interesting. So um, we came to the um, point that we probably gonna um, translate all the articles we're gonna use manually, and then we're gonna publish them um, on our website. So we already started with a kind of a prototype. I'm trying sharing my screen right now. Just give me a thumbs up if you see my screen. That would be awesome. Uh, yes, perfect. Thank you. Um, so this is the page. I'm going to just reload it. And the aim is that you see here on the left-hand side all the articles which are relevant for us in the um, year 1914 and in the right-hand side articles from 2020. So that's just a prototype. None of the articles um, are here yet. But as you, so you get kind of an idea how it's going to look like. Um, I just um, have a look at my notes if I forgot something, but I think, um, yeah, that's actually, that's it. Um, Lothar is having some technical difficulties <laughs> with his screen. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for this, uh, for, for explaining what you're really doing. I, I have uh, one question, and that is, uh, are you using certain topics to compare uh, the articles from 1914 uh, with the articles from today? Because 1914 is a year with uh, important events, and do you compare war events with war events uh, that are happening now, for example? Or is, is it just randomly? I mean, you could ask a question if we isn't the world in war right now. I mean, that's one of the first questions you can ask. But um, for sure, um, 1914 was not just um, an interesting year according to the war, um, but there are many um, technical, um, portrait, technical stuff mm -hmm. was getting was um, um, was getting on then like uh, the first airplanes um, were seeing in the sky, the first motorized uh, vehicles were on the street. So, and Elon Musk just uh, recently um, just um, made a rocket, was flying anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I think there are several topics we can compare from 1914 um, and 2020, yeah. And uh, for the time being, you're doing that just manually. You show one text on the left side, one text on the right side, just to compare them and let people decide. Um, yes, that's the plan. Yeah. Um, so we, we're going to find out was there kind of a really important date in uh, 1914. And then we're going um, to select like the two or three days before and after this date. So we have kind of a good um, selection. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So maybe we can ask the, the audience if there are further questions uh, regarding your project. Or have a look at the chat. This it says, sounds cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. OK. Thank you, Brad. <laughs> a cool project. Thank you very much. And we hope to hear more about it uh, tomorrow. Yes, exactly. So there's still a night and a few coffees without breaks to go there. <laughs> so we have three more projects to go. Uh, the next one is 
the Swiss AR project by Thomas Weibel, um, the augmented reality web app to display information about the user's surroundings. Thomas, uh, could you tell us a bit more about your progress today? Yes, I will. Can you hear me? <clears throat> okay, thank you. Um, I'll quickly share my screen as well in order to show you where I started and what I did today. Now you should see one of the Swiss government web websites with a large data set providing a, a digital elevation model. I talked about it um, this morning. That was my starting point. All this, uh, these data are published on opendata.swiss as well. And in order to provide information, not just, uh, not just uh, an elevation model, I um, found these data sets here, toponymy data sets providing um, place names, hilltop, peak names, river names, lakes, and so on. And from this, I made this project I showed you um, this morning. I made this beforehand. Uh, that's a VR model of uh, the whole of Switzerland. But actually, the constraints were far too strong. It's, it's, uh, actually, it's of no use because um, if you are rebuilding a topography of a, of a whole country, um, the complexity for the browser is um, so huge that, that you can only display a small part of a country. So what I did then was to um, try to build a model that could display the, the, the Swiss topography at once. This is what I ended up with. That's the model. This uh, actually corresponds to the whole of Switzerland. But it's of no use either, because um, the building of the model took um, an hour or so, and the model itself is hundreds of megabytes large. So um, no idea about loading it onto a smartphone when you're hiking, when you, are, when you get lost somewhere in Switzerland, where you have a bad um, connection. So it looks nice, I admit. This is um, high above Bern. You can see the Gürbetal, the Aretal. You might recognize the Niesen here. But um, the model itself is far too large to be of any use for um, a mobile app purpose. What I did then was this. Um, first, I integrated AI to the model. So I, acted, I managed to activate the camera sort of as a background for the app by means of another um, framework. The base framework, base, uh, framework is A-Frame, a, frame, a JavaScript framework issued by the Mozilla Foundation. And I um, added another framework, AR.js, which is fairly new in the, in, the, in the latest version. And what I also did, I retrieved other databases because I wanted to integrate not only uh, place names or hilltops, but also um, cultural heritage um, sites, which uh, worked out uh, pretty well. But now um, there's a lot of work ahead because I have to do more tests, of course. This is just a, a random uh, screenshot and, that I made in our garden just an hour ago when the rain had stopped. And um, there are many tests needed in order to define the correct heights above ground level, cam heights above ground level, uh, distances, um, um, range of sight, things like that. So now comes the refining of the model in order to get an app that you can really use when you get lost somewhere um, outside and, and find information that is relevant to you when 
Um, when you are looking for something like a cultural heritage site nearby or something like that. So this is where I am. Um, what I need most is time because testing and trying out things requires a lot of time. I hope I will manage to present uh, a working prototype tomorrow. It works, it does work, but it's of little use so far. Thank you, Thomas. Are there any inputs or questions for Thomas Weibel? Well, then we are very curious to see that tomorrow somebody, Oleg wrote something. Oleg, do you want to? Oh, I just want to say, it looks awesome, Tom. Uh, oh. And uh, I've, I've also played with A-Frame and ARJS. Really excited to see what you come up with. Okay, I hope uh, I hope I won't disappoint you tomorrow. <laughs> you will. <laughs> Looking great. Thank you. Okay, so the next project is the Names on Maps uh, by Gerusha Simone. Uh, Yes, and you have changed your project from the original idea which you have pitched this morning. And now, if I understood correctly, you will try to show the five most frequent last names for men and women of each canton. And during our last conversation, you said you might need some help with some things. Do uh, you want to share the, your current state with us? Um, yes, I can tell you something. Machst du Geruso? Nein, du machst auch auf die Waffe. Yes, we had at the beginning some problems uh, because of our uh, data, of our data, um, because um, when we looked on it, then we recognized that it's only... Um, the top five names in it from some places, not not everywhere from Switzerland. And um, so we had to change a little bit the idea and adapt it. And uh, we had to make a complete not new list. Yeah, and maybe Gerusha wants to tell you. Yeah, so just to, I'm just checking the chat, sorry. Ah. Okay, so yeah, um, so there were um, the five most popular uh, names of um, uh, certain certain towns and villages, and the thing was, it was as well like female and male, and as we all know, uh, men and women are married sometimes, so um, we had also to think about it, um, how we don't falsify the data, because so just like yeah not to show the man and the woman together as a number or sum them up as one number because then um, the married couples would have uh, counted um, so it would have counted falsely yeah and um, so now we decided to kind of choose 20 towns and to um, display the five most popular family names for women and as well for men. So they will be shown separately on our website. And there, um, Danilo especially uh, did a lot of work and he really uh, managed to uh, create an interactive map of Switzerland. And now um, as well, we, we all together, we had a look how we could, um, yeah, like create out of the data a JSON file and how to um, match together the, the map with, with our, our data and our code. And yeah, we have also a pretty good idea about the design. And I think by tomorrow evening, we should be um, finished. So that's just, that is also our, our goal. We, um, we, that's the reason why we decided just to kind of cover 20 towns, uh, just to be able to manage the data. 
And how did you choose your towns? Ryan, would you say again? Yes, uh, we've chosen them um, per canton one, and we thought about the biggest one in the canton, but the list uh, doesn't have always the biggest um, city in the canton. We don't know why, but they didn't collect names from all. So we tried to just take the biggest one on the list from each of the And did you have any particular issue that you wanted to talk about or you, you... Um, Yes, I wanted to ask the other group how they work together because um, we didn't manage to find the best um, workflow like we code somewhere and the other code is somewhere else and how we do that in the virtual life yeah, yeah. we wanted to have some, uh, some input. maybe Oleg maybe Oleg has an input how to work on code together yeah so you know Sorry, I was a bit tuned out for a second. I was actually trying to debug something in my code, which is really bad. Um, but you were saying uh, like you're trying to sh sh share your code with someone else you're trying to collaborate with? No, yeah, yes. as well. But for example, I was working on the HTML and CSS. So right. I was working on the search field and the search button and on the layout and so on. And then the other um, the other ones, for example, um, they they worked on the map. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. then, because I don't know, everything is. I got uh, you. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I mean, this is getting this is getting into kind of software engineering territory. But basically, you know, when you're when you're on location, it's you're you're quite easily coordinating. You know, so, uh, but in a virtual. Hackathon, I can I could just encourage you to share your screens as much as possible, first of all, like be in that WebEx session together. Um, try to kind of do, there's something called pair programming where, where one person looks at someone else's screen, right? But I mean, you could just turn on your screen sharing practically all the time, and then people can kind of just look at, mm -hmm. look at what you're doing. Um, but I think what you're talking about kind of, you know, makes me think about uh, using something like GitHub you know, where you're pulling your code together. That's what we use for working on open source projects where a lot of people are involved, you, you might never meet. And it's just really important to try to have a simple but logical distribution of your project's assets. So for example, like everything related to the map, to having some kind of maps folder, you know, and then people working in that folder will, will not um, run over someone else's work in another folder, you know, so kind of distribute the ownership of the different parts of your project and mm -hmm. try to have a logical structure that corresponds to those parts. Um, but yeah, there's there's no real easy fix to this. If it was two people working together, you know, like in a pair situation, I might recommend um, real-time collaborative coding, like some text, some programming in editors these days, Atom and Visual Studio and so on. They make it pretty easy to um, edit code in real time, just like you would edit a Google Doc or a Markdown document or something in real time. So you can see each other's cursors. You see what, where people are in the in the in the project and what they're doing. And there again, it's easier to avoid um, mix up. But just the more communication you have, um, often just putting in your Slack channel a, a quick note saying, "Hey guys, I'm working on this now." Um, trying to use something like Git, GitHub to, and and doing a lot of commits. Every time you're doing a commit, you're communicating to your team that you've done something in the project. Um, those are really good ways to to uh, to to improve a collaboration. I could keep talking for hours about this, but I'll shut up now and let you <laughs> ping me on Slack um, if you want links to anything of any of the things I just mentioned. Okay, okay. Thank, thank you. you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you everyone. I see some people are starting to shut down their cameras or go out of the chat. So uh, that will be it for today. But uh, just one question about WebEx rooms, because um, we have to reshuffle some of the teams which were in, in rooms that 
we won't be using tomorrow. I wanted to ask, is anybody not using their WebEx room? I don't know if Martin, when you're working on your Europe project, are, are you using your room number nine? No, you can have it. We can use it again. Okay, thank you. And is there any other person which is not using their WebEx room? Yeah, yes, we are not using our WebEx room either. Who's that? Uh, that's Bernie. Bernie. Yeah, we're the okay. copyright. 1914. Yes, exactly. Yeah, okay. And the same no. for room number 20. We don't use it anymore. Okay. It was the old game the high numbers. project. Yeah. No, but this project five. doesn't exist anymore. Okay. Neither do I. Room number 18, but as far as I know, this room has already been deleted. Yeah, I think it's possible. <laughs> okay. Okay. But I think, yeah, especially room number nine is good that we can use it for another group. Thank you. So um, now we have still, I don't know if anybody wants to stay online or if you just want to <laughs> shut down your computer. But uh, we planned an apéro roulette on Zoom for people who just want to um, have a chat. And I planned a taboo game in this room. But what I suggest is, oh yeah, we're gonna get some beer. Uh, so those of you who got the apéro kit, you can get a beer and um, maybe we can meet at 8.10, for those of you who want to continue being online, either for a game with me or for Apero Roulette with Andrea, uh, then we can meet maybe at 8.10. And if we see that there is no people, then uh, we just let it be. <laughs> okay, thank you and good evening. <laughs> we'll post I think it's also a good... I think it's oh. also a good idea to maybe uh, join the others in the in their rooms and uh, have a have a little talk maybe later on if you're staying up uh, af after 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 uh, the games. Uh, yeah. So that would give us a chance to also meet each other across uh, across uh, teams. So yeah, you can simply use the overview and click on the Webex room of the team you want to talk with and join them there. And yeah, so we'll start with the Apro Roulette and game uh, in 15 minutes. Uh, Valerie, for those who are yes. maybe leaving now, uh, do you want to say something about tomorrow morning? Tomorrow morning, yes, let me check. So we'll meet here again. Um, we will open the, this room at 10 to 9. And by 9.30, we expect everybody to log in. And we'll start with just a short warm up so everybody can get started. And then um, you'll be able to work again by yourself. And um, we'll have, well, I don't know if we'll have a help center for Open Refine because Dominic wasn't feeling so well today. But yeah, basically, the important thing is I'll, we'll see you tomorrow at 9 30 here. And the WebEx rooms, they stay open all night, right? The WebEx room, oh, I have to ask, just a second, oh, Ivo, because then we should, yeah, just run the computers all night. Um, but Beat, you're, oh no, you're in room 11. 11, yeah. Okay, that's okay, because it's, the room 19 is problematic, but the girls from the room 19, we can now put you in room number nine. And I'll just ask something. Ivo, is the eye when I look at the all the web screenshots? What's that? And also 1112, can we go to the other building? Yes, they go. Okay, can we go to the other building? Okay. Okay, great. So our Canadian friends can, they don't have to be worried when we working. shut down. Uh, okay. Yeah. And good. So, Are we expecting um, any, any new people, uh, additional people just joining for Saturday? There have been people who have joined later today, but I think, well, we pointed them to T 
teams which we thought they could join. And in the end, I think nobody really joined a, a new team. Um, and some people have written that they couldn't make it today. And I'm not sure if they'll come tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. Um, good. So in 15 minutes, those of you who want to play the game can come here or stay here or join Andrea in uh, Zoom. And the others can also just spread in their own rooms or do something else. <laughs> Thank you. And maybe see you later. <laughs>
the creation. Ah, okay. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> 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 in general. Is anybody in the in this room still? Okay. 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 Hey, Shiba, please wait, please you want to play. Okay, it's in the room, no, a lot of us. Oh, nein, wir machen das auf Ich tue dann schnell reden. Aber ich kann, ja, das ist okay. Ich kann, ihr müsst sagen, wenn ich so loslege. Ich warte einfach auf. <lacht> Gut. So, this was the first day of our first online glam hack. And we had a great time with you guys. So, now it's time to grab a beer and meet us online again to play some apero roulette or some tabu. Cheers, guys. Like this. <laughs> Oh, 
So this was the first day of our first online hackathon. We had a great time with you guys. And we hope to see you all fresh and awake tomorrow. But for now, just grab a beer, relax, and meet us online for some apéro roulette or to play some taboo. Cheers, guys. <laughs>